Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee, meeting number 11. Uh, my name is Kristen Wong-Tam. The clerks have confirmed that we have quorum, and I'd like to call meeting 11 of the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee to order. Welcome, everyone. This meeting is being held using the city's WebEx technology with members and staff connected by video conference or calling in. We ask for your patience with any delays and technical issues. Members of the public can observe the meeting on YouTube. We are also providing captioning for this meeting. A few simple reminders. Staff, please keep your video turned off until you need to speak or answer questions. This will make it easier for me as chair and those watching on YouTube to observe members as they participate in the debate on each item and during votes. Members and staff, Hello? please. I'll just continue here. Members and staff, please keep your microphones on mute unless you need to answer a question or to speak. And members, if you wish to speak to an item, if you can have your video turned on, uh, it will enable me as clerk to see you when you raise your hand or unmute your microphone. Let me know and I will create a speaker's list. When voting, if you, have your micro if you have your video on and if you are able to, please raise your hand or unmute your microphone to indicate your vote. Although we are participating remotely, members, you must still submit your motions in writing to the clerk. The clerk staff are available by email at taac at toronto.ca. Although we are in different locations and meeting remotely today, the committee would like to acknowledge that the land we are meeting on is the traditional territories of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples and is still home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. I'd like to ask now if there are any declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act, and if you have an interest, please unmute your microphone and let me know. Seeing none, we'll proceed. Next, we need a motion to confirm the minutes from our last meeting on September 24th, 2020. Thank you, Howard. Moved by Howard. All those in favor, please indicate your support. That carries. Thank you. Let's proceed with the agenda. There are 11 items today, and we will consider them according to this order. Uh, item number one, DI 11.1, .1, the chair's report, which I will hold and give you an overview very shortly. Item number two, uh, is the Toronto Public Health response and efforts related to COVID-19. We will be receiving a staff presentation from Dr. Davila, and that will be held. Item number three is supporting people with disabilities in Toronto during and beyond COVID-19 shelter support and housing administration. Staff are here to provide us with a presentation. We will hold that for them. Item number four, Response and Accessibility Parks, Forestry, Recreation Programs. Uh, we will be receiving a presentation from staff that will also be held. We also have speakers. Item number five, Equity Responsive Budgeting at the City of Toronto. Again, we will hold that item for staff who will provide us with a presentation. And we also have speakers. Item number six, Cafe TO and Curb TO Accessibility. Uh, once again, we will hold this item for staff presentation and there are also registered speakers. Item number seven, accessibility, uh, sorry, active TO and accessibility. Once again, we will hold that for staff and uh, we will be receiving a presentation. There will also be a speaker. Item number eight, wheel trans update on public consultation and COVID-19 response. We will hold this item for staff presentation. Item number nine, communicating COVID related information to impacts to people living with disabilities. Um, we have uh, staff who are available to answer questions and we do have a speaker registered. Item number 10, remote participation in Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee meetings and we also have a registered speaker. We will hold that and staff are also available to answer questions. Item number 11, request for an update on the suspension of the Fair Pass transit discount. Uh, we do have a speaker, but we will hold that item uh, for, for, for speakers. Item number 12, and that will be the last item on our agenda, uh, request for a presentation on the customer experience transformation and innovation 
program. We do not have a speaker on this item. Uh, this is a letter from Michael Maselli, from a member of TAC. Uh, members, do you have any questions of Michael? Seeing none, does anyone wish to speak? Seeing none, I think that we can just proceed to vote to adopt this motion from Michael then. Uh, and Michael, would you like to move your motion? Oh, actually, I see. I recognize that Michael's not here. Uh, I will move the motion on behalf of Michael. All those in favor? Indicate your support. Thank you, members. Any opposed? That carries. Thank you. So we we dealt with one item. Coming back to the top of the agenda, everyone, uh, I will provide you with a quick uh, summary of the chair's report. The, ta the, uh, the chair's report is already itemized for you on the agenda, but probably one of uh, two key highlights that I want to share uh, uh, are, are the following. Uh, one is that there was a debate at City Council, um, and there will be a debate at City Council regarding the snow clearing of sidewalks and pathways, and in particular, uh, coming back to the parks uh, forestry recreation um, uh, discussion is whether or not we can also do that in those uh, recreational park facilities. So I wanted to just highlight that. I know this is, that is a particular item of interest uh, for members of this committee. Uh, another item of particular interest I know is, uh, is, a, is of importance is ensuring that housing uh, built in Toronto, affordable housing, uh, is accessible. Uh, on October the 29th, as the chair, I met with uh, the executive director of the Housing Secretariat, as well as uh, coalition members from the Ontario Older Women's Network and a number of other notable uh, uh, accessibility advocates uh, to try to advance the inclusion of greater number of accessible and universally accessible units in all new housing. Uh, we're early days in our research and early days in that work, but we hope that uh, the next uh, housing report annual update from the ex uh, from the executive director of the uh, housing secretary will provide substantial uh, improvements, and we will continue to work towards that. Uh, there were a number of. Um, of uh, proclamations uh, during the during this time between our last community ma meeting uh, and uh, members, you can see uh, and uh, and and read that they were all listed in the chair's report. I've kept my chair's report extremely brief just because we have a very long agenda. Um, all those uh, are there any questions uh, of the chair's report? Seeing none, thank you very much, members. Um, I move that this item be um, uh, received for information then. All those in favor? Any opposed? That carries. Thank you very much. Item number two, uh, we are going to be receiving a presentation from Dr. Devella, our, our esteemed medical officer of health. Um, this is uh, under the title of Toronto Public Health Response and Efforts Related to COVID-19. Uh, Dr. Devella, welcome. I believe this might be your first time at our committee, so we're very pleased to, he to hear from you, and we're looking forward to your presentation. Over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Councillor Wong Tam, for your kind introduction, and thank you to members of the committee for the opportunity to be with you here this morning. Uh, Councillor, I am conscious of the fact that you have a lengthy agenda. I will take us through this presentation, you know, as uh, thoroughly but as quickly as I can. And I believe uh, the presentation is available there, and I'm hoping that somebody might be able to drive the slides for me. It's on the screen now. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much. And thank you to whomever is there in committee room two driving the slides very kindly for me. I do appreciate that. So again, good morning, everybody. I will take you through a, a presentation uh, regarding COVID-19, uh, a truly unprecedented situation, and what we have been doing uh, at Toronto Public Health uh, both in terms of the general response and that which is um, meant to be focused on uh, subpopulations within our city and in particular for those who experience accessibility challenges, uh, you know, in our city. So going to the next slide, let's start off with a current state update. I am giving you some preliminary data that will be released uh, very shortly today. Today we will be reporting 420 new cases, unfortunately, of COVID-19 in our city. That will take us to a total of 36,821 since the start of the pandemic. At this point in time, 
we have 174 people hospitalized, 45 in intensive care units. And with the uh, significant amount of community transmission of COVID-19, so there is COVID-19 actively circulating in our community. Not surprisingly, there are unfortunately a number of outbreaks in the various uh, institutions and locations in our city. Notably, uh, today, we have 28 active outbreaks within long-term care homes. 10 actually occurring in our hospitals, and these are active outbreaks in our hospitals, and as well, 25 out active outbreaks in our schools throughout our city. Uh, people are working around the clock to minimize and mitigate the impact of these outbreaks. I, I do want to point out, though, in particular for our schools, while we are watching these numbers very, very carefully, not just in schools, but in all locations around our city, uh, when we look at schools, I would ask that you keep in mind that we have roughly 1,200 schools uh, throughout our city and 25 active outbreaks at this point in time. There are remarkable efforts uh, being undertaken by schools, school boards, and certainly those of us in public health to say nothing of the efforts of uh, people who are part of our school communities to really do the very best we can to reduce the risk of transmission and spread of COVID-19 in these important settings because we know how very important it is for our schools to be operating, particularly in person. Um, it has so many benefits for our children, not just from an academic or an educational perspective, but in so many other aspects of broader health, social health, mental health, uh, et cetera. So we really are uh, working very hard with our partners to keep those going. Next slide. Uh, you know, just to let you know, we're, we're talking, uh, what I've provided you, the numbers I've spoken about, give you a general sense as to what's happening with COVID and, and what impact it is having on our community in a very general sense. But given that public health, one of public health's key objectives is actually reducing health inequities in our community, we are obviously interested in understanding COVID's impact on specific populations and subpopulations within our community. So one of the efforts that we're undertaking is uh, the collection of socio-demographic information, very specific information that helps us to understand who is being impacted by COVID, what risk factors and what circumstances describe their unique uh, lives, and how best do we uh, then use that information, not only in respect of managing COVID-19 in those unique circumstances, but as well to understand the broader um, risk factors that are driving health inequities in our community. Um, COVID-19 has certainly highlighted uh, that which we have had in our city before in terms of health inequities. Uh, and I think it provides an opportunity for us as public health to really, you know, substantively address those inequities, first and foremost in terms of managing COVID-19, but to build on that, to subsequently work on reducing those health inequities on a go forward basis so that we're ready for whatever health hazard or new emerging health issue impacts on us as a city, because we can expect that those things will happen in the future. In any case, right now, what is happening with respect to COVID-19 is that in the course of case and contact management, we have the opportunity to work through individual circumstances and to understand what the specific circumstances are for that individual who has been diagnosed with a COVID-19 infection and to address their unique circumstances. But we are also working uh, with a group called the, uh, um, the uh, Health uh, Commons to collect information um, retrospectively once we have some uh, research and ethics board work and legal agreements in place. Our plan involves a collaboration with colleagues at Ryerson so that we can understand what the socio-demographic characteristics are of those who actually reported COVID-19 infection here in our city. It will be um, um, a, a questionnaire that we will be administering uh, with the support of Ryerson University. We'll be enlisting their 
students and, and research uh, um, supports in order to actually ask people a number of questions, questions on race, ethnicity, country of birth, sexual orientation, gender identity, disability, employment, and many others. So we are seeking to ask these questions of a sample um, that, of, of people for whom we don't currently have these data so that we have a fulsome set of data. And when we are able to um, really look at all we have assembled in respect of COVID-19, we'll be able to really understand the various impacts that COVID-19 has had on specific subpopulations in our city over and, over and above what we understand its impact has been on all of us collectively so that we can work towards specific solutions that address health inequities on a go forward basis. Next slide. We of course have in the course of uh, responding to COVID-19, which as I've mentioned has been an unprecedented challenge, I think for all of us, but certainly for those of us at Toronto Public Health. We have tried to reflect as fulsomely as possible uh, principles of accessibility and our operations uh, is one area um, that has been a significant component of our response. And so here on this slide, we just have a few examples of the kinds of things that we are doing to ensure that we're meeting the needs of our population and the various uh, subpopulations within our city uh, as we seek to provide the, the best response possible to COVID-19. So when it comes to provision of COVID-19 test results, we know that there are members of our public who experience barriers in accessing results, their own test results from the provincial system. So we work with those individuals to make sure that they're provided their test results um, and that they receive communications in a format that makes sense for them in their unique circumstances as much as possible. Uh, we, we receive a number of calls in our, uh, our hotline or our call center. We operate a pretty significant uh, call center given that COVID-19 is, is a new disease for all of us uh, and certainly for our public. People understandably have many questions and don't always know the answers around how best to access services and resources for them as they seek to navigate their COVID-19 um, infection and, and their journey towards better health. So we certainly provide through our hotline or call center service consultation and referrals to appropriate services and resources in the communities where people reside. And uh, we seek to help them uh, connect to those services that meet their needs. And as well, you may have heard that one of the services that we're offering as part of the COVID-19 response in order to help support the ability of people to affect a good isolation, which is part of protecting people from ongoing transmission of COVID-19, we have worked to ensure an adequate number of accessible rooms at the Toronto Voluntary Isolation Centre. These are just a few of the kinds of things that we have been doing as part of our COVID-19 response. So I will say this though, as much as we aim for the best possible service, and we do every single day, uh, you know, I expect that we don't always hit our goal as much as we would like to, right? Uh, I do think we're constantly aiming for the best uh, in service. We will occasionally fall short, but that doesn't stop us from trying, nor does it stop us from seeking out opportunities to do better. We know that there are things that we can do better in our COVID-19 response, and we are committed to continuing to do better in those areas that we've identified where we need to do better. And we're committed as well to continuing to look for those opportunities um, and to listen for those opportunities. Uh, to do better wherever we can. Whether it comes to, you know, simplifying fact sheets or other information, uh, you know, adopting and using new and um, innovative uh, methods of communicating and providing information to our public. And as well, engaging more in what we call sort of human-centered projects, using design thinking uh, more effectively and engaging with members of our public 
so that when we seek to design or provide service or um, develop new uh, offerings and resources, whether it's an isolation center or services via a hotline, um, that we are engaging with members of our community of um, you know all the different backgrounds um, um, and uh, uh, you know uh, areas within the city and subpopulations, so that we're able to provide the kinds of services that actually really meet needs, really meet people where they're at, um, and really work towards addressing existing health inequities and reducing the gap in health that people experience. The next slide speaks to that which we've been doing on COVID-19 stakeholder engagement. Not that the stuff that I've just told you about doesn't address that, but we do have some very specific stakeholder engagement activities. Uh, we have developed a COVID-19 community outreach rapid response team. They have been working um, diligently to provide outreach to various community agencies. Uh, very, very active engagement. I know that they've delivered uh, 20 presentations at least, specifically to uh, seniors and to uh, organizations uh, serving people with disabilities. I think that we have um, really worked hard with community partners uh, in order to um, you know, connect with agencies who already have established relationship. We know that this is an important principle for us to um, work under and to work with. So we have a list of agencies, and I, I won't uh, go through the whole list, but suffice it to say that we really are working with a number of agencies who have established relationship with many, many communities um, and populations within the city. And we're seeking to leverage those uh, relationships and um, those, uh, you know, established connections as much as possible. We have also consulted and provided advice to many agencies, whether they're community organizations, city divisions and services, schools and other anchor institutions, if you will, throughout our community in order to provide advice on COVID-19 guidelines, which we recognize have changed over time as the science has developed, and as well to make sure that um, we are providing the best advice in interpreting those guidelines to create adaptive and inclusive programs as much as is possible. Turning now to the subject of communication activities, we have worked very hard and will continue to do so to uh, incorporate principles of accessibility into our various communications activities. So we're on the next slide now. Uh, we are seeking to publish advice in, in a number of different challenges, uh, sorry, channels, I should say, um, and ways and means so that we're best able to meet the needs of various communities. We know that we've got um, specific work uh, that uh, uh, involves how we communicate information for the people who are deaf, deafened, or hard of hearing, for example. Uh, we have created infographics uh, to try and take some very complex health information messages and provide them in, uh, you know, more simplified, more accessible um, uh, messaging for members of the public. Uh, particularly knowing that given that we're dealing with a new disease entity, the science is evolving, you know, minute by minute, uh, and the health information can be quite complex. Um, so it has been, I will say, a, a challenge for us to keep up with the science, um, and, to tr and, and I can imagine that, that has also been the case for our public as well. So we've tried to work through the many, many um, channels that we have and try to simplify information as much as possible so that people can grab onto it in a way that makes sense to them and that they can then, uh, uh, you know, adapt or and adopt behaviors that, that make sense for them and that also protect them and those around them from COVID-19. Um, and of course, we've had, you know, worked to ensure that our website materials are as accessible as possible. Moving to the next slide, this is in keeping, as I mentioned earlier, with a core public health objective, right? Public health's main objectives are to improve the health status of the population and to reduce health inequities. 
Uh, we do not want to improve health status of our city um, at the expense of any particular group or population within our city. Uh, on the contrary, what we do is seek to improve health status overall by lifting everybody up and by reducing the gap between those who enjoy the best health and those who unfortunately enjoy lesser health or don't have the opportunity to enjoy as optimal health as some others in our city. So one of the um, things that is coming soon to a Board of Health meeting, uh, actually the next Board of Health meeting, is the uh, uh, city's uh, Toronto Health Equity Action Plan, something that we at Toronto Public Health are collaborating extensively with our colleagues in the city uh, on and will be delivered to the Board of Health next month. Over and above articulating what we have in mind in terms of goals, actions, and objectives uh, for the city from a health equity perspective, we of course continue to advocate to the province that they too establish a health equity action plan. I think it's really important that um, these are uh, the kinds of activities that we are engaging in, not only as Toronto Public Health, but as a city writ large. We know that what creates and maintains health is partially related to the kinds of things um, that we typically think of when we think of health, health care um, and, and health care services, hospitals, clinical sorts of resources. These are the kinds of things that often spring to mind when people think about what it is that drives health. But as it turns out, we know that what truly creates and maintains health are the social determinants of health, the circumstances that underpin the daily lives of people in our city. So you can see why there's an important role then for the city to play um, and other levels of government, of course, in advancing health equity. When it comes to health care, though, um, certainly the province is the lead role there. Uh, that is firmly within their mandate. Um, and is certainly an area uh, in which they need to um, articulate very specific actions to help support health equity. Uh, they, of course, also have community and social services. They have education. They have a number of other ministries that um, have within their mandate uh, things that advance health equity as well and that advance health writ large. So we are... Uh, certainly speaking to provincial partners about the importance of activity, not only in the realm of health care, but in all the social determinants of health, everything from housing and income and employment to infrastructure to the built environment and to, you know, air quality, the whole gamut of issues that we know really help. Turning to the next slide. I might have spoken a little ahead of myself because uh, we've already started speaking about the advocacy to health system partners. We know that health system partners have figured prominently in the COVID-19 response. Testing, for example, all those sorts of clinical services fall firmly to within the purview of our healthcare partners. So we have continued to liaise and advocate with these health system partners in order to ensure that services are made as available as possible to everybody in our city um, and, and that the unique needs of certain populations are taken into consideration. So, for example, as listed here in the slide, we've advocated um, and, and linked people um, in order to have the necessary conversations so that options for COVID-19 testing for homebound individuals are a reality. Um, this is ongoing work. I am sure there are moments where the uh, service has been less than optimal, but that doesn't mean that we're not trying. You know, we are still trying. We continue to um, uh, connect health partners to advise them of circumstances when we hear of them, uh, and um, to really seek out different, novel, innovative ways by which testing can be made available to all. We have done the same thing in respect of uh, working towards greater accessibility of COVID-19 assessment centers. These are run by healthcare partners as well and are not under our direct control. 
but that doesn't stop us from continuing to work with those who are in control to ensure that um, accessibility is is in considered and enhanced as much as is possible, given their unique circumstances in those uh, assessment centers. And finally, at the bottom of the slide, you'll see that we continue to advocate for and work towards ensuring various testing options are available for those who have various medical complexities. So that takes me to my final slide, uh, which is, you know, to say that, look, we completely appreciate and understand that there are significant needs in our community. Um, you know, COVID-19 has certainly been, uh, as I've mentioned a couple of times now, an unprecedented challenge, I think, to all of us, to um, those of us who work within municipal government, to those of us who work within the realm of public health, certainly to uh, our partners in healthcare, and to all of us as, as individuals living in this community. Um, there's no question that COVID-19 has uh, pushed many of us um, to our limits and stretched our capacities uh, in, in uh, innumerable ways. However, uh, I can say that at Toronto Public Health, we have always um, sought to provide our very, very best. And we expect that at times uh, we may not always reach our goal, but that doesn't stop us from trying. Uh, we do know that there is more that we can do and more that we can encourage our partners to do, not only now in sort of the acute period of time with respect to COVID-19, but I think we would be remiss if we didn't take advantage of and capitalize on that which COVID-19 has highlighted. And what COVID-19 has truly highlighted are some very significant pre-existing health inequities in our city. And it's not unique to Toronto. I think it's something that we have seen uh, in COVID-19 experiences throughout the world. Um, so we are seeking to address those inequities now in the short term. And I can, you know, undertake to you that we will continue to do so for the longer term. Um, we know that this is really um, significant and it's important to us as your local public health department. Uh, it is one of our key objectives. COVID-19 has simply highlighted the importance of this objective to us. Uh, we certainly knew of its importance before. I think it has just um, caused us to really see how very significant this is and um, engaged us in a way uh, to recommit, you know, our continued efforts towards not only improving health status of the entire city, but to reduce those health inequities that we know exist and have existed for a long time. So with that, I will wrap up my remarks. I do uh, look forward to any questions you may have, and I look forward to our ongoing collaboration. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Davila, for your presentation. Uh, I want to uh, ask that my screen be put up. Thank you very much. I can see that there are some hands uh, popping up to ask questions of you. Uh, Dr. Davila, your first set of questions is coming from Michael McNeely, followed by Liv Mendelson and Wendy Porch. Go ahead, Michael. You want to unmute yourself? Thank you. Hi, am I also allowed to make a recommendation or is it just questions for now? Uh, Mike, Michael, we're at the section where you get to ask questions and uh, recommendations will come afterwards. Oh, oh. All right. Um, I guess my question to you is um, when you talk about making messages more simpler, and making sure you get the point across. Does that mean you're thinking that the messages are not getting across at this present time? So through the chair, 
Uh, we have heard that some messages are more challenging uh, and that there is uh, some degree of confusion. Uh, that certainly has been some of the feedback that we've heard from the community. Uh, and I think uh, one of the um, points that has been made to us through various channels in the community is that it is difficult to keep up with, you know, an evolving and changing set of, of, of guidance. So we recognize that, uh, and I think that these are uh, challenges that we experience in communications on a regular basis, but they're just more pronounced uh, when the science is rapidly evolving and when we, uh, as the, respond the key responders to the pandemic, uh, are actively learning on a day-by-day -day basis. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't stop trying to be clearer and uh, more effective in our communications. Is there a follow-up question? No, not for now, thank you. Okay, thank you, Michael. Uh, la next member to question is Liv. Thank you, uh, Chair. And I have a number of questions. You can, you can let me know um, process-wise how many you want up front. Um, Dr. Tavilla, I want to thank you for spending some time with us this morning. Um, I know how busy you must be, and um, it's really important for us to hear from you and to be able to um, share our, our um, concerns with you. So thank you very much. Um, one of the questions, uh, sort of question areas I have is around data collection. Um, one of the challenges that this committee has faced in advising various city departments is that there is a dearth of data uh, collection specific to disability. Uh, we don't know where people with disabilities live within the city. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering, I know you said you're working on some sort of um, retroactive work in collecting data, but I'm wondering if we have good data on how many people with disabilities, uh, what percent um, have been tested or are of uh, the testing group and of the positive cases uh, numbers, and also um, who is using the isolation centers and whether um, you have numbers on, on that in terms of disability. So through the chair, uh, you know, I regret to say that we don't have as much information as I would like to have, um, uh, you know, on uh, those who have tested in our, you know, in our population and what the experience has been uh, through COVID-19 of those in our community who have some form of disability. I, I think that this is one of the areas that we, we really need to work on. Uh, and I am very interested in hearing the committee's advice on how best to proceed, uh, recognizing that we do experience some challenges. I think we have some individual information and have managed uh, unique circumstances in the course of case management, right? When we've had specific uh, situations, I know that our case managers uh, do an excellent job of understanding what circumstances, what the fulsome living circumstances are and, and the health conditions and, and uh, the unique circumstances of the individuals that we have um, uh, as COVID-19 um, cases that we are managing. Uh, so they do that as part of solid um, case management, but it isn't actually necessarily collected and reported on in an aggregate way. Uh, and that's why we're undertaking that research with our colleagues in Ryerson to try to get uh, better data so that we can understand more um, and work more uh, towards better actions to reduce health inequities. Thank you, because uh, anecdotally we know people with disabilities have been really hard hit um, and it would be helpful in planning for recovery if we, if we have more information. Um, I have a question for you about um, availability of, ac of accessible washrooms in the city. Um, that's something we're hearing a lot about from community, that there really aren't any um, public places where people can access accessible washrooms. I'm wondering if you have information about that um, and about the decision to close um, public washrooms. If you can illuminate that for us, then maybe... Um, uh, help us understand what is available right now. 
So through the chair, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't know that I'm your best person to speak to that particular issue. Certainly those data I do not have directly, but I'm happy to uh, go to my city colleagues and, and perhaps uh, through the chair or through the clerk's office, provide some information to the committee. I do apologize for that. Well, thank you. I, I know it's um, it's an important issue, especially for folks who um, are um, street involved. Um, it's it's becoming it has already become quite a, a dire um, situation. I have two more quick questions, and I'll save I'll reserve the rest of my thoughts for the comment section. Um, I'm pleased to know that you're working on a health equity plan. I think that's um, you know a really important step. Um, I'm wondering if that's something we could hear more about at this committee. Uh, once, once you're uh, further along in your in your stage of developing it. So through the chair, I think that's actually up to you and the committee. I'm happy to uh, provide uh, more information, and I'll I'll leave it to uh, uh, the chair to determine how best to make that happen. Okay, I am going to um, actually stop here and let my uh, fellow committee members uh, ask you some questions, and then and I hope to speak with you again in the next section. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liv, and thank you, Dr. Devella. Um, our next member to ask questions is Wendy Porch. And if I can ask uh, any other members who would like to ask questions of Dr. Devella, please indicate uh, and let me know on the screen. Okay, seeing none, then Wendy will be our last member to ask questions. Go ahead, Wendy. Thank you, and thank you, Dr. Devilla, for being here. I just want to echo what, what Liv was saying and, uh, about, we know that you're busy, so we really do appreciate you being here, and it's a very important conversation, I think, that we're having, particularly within the framework of thinking through health equity and your mandate to improve health equity for people uh, across Toronto. So I have three general questions for you. My first one is I'm also very interested in the equity research that you're describing uh, in consultation with Ryerson University. I wanted to ask in particular about how or whether or not you have considered within that um, approach how people with developmental disabilities are going to be included as uh, subjects in the research. So we know that people with Down syndrome, for example, are more vulnerable to COVID, um, but there are some very particular research considerations around including people with, I just heard somebody say yes, people with developmental disabilities in research like that. And I, I just wanted to know from you uh, how you're planning to make sure that they are included as folks who are very important in terms of this story. So is that something that you have been considering so far? So through the chair, uh, the the nature of the work that we're going to be doing with Ryerson is is to actually take uh, those who have been diagnosed as having had a COVID-19 infection and asking the questions of them. Mm -hmm. So regardless of who they are and what their uh, pre-existing circumstances, medical conditions or otherwise might be. So um, there isn't a selection per se, Mm -hmm. It is actually the people who have been diagnosed and who are known to have had COVID-19 infection because they had a positive test. They are the ones who will be part of the study, if you will. And it's really more of a data collection effort. It is, uh, uh, it does still need to undergo appropriate research and ethics review. Mm -hmm. But, but uh, the, those who are included are predetermined by those who have had a COVID-19 infection and for whom we have not yet been able to ask these questions. And I just want to follow up. I do understand that. But I think uh, in my experience in terms of research myself, having been a research fellow, um, when you get to the ethics perspective, when you start to talk about ethics approval, there is a tendency to exclude people with developmental disabilities from research as participants because of questions related to consent and capacity to consent. And so what we see in the end in, in a lot of these kinds of research studies is that people with developmental disabilities are not included as research subjects because they are in essence filtered out based on issues related usually uh, not substantiated issues related to the capacity to consent. So I just wanted to flag that as an issue uh, because we know, in fact, that people with Down syndrome are more likely to have contracted COVID than many others and to have experienced dire outcomes. So I would encourage, uh, during my comment section, I'll provide some comments on maybe what you could do there. 
I also wanted to ask you about mobile testing for those who are housebound. Um, so, as you know, there are a number of barriers for people who are not connected to congregate care, but are people with disabilities living in the community in terms of accessing testing. And you said that you're working on advocating for more testing options. Perhaps we should be doing this together because it's certainly something that I have and many of my colleagues here on the committee have been advocating for. Uh, we know that there are testing teams that will be assembled quite quickly and can be dispatched to congregate care facilities, for example. Uh, supportive housing, which is where people with physical disabilities who are leading independent lives live, they have been included in those kinds of rapid testing outreach initiatives, but sort of later, after long-term care and after retirement uh, communities. But in terms of folks who are living in the community in their own homes, uh, the options are very limited, so I wonder if you could tell me what you know to be the options for mobile testing, and also if you have any suggestions on what we should be doing perhaps together to improve that. So through the chair, a couple of things. One, I know that there have been some uh, specific efforts undertaken between Toronto Paramedics and the Toronto Central Lynn in order to provide testing in individuals' homes on an as-needed basis. So that's certainly one of the efforts that's underway. I believe as well that there have been a number of home care uh, providing agencies that have been able to also provide similar supports. I don't know of every single one of them by name, but I, I have been at a number of tables where I've certainly heard of that happening. So it's that kind of coordination. Um, so if we're aware of a situation, uh, we liaise with, with community partners like Toronto Central Lynn or the relevant uh, local health integration network agency. Toronto Central Lynn, I would say we have probably the strongest relationship with and it covers the vast majority, although not all of the city. Um, so I, I can probably speak best to the agencies that um, are part uh, of that particular Lynn. Uh, but those are the kinds of things that we're aware of. But of course, I'm open to other options and opportunities. The more partners we have to connect with to provide those services, then the more accessible the services will be. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think maybe there's an opportunity for us to think about something province-wide because in my experience, I'm, I'm connected to Toronto Central Inn. It has been quite difficult to have a clear sense of what to do in the instances of, of homebound individuals looking for testing. Um, okay. So my final question for you is about PPE availability. And so, as, as you know, talking about the social determinants of health, um, people with disabilities are likely to be living at or below poverty levels. And so people do not have uh, extensive amounts of additional funding that they can use towards PPE. And yet PPE, uh, using PPE, using masks as we, as we go about our days, using gloves in, in terms of any kind of care that's provided is a reality for people today. Um, I come from a, a background of working at an HIV-oriented uh, organization, and we can find condoms anywhere. So if you go into most HIV-oriented community organizations, you can find a, a jar of condoms on the table, and they are free. And so I'm just wondering if there's any sense or any kind of movement towards acknowledging this as a, as a public health initiative. Clearly, we've all done that. But the the broader availability of the kinds of tools that we need to fight this public health um, situation is not even on par with what we saw in terms of trying to uh, combat HIV. And so is there any sort of thinking about how we can make PPE more freely available to people who can't afford it in, in the context in which we live? So through the chair, that's an excellent question. Uh, I will be very upfront. Uh, we are, as the local public health department, are not engaged at all in the procurement of, of uh, personal protective equipment. Um, and uh, so I think when it comes to these issues, uh, we have relied on other city divisions. There have been other city divisions that have taken the lead on I'm certainly happy to follow up with them and with those uh, at the provincial level, particularly if we are talking about the provision of personal protective equipment through the delivery of health care services or clinical services. That, that would probably come through and would be more directly linked to work that's being undertaken by the Ministry of Health. So I'm happy to follow that up offline and um, see what, what options. Available. Thank you. 
Thank you. And thank you, Wendy, for your questions. Um, I recognize now that, uh, members, you cannot see the, the timer on the screen that I can see in committee room two because it's, uh, it, we don't have a camera on the timer. So uh, just uh, for everyone's uh, information, of course, the opportunity to ask questions and to speak is five minutes long. Uh, but I will give you a, a warning about 30 seconds uh, before the five minute mark so you'll know when to conclude. Uh, and so, Wendy, we gave you a little bit of extra time because I realized that you were disadvantaged by not seeing the screen. Are there any other members who have questions uh, for Dr. Davila? Okay, seeing none, then we'll move into uh, to, uh, to the remarks. Uh, first member to speak, please let me know who would like to speak first. Michael, go ahead, please. Michael McNeely. Hi, I hope I'm using this button properly. Um, so, is the is the doctor still here? I don't know. I he sounds sincere, but that's why. I um. So what I'd like to do is just to talk a little bit about communication methods. Um, I do appreciate the answer to your question. I appreciate um, you being here today as well. But um, I'm going to speak on behalf of people who are deaf, deaf, blind, and blind. And I want to encourage, first of all, the provision of closed captioning for all your presentations because for those people who are blind and deaf they cannot see the American Sign Language to understand it. Secondly, I would like to recommend a feedback mechanism so that um, people can, for example, say, oh, we didn't understand this message, can we have it again? Because it's extremely important that we understand the messages that your department is putting out, and if we don't understand them, then we can't do anything with them. There should be an option at the bottom of any communication, including for the people that Wendy represents, those with developmental disabilities, to say, we didn't understand that. Can you please give us the information again in a different format? Um, and then thirdly, I would also recommend um, people whose job it is, is to um, answer questions that are given to them by the community, especially people with disabilities. Um, and this communication should be open to people who are deaf so that it can be testing, it can be emailing, it could also be phone in for other people, but those communication methods would be preferable by my community. And so ultimately, it would be just like um, 311 and the community help line, but more specifically for COVID questions and concerns. And a lot of it may be just repeating information that's already out there, but it's still important to have this service available so that people can feel that their needs are being met and that they have the resources available to assist them in any sort of um, difficulty. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael, for your remarks. Uh, are there any other members who would like to speak? Um, and what I'd like to do is, uh, I see your hands live in, Wendy. What I realize I should have done first is probably tabled the motion uh, because there are also members of the committee who worked uh, with us. Uh, so I'm actually moving this motion on behalf of everybody. Uh, so what I would ask the clerk to do is put the motion onto the screen and I will then proceed to read it. And I'll start my clock myself. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I move that the that City Council request the Medical Officer of Health to report to the to TAC in the second quarter of 2021 
or sooner on strategies and outcomes on how current health programs are reaching target demographics, including pe persons living with disabilities, in order to ensure their needs are being met. Uh, item number two, City Council requests the Medical Officer of Health to develop public health guidelines and recommendations to minimize the transmission of COVID-19 to people uh, to people with disabilities living independently outside of congregate settings and to report back to TAC in the second quarter of 2021 or sooner with recommendations to include expanding access to affordable or free personal protective equipment, increasing access and delivery of influenza vaccine via mobile medical units, working with the Toronto Transit Commission and Wheeltrans on flexible programs and times to accommodate medical appointments. Uh, recommendation number three, City Council requests the province of Ontario to work in partnership with Toronto Public Health to authorize paramedics or other emergency medical service providers to provide to deliver COVID-19 testing. Recommendation number four, City Council requests the province of Ontario to accelerate and expand the availability of mobile uh, medical programs to include access to COVID-19 testing and the delivery of the influenza vaccine to populations disproportionately affected by COVID-19, including women, racialized, and low-income populations and people living with disabilities. Um, if, forgive me if there was a transgression between my printed copy and that of the screen. I think most of it was captured and I want to thank the clerks for all their support. Um, and of course to thank the members of the committee, uh, each and every single one of them. We had an opportunity to speak uh, to and with prior to our meeting because we wanted to consolidate our thoughts and pre present it in, uh, in one uniform uh, motion for Dr. Davila and the public health officials. Um, there is a, there's, it, it should be said that COVID-19 has impacted a number of communities in disproportionate ways. And I think that as the chair of the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee, I have heard now uh, personal testaments as well as numerous uh, uh, stories about how the pandemic has really reshaped uh, individual lives. Um, and unfortunately, I think that uh, this particular group uh, and the advocates who are members of our committee uh, have been on the front lines of trying to be heard to make sure that their voices in the communities that they represent are um, being considered as governments, as health bodies uh, develop um, uh, responses to the COVID emergency. So I want to thank Dr. Davila, uh, as she has been thanked before at, board, at the Board of Health at City Council, uh, for the extraordinary work that she and the members of Toronto Public Health have done over the past um, 11 months. For her and, and her and her team, the work began uh, not just nine months ago. It has been a lot of pre-planning and preparation work uh, leading up to uh, the pandemic response. And we know that this work has been difficult. It has taken on an emotional toll, not just on the physical and, and spiritual self, but also on the families and the communities of, of care that they're connected to. Um, but we know that more work needs to be done. And this is why we move this, uh, I'm moving this spirit, uh, this, this motion in the spirit of everyone on this committee uh, to ensure that the, that the good work will be done uh, faster, uh, more broadly, more comprehensively, uh, and that it will center the experiences as well as the, the, the opinions and the feedback of this particular uh, community. Um, I will now reopen the floor to members who would like to speak who have not spoken before. Uh, those who have, uh, if I can just see your hands, if you can indicate. Um, Wendy Porch, thank you. Bhuvani, thank you. Liv, great. And Michael, you've spoken before. Um, I, I recognize you were disadvantaged because I, I did not put the motion up beforehand. So I'm going to bring you back in to, uh, to speak afterwards, OK? So. Um, uh, Bhuvani, do you want to go first? Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Devella, for your presentation um, and for being here with us today. Um, I just want to make a quick comment um, that I hope when we do talk about data collection um, in, in regards to people with disabilities, um, that we are all also considering the um, racialized population and women with disabilities. And I think every time you add a layer, um, in, in terms of people with disabilities, it adds more complexity and more of a vulnerability. Um, so I hope that when we do talk about data collection, that it will be a bit nuanced um, and that we will be able to see um, uh, a more fulsome picture. 
Thank, thank you very much, Bhavani, for your remarks. Um, I will invite Wendy to speak. Thank you, and my apologies for taking up too much time earlier. Uh, lots of questions and lots to talk about. Um, uh, I certainly support everything in, in our motion, but on two things that fall outside of the motion, I just wanted to say again, in terms of the research that you're doing with Ryerson, uh, Ryerson University is also um, lucky to have a very established and very uh, respected disability studies program. And if I could recommend connecting with them on this research in particular, in order to be able to ensure that people with disabilities are represented and uh, connected with in ways that are um, that allow them to be included, that facilitate inclusion and not exclusion based on some of the things that we see around research ethics protocols, in particular as they relate to people with developmental disabilities. So, uh, I know many of the folks there, and they're excellent, and they'll be able to um, make sure that that does not become an, a barrier to having fulsome data, which is, I think, what you're looking for. Um, the second piece that I wanted to just speak briefly to is related to uh, it's related to really fulfilling this mandate of working towards um, uh, reducing health inequities across all of the populations that we've talked about, and in particular, people with disabilities. And I just wonder if you would consider the development of a group or at least several champions within Toronto Public Health that could uh, really focus on, or at least partly focus on, the inclusion of people with disabilities in Toronto Public Health initiatives. I think what we've seen here is something that, you know, we know that you're working, we know you're working extremely hard. I see you on the press conferences all the time. Uh, but, you know, the, the medical way of thinking about disability diverges from the way that we think about that disability, which is in terms of a social model. And, you know, people with disabilities have a tendency to stay away from things that are medically oriented for good reason, frankly, based on history. Uh, but what happens then is at times like this, where we have a crisis, we see a very distinct divide uh, between our populations and the, the ways that the kind of medical uh, based uh, organizations are looking at this. And so if there was a development of a group or at least a couple of champions there that could connect with us as a committee, but also connect with many of us in our capacity as um, folks who work in the community, we could help to foresee these barriers and we could help you to address them before they become things that are interesting. Uh, but again, thank you very much. I'm also volunteering. If you want to reach out to me, uh, I'd be very happy to, to work with you on this. Uh, we are a health service provider as well, the organization that I work with. Uh, but again, thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much, Wendy. And I will make sure that Dr. Davila gets your uh, contact information. Uh, our next Thanks. speaker is Liv and then Michael McNeely. Actually, Michael, I'm going to bump you to after Michelle because I see that Michelle's hand is up and she has not spoken yet. Um, so then Michelle and then M Michael McNeely. Uh, go ahead, Liv, please proceed. I will also uh, try to be brief. Um, uh, in terms of data collection um, through Ryerson, you know, I couldn't agree more with Wendy. Um, we'd also be happy to help participate um, in any kind of initiative looking at reducing barriers and um, getting, um, you know, more depth and, and breadth in research. Um, I I do encourage you uh, while you are, um, while things are still ongoing um, and, and uh, to take measures not just to look retrospectively, but to look um, in the in the current, in the now, um, especially around questions of, you know, who is getting tested, what the percentages are um, of positivity and, and what the percentages are of people with disabilities getting tested out of the testing pool, and also around who's using the isolation centers. Um, I think that's information that would be very helpful uh, for us going forward and to get the complete picture of what's, what's happening right now. Um, I uh, I would like to um, through the chair to to ask um, to create a motion to um, bring back whether it's Dr. Davila or the team that's working on the Health Equity Action Plan. I think um, there should be some connection between this committee and and that development um, to help you to support you to have a a, a disability and accessibility lens um, when you're uh, creating a plan. Um, so I'll 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 bring that to the chair. And um, I know this seems like an outlier, uh, the issue of accessible washrooms. Um, and I know it's a, it's a 
an issue that lies with and between um, parks and rec uh, and public health. Um, but the experience of people on the ground is they don't know why, um, they don't know who's responsible, but there is very little opportunity to access public washroom facilities that are accessible. And there's very little information about what and where is accessible. So I, I really want to flag that as an issue. I know there are issues around cleaning and sanitizing. I know there are reasons for closures. Um, but whatever is open and available, if we could make that more clear to people, uh, people are really, really struggling with this issue. Um, and so um, I, I know it's a, it's a cross-departmental kind of collaboration issue, but I, I want to flag it as one that's having um, an outsized impact on, on people's daily living. Thank you. And thank you, Liv. Um, I will work with the Dr. Villa to ensure that the Health Equity Action Plan does come back uh, to TAC once it's in ready for presentation uh, format. Um, I would invite uh, Michelle to speak next. And before, Michelle, you take the microphone, uh, Jason, I'm, I'm just wanting to check in with you to see if you also want to speak to this item, if you can just uh, let me know. Okay, I, I'm seeing your hand. I, I will recognize you shortly. Thank you. Uh, Michelle, please go ahead, and then we're going to hear from uh, Jason and Michael McNeely. I'm going to bump you to the, to the end because you've spoken previously, but you will have the chance. Michelle, go ahead, please. Thank you, Councilor Longtime, and thank you, Dr. Davila, for being with us today. I will be quite quick. I have a lot of the, uh, had a lot of the, oh, sorry. Sorry, I thought there was a bit of an echo there. Uh, seems better. So a lot of my uh, fellow committee members have touched on points I was planning to bring up much more eloquently than I could. So thank you, Wendy and Liv. I just wanted to uh, throw my hat into the ring in terms of volunteering. I work in developmental services uh, and we have previously supported the city in having the voices of people with developmental disabilities heard in terms of recovery and rebuild. And we can absolutely support in having voices heard in these efforts as well, um, particularly addressing the gap that Wendy brought up earlier about folks that live in more supported uh, independent living situations in the community and uh, having workers that can build on the trusted relationship they already have to have these questions answered and this data gathered. Uh, we also have established an anti-racism committee within our organization, and I think it would be worthwhile to speak with us in order to have that lens on the issues um, in terms of all of the intersections that Bhuvani brought up earlier. Uh, so just wanted to put that offer out there. That's it for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michelle. Uh, Jason, to speak. Oh, th thank you. I'll just be brief. Doctor, thank you for coming and speaking with us today. We know your time is very valuable. These are very important issues that need to be addressed. Um, I, I come from a bit of a different background. Uh, I've come from the legal background, not so much the health and, uh, and services background, but uh, um, I as well see the importance of this intersectionality. And uh, although, again, we focus on the medical model, not the health model. We certainly can't ignore that in, in this pandemic. So um, I, I'm also willing to throw my hat in the ring to help you and your staff in any way that I, that I can. Um, these issues are, are, are issues that, that really haven't been focused on very much in the media, but I'm glad you're here today to discuss them with us. And I'm also um, offering my services to whatever extent that may be helpful to uh, work on your project and try and advance uh, these initiatives. Thanks. Jason, thank you. And just checking one more time if there is any final speakers. If not, um, oh, Howard. Uh, okay, Howard, go ahead, please. Howard Wax. Thank you. I just wanted to confirm that TTC accessible washrooms are available throughout the system now. Uh, Howard, I don't know if Dr. Davila will be able to answer that question, but we do have TTC staff who will be presenting very shortly, so I think that question could be posed to them. Well, I'm just indicating that I've just confirmed with TTC that they are all open. Oh, I see. That's a remark saying that they're all open. Yep. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for sharing thank that you. information. Uh, and that brings us to Michael... McNeely. Go ahead, Michael, please. Michael, do you, are you 
Unmute. Okay, I see that you've opted. Uh, yes, I just need you to be patient with me. Question, because um, I'm using the kitchen machine and just do the... Um, so, I think... I think you didn't mention that we all had the opportunity to um, help draft that motion prior to today's meeting. But because the captioning wasn't working before, I didn't really have much of an opportunity to participate. So I just want that to be acknowledged. Um, I would like the motion to be slightly amended to allow for a communication plan to be developed. Um, I think I can go with the first point. There are three points in the motion, so I, I would like to see that a communication plan be implemented that takes in the feedback from all aspects of the disability community and integrates that feedback. Okay, Councilor Lee, you have Okay. Is there something wrong? Uh, no, Michael, we're just, uh, Michael, I apologize. We're just trying to organize ourselves and my screen uh, with some of your images keep jumping. So please forgive me and uh, it's a little bit difficult to track. Um, but I'm going to ask the clerk to put the motion back onto the screen and this will probably give us a chance to uh, take a look at what needs to be amended. And Michael, I do acknowledge that we were not able to bring you into the conversation prior to the TAC meeting because we weren't able to provide captioning uh, in those uh, in that facility. So I apologize for that, but uh, certainly we're going to try to make sure that your, your, your comments are captured today for sure. Um, so here comes the motion back on the screen. Uh, Michael, Thank you. Yeah. If you can help indicate for us uh, which item needs to be amended, is, the, is it the first paragraph? Um, so it's a motion to um, such recommendations to include, I would just make a new bullet point. Okay. So yeah, so a new bullet point, yeah, yeah. Where, where the mouth is, just make a new, a new letter. Okay, so we can add that as, as item uh, 2D. And what, um, if you can just repeat for us uh, what it is specifically. Um, I would say recommendations to include a communication plan that takes into consideration the needs of all members of the disability community, including deaf and people with developmental disabilities. Because in my view, it's not just the access to affordable personal protective equipment or the vaccine or working with the TTC. It's also been informed of all those things. Because if we're not informed of those things, then the matters will not happen. Uh, Michael, thank you. So the I would like the information to be in an accessible format and to ensure that they, there's a feedback mechanism for which they are not, which they are, if they are not accessible. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Michael. Uh, the, the staff are now working okay. to uh, capture your comments and place it as, a, as the fourth action. No, I understand. And um, I would also like to throw my hat in as well. Because um, I believe that we can work on that communication message. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Michael. I think Dr. Davila, you've you've pretty much recruited half of our committee to support the the work of public health. Uh, as you can tell, everyone is quite energized to make sure that you and and the team is successful. 
Uh, I'm going to stand this motion down, Michael, uh, largely because we want to make sure we get the language right. Uh, so what I will do is uh, ask the clerks to just take this offline. They will revise that motion to include Michael's uh, recommendations, and then we'll bring it back to vote very shortly. Uh, Dr. Devella, thank you. And uh, she may have already left the room, but I says, oh, she's still here. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, we're going to move on to our next item. Thank you. Uh, but we will. Um, uh, br once the motion is ready, I recognize that uh, public health staff probably need to, to move on to other matters uh, in their work day, but we will bring that item back to a vote if we have to uh, do so after the staff presentation of our following item. So, okay, so folks, thank you very much for your patience and working technically in many different places uh, does, does continue to be challenging. All right, we'll keep a good spirit about it. Uh, item number three is supporting people with disabilities in Toronto during and beyond COVID-19 Shelter Support and Housing Administration. Um, I'm going to uh, invite staff to provide us with a presentation. Today we have Justin Lewis, who's the Director of Infrastructure Planning, uh, Development, Shelter Support and Administration, and Valessa Faria, uh, who is going to be helping him with the presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you may proceed. Thank you, Councillor. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. Thank you for uh, having us here today. Um, I did want to uh, just explain that our presentation is around supporting people with disabilities in Toronto during and beyond COVID-19. Um, if we could just go to the next slide, please. Is, is uh, I think City Clerks was going to put up the slides for me. Thank you. <laughs> And if we could just go to the second slide, please. Thank you. Um, the second slide is just really an introduction of uh, myself and my colleague. Um, I just want to describe the slide for you. It includes uh, an image of visualizing Toronto's housing uh, system continuum, including emergency shelter beds, uh, safe and legal multi-tenant houses, long-term care homes, uh, supportive transitional social and affordable rental housing uh, to market affordability challenges. It also, um, in this presentation, it was created to, uh, in a response to a motion by the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee to bring forward a presentation on how the city is supporting vulnerable people with disabilities in Toronto during and beyond COVID-19. I'd like to thank the councillor once again, uh, as well as to thank the committee for the opportunity to present today on behalf of Shelter Support and Housing Administration, and Valette is here on behalf of the Housing Secretariat today. In addition, I'd like to also thank uh, all city staff for their amazing contributions each and every day in regards to the response for COVID-19 and everything else we do each and every day. Um, the two presenters are myself, uh, Justin Lewis and Valette, as we said. Um, my name is Justin Lewis. I'm the Director of Shelter Support and Housing uh, Infrastructure Planning and Development at Shelter Support and Housing uh, Administration Division. The mission of our division is to manage a coordinated and effective system of shelter and housing services uh, to improve the housing stability of people who are at risk of experiencing homelessness in Toronto. Our division works with individuals experiencing street homelessness in emergency shelters and in support of transitional and social housing. I'm just going to ask if my colleague Valessa could do a little introduction for herself and her division. Thank you, Justin, and good morning to the chair and members of the committee. Thank you so much for this opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Valessa Ferrier, and I'm the director of the Housing Secretariat. The Housing Secretariat at the City works with city divisions, agencies, other orders of government, nonprofit and private sector partners, and advocacy groups to, st to strategically plan for and deliver permanent, affordable, and supportive housing. And that is housing across the continuum that Justin um, has mentioned before. Our two divisions work collaborative collaboratively in planning, um, not only planning for housing, but also the ongoing operations of housing. Thank you. Thank you, Valessa. Um, if we could, um, if we could just go to um, the next slide, please. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I do want to say that um, I do want to say that you know um, within Toronto and within our two divisions, um, we, we support vulnerable people. Toronto Shelter and Housing Services must respond to challenges and pressures across the housing continuum. Some city divisions and several uh, agencies deliver housing policies, housing policies, programs, services, and infrastructure. Divisions and agencies are guided by several aligned strategic policies affecting housing and homelessness, such as ho uh, Housing Opportunities Toronto, Affordable Housing Action Plan 2010 to 2020, the Toronto Senior, Stra uh, Senior Strategy Version 2.0, and the Toronto Poverty, Poverty Reduction Strategy and the Housing Stability Service Plan. Uh, I want to take this opportunity just to uh, explain to the committee that I too have uh, uh, lived experience as someone living with a disability. Uh, approximately 20 years ago, I became an amputee in a major car accident. Um, and, you know, that lived experience makes this, this work and this presentation very important to me today. And, uh, you know, the work of, of making our city accessible uh, is, is, is very important and it's something that I, I often think about uh, from my heart and not my mind. If we could just go to the next slide, please. I'd like to describe this slide. Uh, the slide includes an image of one of our shelter locations. It shows one bed in one of our shelter spaces, a pet carrier, and a storage locker. Um, this slide provides an overview of homelessness in Toronto. So just to speak to our last street needs assessment, uh, uh, when we did that, it was estimated that there were almost 9,000 people in Toronto or, who are homeless on any given night. Um, 500 of them. Uh, in and above 500 of them were staying outside. Homelessness has been on the rise uh, since 2011, and we know that people who become homeless are staying in our shelter longer than they have in the past, with a large proportion of those, those people considered chronically homeless. For example, that would mean, for, for everyone uh, listening to the presentation today, that would mean that individuals are homeless for six months or more in the past uh, one year. Even before this pandemic, before COVID-19, our system was running at capacity despite adding over 3,500 spaces in the last few years, which has almost doubled the size of our shelter system. The top two reasons people experience homelessness in Toronto is migration and inability to pay the high cost of rent. In addition, under-treated mental health issues and the opioid, opioid crisis continue to contribute to homelessness and housing stability. Next slide, please. So this slide uh, actually includes a table from the 2018 Street Needs Assessment showing the health conditions identified by survey groups who participated in the assessment. The city recognizes that individuals with chronic illness, uh, physical disability, and mental health issues are dispro disproportionately represented in the homelessness population. The city's 2018 street needs assessment provides a snapshot of the scope and profile of the city's homeless population. The street needs assessment is a needs assessment survey and point in time count of people experiencing homelessness in Toronto. Health conditions and physical disability are key questions within that survey. The survey identified uh, that 23% of all respondents had physical disabilities, 32% of respondents identified having mental health issues, and 38% had a chronic or acute medical condition. The share of respondents who reported having a chronic or acute medical condition, physical disability, and or addiction was higher among outdoor respondents. 24-hour respite site respondents and single addiction uh, and single adults staying in city administered, administered shelters. The share of respondents reporting mental health issues was also higher for outdoor respondents, 24-hour respite site respondents, and youth staying in city-administered shelters. 21% of the population reported ODSP as a source of income. This study does not spe uh, specify the type of physical disability, chronic illness, or mental health issue. Next slide, please. So 
this slide actually describes the Toronto, Toronto shelter uh, standards uh, uh, and the improves and how we're improving on accessibility. So, um, city administered shelters are expected to meet the minimum service standard as articulated in the Toronto uh, shelter standards as updated and improved by Council in 2015. The shelter standards have several components that focus on ensuring those with disabilities are accommodated. All persons have the right to seek shelter services, including people with disabilities. Shelters are required to provide services to each client in a non-judgmental manner, free from discrimination and harassment, including based on disability. Shelter providers, central intake, and streets to home assessment and referral center will conduct an initial assessment. Um, and for example, that, that would refer to a client screening procedure. And they would do that in order to uh, determine the service needs uh, and relate accessibility requirements or accommodations. So for example, it could be modified service requirements for each and every client. Shelter providers that cannot accommodate clients with a disability or clients accompanied by a service animal or an emotional support animal will make a referral to an, ac an accessible shelter and offer appropriate transportation assistance. Shelter uh, providers will take a, re a reasonable measure, every reasonable measure to accommodate a client with a disability accompanied by a service animal or emotional support animal. Shelter providers will provide an accessible physical environment in a state of good repair, and they will also provide a minimum of one washroom that is barrier-free, fully accessible, and designated gender neutral in each shelter. Information pertaining to disabilities is also tracked in our shelter management information system to ensure it can be accommodated. Next slide, please. The next slide uh, describes challenges to improving accessibility in the shelter system. As a result of, access of an accessibility audit of existing shelter sites in 2017, the city has identified significant improvements uh, around uh, the needs in, in the shelter system to meet accessible needs of all clients. There are limited amounts of shelter beds that are fully accessible. The number varies based on shelter sector. Sites that do not have accessibility features for physical disability often cannot accommodate, accommodate sorry, sites that do have accessible features for, for physical disabilities often cannot accommodate other types of disabilities. Existing shelters are in older buildings which require significant capital repairs. Uh, significant additional funding is required to ensure all sites are fully accessible. Next slide, please. The next slide discusses the new shelter design guidelines and its impact on accessibility. In order to address the higher representation of individuals with disabilities in the homeless population, the city is committed to accessible design in its new shelter design guidelines. These design guidelines of shelters should ensure that the shelter is accessible to and use, usable by everyone, including shelter users, staff, and visitors. The City uses the City of Toronto Accessibility Design Guidelines, often referred to as uh, with an acronym of TADG, to ensure sites are accessible. The goal is to provide for independent, equitable, and dignified access for people with disabilities, including but not limited to those with visual, auditory, cognitive, and mobility-related disabilities. This ensures both direct access and indirect access, meaning compatibility with a person's assistive technology. Shelter users of all abilities must be able to access and use all of the facilities, amenities, and services. Looking at the new replacement shelters are being designed for accessibility for staff, clients, and public using, use um, under the new shelter design guidelines. In creating these shelter design guidelines, various focus groups were held and individuals were invited to participate in reviewing drafts of the guidelines. The City Accessibility Office was engaged throughout the process for feedback and are in the process of completing a final review before it is published in January. That draft is with them now. 
It is important to mention that SSHA has originally planned, had originally planned to present uh, the guidelines to tax the, the committee that I'm speaking to today uh, in May uh, for feedback. However, the pandemic did affect the, uh, that taking place. The city's accessibility consultants will be forwarding these guidelines to the members of TAC in the coming days. In the design guidelines, I feel it's important uh, to point out that we have included a process for a review of those guidelines annual, annually. This means that we, have actively, we will actively be looking for feedback and comments as the document is used. Um, the guidelines will be uh, referred to as a living document and it must, it must be agile going forward. For this reason, H uh, SSHA would like an opportunity to provide a presentation at this committee in 2021. Next slide, please. The next slide uh, includes an image of myself presenting at a, sh uh, a shelter design of a pro uh, proposed shelter location. Um, the slide discusses the new shelter design guidelines and its impact on a new shelter development. All new shelters developed since 2018 have included accessible features. Through the application of, of shelter design guidelines and Toronto accessibility design guidelines, 20% of new spaces are being designed with uh, and will be accessible. That means, uh, for example, 20% of showers and change rooms, 20% of picnic tables, uh, etc. As part of the shelter infrastructure project to add a thousand new shelter beds, uh, the city has added six sites with uh, six sites with a planned 537 beds. The city has relocated 200 beds as a part of George Street revitalization project to three new sites. All have followed the guidelines previously mentioned. Six additional sites are confirmed and in development as a part of these projects. The city has a long-term goal of increasing the number of accessible, accessible spaces to 20% of all available shelter beds. Next slide, please. Thank you. Sorry. The next slide that uh, we're, we're looking at is um, a slide around the state of good repair funding and what that's being used for to improve accessibility in the shelter system. SSHA has received a state of good repair funding to improve existing shelters, including supporting accessibility. These funds help ensure the well-being of our clients and to provide them with well-maintained housing and shelter options with a focus on enhancing housing stability. Under the State of Good Repair funding, we are planning to spend about $2.6 million next year of accessibility uh, budget related projects um, at the following site. Um, we are uh, the Assessment and Referral Centre at 129 Peter Street. There's some work that will uh, work to relocate the reception area desk, uh, remove or relocate washrooms. Uh, woman, women's residence at 674 Benda Street West. There's some doorways work, uh, new door openings, power door operators, universal washrooms. Uh, there's some work that's also going on at Margaret's Respite Services at 21 Park Road, and that will include some audible indicators, scoring card designations, raised braille uh, on floor designations. Um, we will be looking to provide a barrier-free ramp to the main entrance and stairs and railways uh, in that, that location. Um, next slide, please. Uh, Justin, uh, this is the councillor speaking. Yes. Uh, I think uh, you're at 17 and a half minutes of, on your presentation, just to flag that for you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I will go, I will go quick, councillor. Thank you. So the next slide, we're just going to start, uh, speak very quickly about what SSHA has been doing uh, relative to uh, supporting the vulnerable people with disabilities during COVID-19 response. Um, next slide, please. So this slide describes uh, the city's COVID-19 for people experiencing homelessness. Um, on this slide, you'll see a picture of one of the, the temporary shelter locations. 
Um, due to a large homeless population in the shelter, shelter system, there was an urgent need to take actions quickly to delay the spread of COVID-19 um, and, and, and significantly reduce the risk of Ill, uh, illness and shelters. The city had implemented intergovernmental and sectoral response to COVID-19 involving all levels of government um, and provincial healthcare sector and community not-for-profit. This did include a three-tier approach to strengthening prevention against COVID-19 in our emergency shelter system. Um, the primary, primary goal was to save lives and make sure the healthcare system uh, did not become overwhelmed. In order to prevent illness, the city is following all provincial public health recommendations, including providing guidance, training, and resources to all shelter providers. Um, and a shelter director, uh, directive was issued confirming that all sites are required to maintain physical distancing of at least two meters, edge to edge spacing between all beds to meet public health guidance for the shelter uh, setting and during the pandemic. Next slide, please. So just very quickly, I just wanted to run through this um, since mid-March, the City of Toronto has taken urgent action to achieve physical distancing in our shelter system. Um, we have opened more than 40 temporary facilities for physical distancing, isolation, and recovery, including moving 1,960 people into 19 hotel locations. The City has also successfully housed more than 2,000 people who are homeless in shelters into uh, permanent housing through a combination of housing allowance, rent gear to income and rent gear to income unit. Next slide, please. So this next slide actually speaks to um, a map of temporary shelter programs activated uh, within that time. Um, and it just gives you a ward map. Um, I won't go through this uh, too much uh, because of time constraints. Um, next slide, please. When it comes to uh, transportation, this slide includes an image of wheel trans vehicles. And this slide describes how people experiencing homeless were, homelessness were transported during COVID-19 pandemic. The City of Toronto has several options available for transporting vulnerable people with disabilities to COVID-19 testing sites, isolation and recovery sites, and to support moves to expansion programs to facilitate social distancing. The options include the use of TTC, buses, wheel trans, wheelchair accessible school buses. We even have contracted drivers with a private charter company. And we've retrofitted City of Toronto fleet uh, vehicles. If we could just go to the next slide, please. And for the sake of time, I'll just skip to the next uh, slide around site assessment. So this slide describes accessibility of COVID-19 sites, and more specifically, this uh, site speaks to site assessment. So while we ensure accessibility compliance ahead of opening new shelters, it's always preferred due to the rapid na nature of COVID-19. Um, that was not always uh, the case, or, or we weren't always able to do that. A formal accessibility assessment was not completed for new sites. Wherever possible, clients with accessible needs remained at the sites with the best supports for their needs. When clients were transferred, they were taken to sites with known accessibility features. Some city-owned COVID-19 response sites, such as community centres, were already AODA compliant. Next slide, please. The accessibility audit, we really are just talking about um, the need uh, to look at and, and respond to all of the COVID-19 sites. Um, what I mean by this is SSHA staff have gone on the site and have noted accessible features including accessible washrooms, washroom accessibility, ramp availability and elevator availability. The city has also hired a consultant to conduct accessibility audits for COVID-19 response sites. Um, each site was, uh, was evalu evaluated against the current version of Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, the Ontario Bill uh, Building Code, and the Toronto Accessibility Design Guideline. And that was done through an in-person site survey. Next slide, please. 
again, this slide speaks to just uh, what we've done for, uh, between our sites um, and how we've rated them between good, fair, poor, and very poor based on the accessibility audit results. We had seven sites that had a good accessibility rating, which meant minimal additions and minimal work required. Eight sites had fair accessibility ratings. Six sites had poor accessibility ratings, and three sites had very poor accessibility ratings. To increase site accessibility at these sites, extensive accessibility work will be required. Renovations at these uh, sites would not be feasible without significant capital investment. We could just go to the next slide, please. And I'm going to pass it over to Valessa, and I'm sorry for the time, Councillor. Uh, thank you very much, Justin. Um, the presentation was originally timed for about 10 minutes. Uh, we are now at just under 24 minutes. Uh, Valessa, I know that your presentation is very important. Um, I'm going to ask that you can just speed it up to the, the most critical pieces. Uh, and I also note that the, the members of our committee uh, received your presentation in advance. They have reviewed it. Uh, they've also worked with us on some specific motions. I think what will be important for them is also the opportunity to ask questions. Uh, so, but please don't, uh, don't take what I've said as, as uh, uh, as, uh, as a need to skip over the pertinent points, but things that are of high level interest as, as pertaining accessibility, if you can dive deeper into that, that would be appreciated. And perhaps the general overview uh, is something that you could possibly uh, speed through a little bit. Uh, thank you very much, Alessa. Go ahead, please. Okay, uh, thank you, Councillor. And uh, I'll go through my slides. Uh, it quickly. Um, so the next section of the presentation is about the city's efforts to create new uh, permanent accessible affordable housing. Um, so the Housing Sec Secretariat oversees um, a number of programs, um, including our Open Door Affordable Rental Program, the Housing Now Initiative, which activates city-owned sites to create affordable housing. We've recently launched the Modular Housing Initiative, which was a direct response to COVID-19 and the need to provide uh, safe, uh, self-contained, accessible units to people experiencing homelessness across the city. Um, the Housing Secretary also oversees uh, uh, the Toronto Renovates program, which offers um, low-income seniors um, grants to make their homes more accessible, um, allowing them to age in place. Our work is guided by a number of uh, policies, but most importantly, the city's most recent tenure housing plan, um, the Housing TO 2020-2030 Action Plan. Um, this plan is the city's umbrella plan, which, uh, uh, which basically guides our actions, our investments, um, and, and programs um, in housing um, across the full continuum um, over the next 10 years. Next slide, please. Uh, some of the major targets in the tenure housing plan include um, the approval of 40,000 40, affordable rental homes, including 18,000 supportive housing units. Um, the supportive housing units are intended um, to provide good quality housing with wraparound supports for people experiencing homelessness and, and intersecting groups, including uh, people with disabilities, women, um, uh, uh, people from uh, low-income communities, racialized groups, and others. Next slide, please. So this slide is an overview of the, the 13 key strategies in the tender housing plan. There's a diagram, um, there's an image actually, that shows the, tr the 13 uh, key strategies. Um, the plan also contains 76 actions, and um, Achieving the targets in this plan over the next 10 years will require a combined investment from all orders of government of uh, roughly $23.4 billion. The next slide, please. So this slide uh, talks about the Housing Now Initiative. Uh, the Housing Now Initiative is, as I mentioned before, it's, uh, a city, it's a new city program approved by council in 2019 to activate city-owned sites to create affordable housing within mixed-income, uh, mixed-use mixed communities close to transit. So really about creating complete communities uh, where uh, people have access to a range of not only housing, but services. Um, as part of this program, there is a minimum 20% 20, 20 target uh, for, for all homes um, to be fully accessible. Um, 
through the leadership of, of Councillor Wong Tam, um, we have started uh, meeting with um, with a, a, a committee um, to look at how we improve um, accessibility not only in housing now sites but um, across all of our um, all of our housing programs. Um, and uh, we are specifically looking at um, uh, universal design to be incorporated in all of our housing. Next slide, please. So uh, universal design um, is, is, is a focus for us. Um, it, it's, you know, it's, it's about creating uh, housing that's adaptable and inclusive um, for everyone. Um, and uh, we will focus um, with our, our um, housing um, stakeholders in, in how we advance this work. And that includes planning and designing um, in advance to accommodate tenants changing uh, physical needs uh, um, and also to provide uh, having these modifications will provide a higher level of stability and dignity, dignity for tenants as they uh, continue to live in their units and through life, the life changes. Next slide, please. I'll talk uh, briefly about the Modular Housing Initiative approved by Council this year uh, on April 30th. Um, there are two phases of modular housing. Our first phase as well um, under construction and will be ready for occupancy um, over the next uh, few weeks actually before end of the year. Um, modular housing is prefabricated housing made in, in a factory and assembled on site. Um, these units um, will provide uh, it's that they're high, high quality, affordable, accessible homes. About 25% of all of the homes will be um, accessible. Um, through an RFP process or a request for proposal process, we selected uh, um, Coda um, Health and the neighborhood uh, group mm -hmm. as the proponents for the first uh, two modular mm -hmm. sites. And uh, the first two sites mm -hmm. are actually at 150 Harrison. Um, in Ward 9 and 11 Macy Avenue, um, sorry, 11 Macy um, in Ward 20. Next slide, please. So this slide is, uh, it, it just, uh, it, it has two images. The first image shows the construction uh, progress as of October 28th, and it's, it's, um, it's a crane basically lifting um, the modular units and assembling on site, so quite exciting. The other uh, image on the slide is an artist rendering of what the modular, um, the modular development will look like post-construction, and, and it shows uh, trees uh, and privacy barriers um, as well as the exterior um, of, of the complex. Next slide, please. Um, I'll talk really briefly about the Rapid Housing Initiative, um, which is another program that's that's um, brand new to us and, and uh, underway. Um, so the Rapid Housing Initiative is a federal initiative which was announced by the Government of Canada on uh, September 21st. It's a $1 billion program, a grant program that will be distributed to cities nationally. Um, the funding is delivered through uh, Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation. And on October 27th, the city uh, was, um, was allocated $203 million in capital to create a minimum of 417 permanent affordable homes. Um, to, to, this is a very exciting for us because it presents an opportunity to uh, to, pro to provide some much needed um, permanent affordable housing, especially for people who are currently experiencing homelessness and are at higher risk during COVID. Um, the the next step for us as the city is to move rapidly to support and uh, to sorry to uh, to submit a, uh, an investment plan to the federal government by the by November twenty seventh. Uh, for projects that uh, that could be built as part of this program. Next slide, please. Uh, I'll go through this really quickly. Uh, the, the program um, entails that uh, construction must be completed by December 20, by the end of December 2021. So it's a it's a really quick program, a 12 month program. Um, and it requires that um, housing to be developed through this program exceed the local building code by 5%. So a minimum of 20% of the new units will be affordable through our efforts. We will look to, um, to exceed this, uh, this target uh, to the extent possible. But I would just highlight that that's the, the program requirements. Next slide, please. 
Uh, this slide uh, talks about uh, the priority groups that need to be housed through uh, the Rapid Housing um, Initiative, um, including people with disabilities and a number of intersecting groups like women, seniors, young adults, uh, veterans, uh, members of the LGBT. Q2S plus community, um, as well as immigrants, refugees, and other priority groups. Next slide, please. So uh, I will pass this over to Justin. Thank, thank you very much, and uh, apologies if, if this was a bit quick. Uh, thank you very much, Valessa, and thank you, Justin, for your presentation. You folks have given us a, a lot of information to ingest. Um, and uh, I'm going to now bring this into commit, committee because we do not have uh, speakers, uh, but we do probably have some questions for you. If I can get the screen uh, up for myself so I can see the members on the screen. Uh, members with questions, I'm going to acknowledge and welcome Liv to start us off. Go ahead, Liv, please. Hi, I want to thank uh, both of you for your very thorough uh, reports um, and very informative. And I know um, this has been a very, very challenging um, time uh, in terms of housing support. Uh, so I want to thank you for all of your um, good work. Um, I have one question for each of you. Um, for for Justin, um, my question is about maintaining um, physical distance in shelters. We're hearing anecdotally and, and from um, folks on the ground that that has been a challenge, um, including and especially for uh, people with access needs. So I'm wondering um, what you have been able to put in place to successfully maintain that six feet of distance that's uh, recommended. And I have a second question, um, which relates to the Housing Now uh, program. Um, and uh, we've been hearing um, some um, you know real excitement about the program and the potential, but also um, some concerns about um, whether we're building enough housing quickly enough and whether um, the housing that's being built um, is is going to be able to be dense enough to maximize the opportunity in this program. Um, so I I'd, I'm wondering if you can speak to that question of um, of density. Um, obviously, the more uh, units we build, the more accessible uh, and affordable units uh, we build. Um, so I'll 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 save that one for you, Valessa. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Liv. Uh, Jason, uh, Justin, did you want to kick this off with a response? Yes. Thank um, you. Yeah. Through the chair, uh, Councillor, um, and thank you for the question, Liv. It's a really good question. Um, as you know, when the when uh, a lot of the initial things came into play relative to this pandemic, we didn't know a whole lot of information, or or there wasn't a lot of things figured out on what to do. Um, but I can assure you that SSHA staff have worked tirelessly day and night um, to expand our system quite uh, substantially. We opened over 30 plus locations. To, to provide that physical distancing. Some other things that we've been doing is uh, looking at barriers, for, uh, per, I can never say it, permanent barriers uh, to allow for that physical distancing to happen in a good way. Um, so there's been a lot of work that we've done and I, I would say over 30 plus locations that we've looked at um, approximately 3,000 spaces for individuals for physical distancing and we continue to work with the housing Secretariat and everybody for that matter to be able to to identify if the need and an, another need in the future is required and we will look at it at that point in time but for now that's what we have done and we continue to look at it and assess the monitor. Great thank you it's so important thank you. Thank you and to you Valessa. Yes, uh, thank you for the question, Liv, and, and through the chair. Um, the Housing Now program, um, quite exciting program for us. We're, we're in two phases of um, been approved by council to date, so 17 sites. Um, the, the estimated unit yield, so that's the number of housing units to be created, um, is roughly 12,500 units, of which over 4,500 are intended to be um, affordable housing. And that's uh, through a range of affordability. So from deeply affordable homes all the way up to uh, 
rent, which is, it's currently about 40% average market rent, um, all the way up to about 100% average market rent. Um, and to your question specifically, uh, Liv, yes, uh, so the, the sites are, um, with the housing now, we're moving as quickly as we can, and I would say um, remarkably quick in terms of, of the complexity of some of these sites. Um, the, the sites are pre-zoned um, by the city, so our city, our colleagues in city planning um, work with Creatio, um, who is our, our, the city's real estate agency, um, plus city divisions, um, to really advance applications. Um, the first two, the first three sites actually have already gone through the planning process and that was done within six months. So we're moving as quickly as we can, understanding, um, you know, the, the critical need to provide um, more affordable housing across all areas of the city. Um, as part of that process, city staff um, look to uh, to see um, the maximum density um, while respecting current planning um, policies and, and existing secondary plans um, in a neighborhood context. Um, but um, I can assure you that as part of our, our due diligence on these sites and our work, um, it, we, we're absolutely looking to achieve um, as much housing as we can. Thank you. Thank you. I know it, it's moving quickly, which is great. I just, um, again, just um, encourage you to look at um, with the, your colleagues in city planning uh, principles of smart density. The, the, um, the higher we can build, um, the more we can build, and the more people we can get housed who, who desperately need it. Uh, so thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Liv, for your questions. Uh, any other members who wish to speak? I, I recognize Wendy and Jason. I'm just going to touch base with you. If you have any questions, please let me know. Okay. okay. Jason, Jason, just so you know, your microphone it was muted. So if you can. Any questions from you, Jason? Uh, no. Okay, thank, no, thank you. you. Thanks, Jason. Uh, Wendy, please go ahead. Hi there, thank you for the presentation. Um, the work that you're doing is so important and, and it must be very difficult right now. So thank you for all that you're doing to support people who are experiencing homelessness. Um, I wanted to ask a couple of questions. So one is that I did grab the old 2018 presentation on the accessibility audits that you provided to the committee in 2018. And at that time, it, the question, the finding was that through that accessibility audit, there were none of the shelters that were audited that met the eight criteria that you had determined to um, indicate accessibility overall. And so I just want to ask a little bit about some of the numbers that you have currently and how you've defined accessible. So you say that we are working towards having a standard of 20% of new shelters being accessible. Does that mean having accessibility features or does that mean accessible across the eight uh, general sort of areas that you described in the previous audit. And my second question related to that is why, why are we only looking at 20% accessibility for new shelters when we know that people with disabilities constitute a great number of people who require access to shelters? So those are my questions for Justin. I have uh, a couple questions for Valesa too, but I can hold those for a second. Okay, so I'll give you my questions for Valessa at the same time. So Valessa, my questions for you relate to the uh, Toronto Renovates program. So does the Toronto Renovates program only provide uh, support around renovations for seniors or does it include people with disabilities of the population that also, in fact, you don't have to be a senior to require those kinds of renovations. You can be somebody of, uh, of a younger age and you know really benefit from having those kinds of accessibility features um, for funding available to you. And it's a similar question in terms of uh, uh, the 20% designation. So Stats Canada said 22% of the population experiences a disability. We know that those numbers go up as people age. What is the what is the thinking around designating only 20% of the new bills as being? Those are my questions. So uh, through the chair, if that's okay, I can answer the first two questions. Uh, yes, please go ahead, Justin. 
Okay. Um, so uh, thank you, Wendy, for your questions. They're both great, great questions. And uh, with the audit and the uh, the the question was around the the eight requirements. And if we were just looking at more of a physical uh, perspective of the building, I guess the built environment, as opposed to the other parts of the those eight requirements. And I would say to you that our accessibility audits did include all eight requirements. Um, and we were looking at anything that could have to do with the AODA and the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act. So it wasn't, it's not just simply about um, the built environment, if that answers your question. And then just to respond to the 20%, we, we have the 20% as a, um, uh, a minimum requirement, but I can say to you that as we go through new build buildings um, and where it's possible, we would be looking to do probably do more than that. Um, but at this point in time, until you actually have a specific building and you're looking at a building, in some instances when you're looking at retrofits for buildings that already are in existence, especially if there's like heritage aspects and stuff like that, we have to look at what we can and can't do based on that building. But I can assure you that whatever we're doing and we're building new, we'll have that 20% or greater. Uh, thank you. Any other follow-up questions, Wendy? Um, yeah, I do have follow-up questions, and they're largely to do with the way that those numbers have been put together. So you have 45 but seconds. I, I would just, I know, I have no time, so no, no follow-up questions. It's no, okay. no, no, no. I would like to hear from Valetta. Okay, maybe you can uh, state that as a as a remark in your in your comments. Okay, thank you very much. Any anyone else with questions of staff on their presentation? Miranda, please go ahead. Yes, hi. Um, I'm just wondering, um, uh, first of all, thank you for the great presentation and the valuable information. It was um, very in depth in terms of the um, amount of information provided. A lot of great statements um, and comments in terms of the initiative. Um, I'm just wondering, um, as uh, Valisa was mentioning, other um, kind of plans um, that are also kind of um, maybe options uh, in the background. I'm just wondering if uh, some of those plans would include, or if you can even comment on some of those other plans, like would they entail things like um, community benefits projects that kind of um, revitalize um, different areas within the city, um, a co-op uh, type of housing, or what would some of those other options entail? Um, that could benefit communities um, in various ways, even with employment, for example, if it's a community benefits project. So I'm just wondering if you could uh, comment a little bit more on that, of other projects in mind. Uh, absolutely. Thank you, Miranda. And through the chair, um, as we develop housing across the city, directly on city land or, or through our partners um, at their sites, um, we, we definitely um, are looking to um, address wider uh, wider community needs um, for the housing now site specifically, which is which are the city owned sites. As part of that program, um, there is a community benefit requirement. So the it, the sites are offered through a, a public um, RFP process, request for proposal process, um, and uh, there are specific requ requirements and qualifications that are uh, that are uh, that are required under the, the proposals to be submitted. Um, so there is specifically a community benefits requirement, which entails uh, things like job opportunities, um, tra skills uh, training, um, and um, other um, opportunities to really help residents across the city, not only access housing, but also to um, to, to advance uh, their socioeconomic status as part of these uh, programs. So I hope that answers the question. Yes, that is great. Thank you very much. Um, for ourself, uh, for myself, I'm from a community employment center at Next Steps Employment Center, and we are actually working with one um, development project um, within our area. Um, and it is something that can benefit in all ways, as you were talking about employment initiatives that are along with that revitalizing program. 
Um, so we are most happy to help with other community benefits projects as well. So I just want to put that out there to you if you're looking for partners for these things. All right. Thank you. Miranda, thank you. Uh, are there any other members with questions? And I am not seeing any additional members to speak. Um, I'm going to move a motion. We're just have, heading into the speaking portion of our, our, of our meeting. Uh, and if the clerk can please put the motion onto the screen. And I want to thank the committee members uh, in advance for your participation in our earlier call to sort of go through the, the presentation material. Um, if the motion can be put onto the screen, there it is. Thank you. Sorry, folks. There's trying to understand the time lapse here. Uh, I'm just going to read it. City Council Direct the Executive Director, uh, Housing Secretariat, in collaboration with the General Manager, Shelter Support and Housing Administration, to bring forward a report in the first quarter of 2021 outlining an intersectional approach to support equity-seeking groups, including persons with disabilities uh, experiencing homelessness to access housing with appropriate uh, supports. Um, and uh, just to say a, a, a minute of comment, um, I want to thank staff for your presentation. I also want to acknowledge publicly uh, the incredible amount of work that you have both been doing and your de departments uh, on advancing this critical um, uh, matter in the City of Toronto. So not only are you trying to ensure that those who are experiencing homelessness have adequate indoor space, but that they're able to access those spaces with the appropriate supports in a physically distanced COVID world. Um, and, uh, and I know that that has not been easy. I recognize the, the incredible toll it has taken on the, the entire sector of individuals uh, who are providing uh, supports for those who are experiencing homelessness. Uh, and Valessa, I know that the city has supercharged uh, the, uh, the housing secretariat to do everything you can to build as much housing uh, in, in accessible form that's, a, that's affordable, that's safe, that allows people to have dignity uh, as rapidly as possible. And this is an exciting time for the city, although we are facing unprecedented challenges with respect to the housing crisis. Um, but I am very confident that if we keep our, our feet uh, on that uh, pedal, we will be able to accelerate and get to where we need to go. The, the one thing that keeps coming up in our conversations, and, uh, and I, I will invite members to speak uh, very shortly, is that people with living with disabilities is oftentimes feeling um, uninvolved with the decision making. And, and it has to be corrected. And the only way it can be corrected is if there's intentional purpose to make sure that everyone who is experiencing the exclusion gets brought into the conversation, especially when it comes to developing policies, uh, which is why we're asking that you work together uh, in, in a collaborative and, and, and coherent way to take a very broad look about who's not at the table. Uh, I appreciate, Valessa, you even cited the fact that um, you, you thanked me for, for trying to bring um, uh, 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 an effort to, to, to push universal design and, and, and to, to add additional housing units uh, to the, uh, the housing program. Um, but the, the approach would, would be better if, if actually it would be people with disabilities already embedded uh, into how the, the programs are to be designed. So therefore, it gets us to the outcome uh, with the intention of those with lived experience at the very beginning. So therefore, it's not an add-on or, or an intervention while the program has already been designed. Um, there's lots of room for that, and we really um, encourage you to, to continue to work with us, but also to think through what that intersectional approach should be, recognizing that people with disabilities cannot be captured under one header of disabilities. There is a whole myriad of subpopulations that we need to understand how we need to tailor and pivot our, our programs and services so that they can be adequately, um, uh, um, that their needs can be adequately met. Uh, and the same thing would, would have to be said about shelters uh, and the respite facilities. I know that there's a lot of work that's going in, but like everything else that we do, whether it's in personal life or professional life, there's always room for improvement. Uh, so I want to thank you both for your presentation and also to invite our members to, to speak. Uh, first member to speak on this item, who would like to go? Uh, Wendy, please go ahead, please. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say that I 
I wasn't entirely clear from the presentation on what the overall net gains were in terms of accessibility to the shelter stock for the city of Toronto. Uh, because at the time that in the 2018 presentation, it, it was none of the shelters that were audited met all eight of the points that you had determined yourself were uh, important in terms of accessibility of the shelters. And I, I'm still not entirely clear based on the presentation what the net gains were. Um, so maybe there's a way to, maybe we can connect offline and I can learn that a little bit more clearly. Um, but in terms of the new shelter spaces, I think the number needs to be higher than 20%. And I just kind of want to say that on the record. I think the number needs to be 50%, 80%. I think that we can see that the, the population of people with disabilities are impacted very much so by homelessness. And that when we stick to an idea of there being only 20% of people that have these needs, we continue to maintain a cycle of keeping those folks outside. I think you can see from your data, there are people with disabilities living outside. I'm suspecting it has something to do with the accessibility of the shelter spaces. Uh, but we maintain this constant cycle of thinking 20%, 20% of people are impacted here. A lot more people are out there and are impacted, and I think we can see that. And we are not planning for the future when we plan for only 20%. We are maintaining the status quo. So I would encourage uh, a higher number of those spaces to be designated as requiring uh, being accessible. In terms of affordable housing, so I'm the executive director at SILT at the Center for Independent Living in Toronto, and we maintain the, uh, the Attendant Service Application Center, which is a centralized point for which uh, people with physical disabilities can apply for supportive housing in the greater Toronto area. We see many, many people with physical disabilities applying for supportive housing that don't need the services that come with supportive housing simply because they need an affordable place to live that's accessible. We do not have options for people with disabilities who are looking for deeply affordable and accessible housing. And again, I just want to underscore 20% is not enough. It is a low number. We are seeing people with disabilities living at home with their parents well, well into the time at which they should have left home because there simply is nowhere in the city to live that's accessible. And I, I applaud the work that you're doing, but I, I, in my role of, you know, at SILT and as a person with a disability, I, m I must urge you to do more. We need higher numbers of accessible, affordable spaces. For you. Wendy, thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. <laughs> yes, sorry for the overlap. Thank you very much, Wendy. Uh, Liv to speak. I think um, Wendy has laid out the why very clearly. I just want to address one of the hows. I know I spoke to this in the questions. Um, I know uh, there are zoning issues. I just would really encourage you to work together with um, everyone in planning to take a critical lens um, at looking at density and to really explore. Um, I know there there's a, a, a newly built site in Parkdale that has six stories. Uh, and just behind it is a building from TCHC with 30 stories. Um, and, you know, I think it's really, really important to maximize what we can build in this window of opportunity that we have uh, right now. Um, so I, um, I thank you again for your work. And it is rapid moving, um, which is amazing to see. And um, I want to thank you both and all of your teams and, and really all of the frontline staff who are working, um, you know, putting their, their lives and health on the line and doing so much uh, right now. Um, so I'll leave you with a note of thanks. And thank you very much, Liv. If there are no more members to speak and I don't, oh, sorry, Glenn, I see your hand. Thank you very much. Glenn, go ahead, please. Thank you, first of all, both of you, uh, for amazing presentations on detail crammed densely into small space. Um, I do have a third thing to add, because to me, part uh, of accessibility, Glenn, especially sorry. people with... Uh, sorry, Glenn, it's Kristen. I just um, have to interrupt you. Sorry. I, I have to interrupt you for just a second. Uh, your audio is, uh, is a little bit choppy, so I'm not sure if there's a microphone that's on your lapel or perhaps on your, uh, on your computer. If you can just lean into it, and we'll try it again. Try turning the off. Okay. Sure. Is that better now? Uh, not so much. Um, there is a suggestion from Clerk that perhaps you take your visual off, and that might strengthen your audio. You want to try to turn off your camera? We do want to hear your comments. Okay. 
Okay, go ahead again. I, I think I think what we're seeing is a is a is perhaps a wide. Okay, um, what I was wrong. Go ahead. Go ahead. Let's try it one more time. If you can keep speaking, please. Yeah, it might be. Sure. Um, sure. Thank you. So what I wanted to bring up was mental health as disability, and for people with disability, safety is as important, or even perceived safety is as important as physical accessibility. And I think that that needs to be of consideration for many people who have experience of trauma and lack of safety in public shelter systems. Um, part of accessibility is making them accessible for people who don't feel safe in current housing situations, current um, shelter situations. So cameras and other security measures, I think, need to be well embedded into any of these um, new builds or the um, upgrades of current places as well. Great, thank you very much, Glenn. Just so you know, I think that by turning off your camera, your audio was clear, so thank you. The trick did work. Um, are there any other members <laughs> to speak? Yes. Seeing none, okay. Um, then I think we're ready to vote. If the motion, if I can get all the members onto the screen, uh, all those in favor of the motion before you, uh, indicate your support, please. Any opposed, that carries. And. Uh, and thank you very much, members, and also thank you uh, to staff for your presentations. We're going to just head back because we said we were going to revise that motion on item number three. Uh, sorry, item number two, I apologize. Uh, the clerk can put the motion back onto the screen, and this is with um, the additional recommendation coming from Michael McNeely. Once it's on the screen, I'll read it and we can proceed to a vote if there's no questions. And while the clerk is working through that, I did want to um, let the members know that the clerks are trying to advance circulate all the motions. You should have a copy of it from Megan Poole, my assistant, uh, but there have been perhaps some minor tweaks here or there, but the essence of the motions coming on the following items uh, will be uh, very much uh, already captured. So, item, so this new amendment from Michael uh, now reads, a communication plan, so this is an additional recommendation, that a communication plan that takes into consideration the needs of all members of the disability commu community, including deaf people and people with developmental disabilities. And hopefully that captures um, the sentiments that Michael brought forward, which I think were excellent. If I can get the screen back up so I can see our members, thank you, staff. Uh, there are no questions, and I don't think there are any. All those in favor of now the revised uh, motion? All, any opposed? That carries. And then I guess, do I need a, mi a motion as amended? No? Okay, so uh, thank you very much. And that will go to uh, Dr. Davila and her team at Toronto Public Health. Uh, you are all wonderful, very patient. We are heading into 12 o'clock, uh, which brings us to item number four. I know that this uh, item uh, will also have a speaker, um, and so what I would do is ask the staff to do their presentation, then I will invite the speaker to speak. Uh, we do have a scheduled break, members, at 12.30. I thought we were gonna push through lunch, but that is not going to be the case. So we're going to have a break at 12.30 uh, to allow uh, the staff here, as well as our, our wonderful um, uh, consultant on, on captions, uh, to allow them to have a break, and you, you as well. Uh, we will then reconvene at one o'clock. Okay, so. Item number four, COVID-19 response and accessibility, Parks Forestry Recreation Program. Uh, we are going to be hearing from Howie Dayton um, as, uh, and, Howie, and Sharon Butler. Um, they will introduce themselves very shortly. And as I mentioned, after the staff presentation, we'll go into the speaker, uh, allow the speaker to speak. And if there are any questions, if there's time permitted, uh, we could probably ask a few questions before we break into lunch. Uh, Howie, go ahead, please. Thank you, Councillor, and uh, hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here at the committee today. Uh, if we could get the presentation, I think uh, Clerks is going to be sharing it. It would be great. 
And just while that's being uh, posted, hopefully my audio is okay. Um, my name is Howie Dayton. I'm the Director of Community Recreation. I'll let Sharon introduce herself. Hi, good morning, everyone. Sharon Butler, I'm the Manager of Community Recreation. If we could get the next slide up, that would be great. Uh, so I'll just get us started and then I'm going to turn it over to Sharon and we'll uh, share the deck. Um, so uh, what we're going to uh, review with you today uh, is just uh, some of the program and modified services that Parks, Forestry and Recreation has uh, implemented over the last number of months, uh, particularly in response to COVID-19 and how we've had to adjust our service delivery and how those uh, modifications have supported persons with a disability. Next slide, please. This hot, hi. This stuff, uh, this particular slide is in reference uh, to the motion. So as Howie indicated, we'll provide an update on the modification made to the services this summer uh, to accommodate persons with a disability, as well as provide information on employment and accommodation practices throughout the process. Next slide, please. This slide just speaks to the summary of the modified services and the impact to participants this summer. Uh, just to note that we will go more in depth uh, for each of the program areas on the later slides. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to offer just a brief description in terms of our services, our camp services in the summer. So when we talk about adapted camps, adapted camps provide a specialized program for the highest need participants by offering a lower staff to participant ratio and higher level of care. For example, toileting, lifts, transfer, and feeding. When we speak to inclusive services, we allow participants, sorry, the inclusive services allow participants to integrate into general camp programs with support from staff or external support. So the modified adapted and inclusive services included in person through continual inclusive support for participants registered in Camp TO and have adapted and inclusive staff located at selected parks at, as part of the Parks Play TO in summer in the six. So on the previous slide, we had showed you these particular programs. So that's where the supports that we were able to provide. Additional supports available were adapted equipment available for inclusive services participants to Camp TO and consultant consultants with adapted and inclusive services were provided to support aquatic program clients. So in the summertime, as we had, for example, extensive lineups, we were supporting uh, people with a disability by providing some additional services. And again, we'll get more into that in the SWIMTO slide. The decision was made to pivot in-person adapted camps to virtual because we could not meet the province's summer camp guidelines without significant modification. So we provided virtual experience and the virtual experience included registered camp where participants were engaged in live activities led by staff and a non-registered option of act activities that could be done at home where available were available on the stay plan learn page specific modifications were made to inclusive services in order to meet the camp to operational guideline developed in consultation with the province in occupational health and safety Modifications included revised and lowered capacities, inclusion of COVID-19 guideline forms, use of visual aids and cues, and enhanced PPE measured for staff. Next slide, please. So this slide provides um, over the course of the summer, the following service levels were available to persons with a disability in our summer operation. As Camp TO operated at a reduced capacity, Adapted and inclusive services were also impacted with these decreased spaces available. The adapted and inclusive unit were able to meet the needs of 90% of the inclusive support and also provided a virtual option that met 100% of the needs. Over to you, Howie. Next slide, please. SWIMTO uh, was a quick start program that uh, sought to reopen our outdoor pools in the summer to ensure access to important heat relief, physical activity, 
and also to provide supervised beaches at our 11 uh, be uh, summer waterfront beach locations to ensure that the busy waterfront was safe for swimmers and boaters. We worked with Toronto Public Health and the Life Saving Society to modify the operation in response to COVID-19. And those modifications were fairly significant in terms of how aquatic operations were able to start up this past summer. In total, we had 113,360 hours of service, which were actually comparable to what has been offered in past years through the summer months. To support residents with accessibility needs, our aquatic facilities are accessible. For example, accessible change spaces, uh, our aquatic uh, tanks include ramps and or lifts. Some have warmer water tanks and jets for therapeutic and shallow water swims. All of those um, change spaces, so uh, support spaces, as well as in-water uh, support uh, were available at all of the outdoor pools that operated this summer. However, Sharon mentioned all, uh, all PFNR services were offered this year, this past summer, at quite reduced capacity for everybody, and that was no different for our aquatic operations. Uh, pools were off operating at 25% of bather load in accordance with the Life Saving Society guidelines. And to manage demand, uh, we often experienced outdoor lineups because health checks were required before anyone entered the pool. So to support residents in particular with mobility issues, we implemented uh, supports at, uh, at the pool locations um, for quick access um, where uh, they would basically be able to go front of line um, and to ensure that uh, persons with mobility issues is we're not experiencing issues with physical distancing and exposure to the sun. So the objective was to get folks into the pools as quickly as possible. And then once in the water, they uh, we certainly had access to the uh, supports I mentioned earlier. Um, this fall, SwimTO included the reopening of our indoor aquatic facilities, uh, primarily for the purpose of lane swims. Our instructional aquatic program was suspended this fall, so we actually weren't able to deliver that program. Um, but we are looking for ways to restart those programs as quickly as public health guidelines permit. Um, we continue to, uh, the Sharon's unit also uh, supports our aquatic operation where they're experiencing uh, operational um, modification advice needed. Uh, for better ways to accommodate persons with disabilities uh, through, for example, adopted equipment or other uh, systems we can put in place at pools to make them more accessible. Next slide, please. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the parks animation programs that Sharon referenced earlier. So new programming that Parks Forest Room Recreation developed this summer to support park-based play um, were uh, created really uh, to respond to the reduced capacity that was available in our Camp TO program. Parks Play TO and Summer in the Six were two programs designed to support families with young children and youth in 100 neighborhood parks through daily park activations over a six week period over the summer. Summer in the Six was implemented, in fact, with a partnership with Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment and was focused uh, on youth and vulnerable communities. Both provided free access to physical activity, environmental programming, sports, arts, story time, leadership, employment readiness, just to name a few. Ensuring the park locations were physically accessible was a key consideration in selecting park locations amongst a number of criteria that staff used. Program design considerations also considered program adoptability for persons with special needs. And finally, specific supports were provided to participants who required it by deploying adopted and inclusive staff to a number of park locations that were being attended by participants with identified needs. We are conducting a review of the effectiveness of these programs to inform planning for summer 2021. Next slide, please. In terms of employment, community recreation itself employs approximately 6,000 part-time staff annually who work as camp leaders, lifeguards, instructors, uh, etc. 
Um, the Count Yourself In survey is a corporate initiative that's led through our People in Equity Division. Um, and what I can tell you is that 7.9% of full-time staff in Parks, Forestry, and Recreation do identify as having a disability. Unfortunately, I don't have the stats today on the part-time staff complement, but this is data that we are trying to extract from that survey specifically. That said, and knowing that full-time staff in community recreation often come from our part-time staff workforce, the division continues to find strategies to support candidates through the hiring process to require accommodation, including accessible assessment spaces, question scripts, um, as well as training and employment supports that are considered ready to employment initiatives um, so that persons with disability um, can have a greater chance of success when moving through our part-time and then full-time hiring processes. I would also just say that Parks, Forestry and Recreation work closely with people in equity to ensure that hiring practices and policies create a value proposition for persons identify as having a disability to work in the public service and to ensure Parks, Forestry and Recreation represents a pathway to public service through its various leadership, volunteer and employment opportunities. Next slide, please. And this will be the last slide. And finally, we continue to develop plans for seasonal instructional programming. Um, what we deliver, I have to say, is very much informed by the provincial orders and medical officer of health advice. And that's been a constantly shifting uh, piece, as you can well appreciate. This slide provides a summary of the work and key dates related to the current fall program season, which had started on October 5th. Uh, but after a week into the program, we ended up needing to suspend uh, a good uh, chunk of what we had been offering based on uh, the rising case count. Um, that said, we are working on a number of winter activation and holiday programming ideas, um, which will have greater focus on outdoor winter opportunities. For example, uh, the focus right now certainly is on um, how to safely restart our artificial ice rink program, which we know many uh, residents with disabilities do enjoy, and we will continue to provide supports for. We're also keeping our virtual programming going, um, this picture certainly depicts uh, one of our staff who is delivering some of that virtual programming this summer. And we are working with the Parks, Forestry and Recreation Disability Steering Committee on some of the seasonal programming ideas and how they could be best adopted to support persons with special needs. And that concludes our presentation. We're happy to say questions and comments. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Howard, and to you and Sharon for your good presentation. Uh, there will most likely be some questions of you, uh, but before we come back to that, uh, we are go I'm going to uh, ask the clerk to confirm that our speaker, registered speaker, is ready to proceed with his comments. Adam Roy Cohoon. He's on the line. Okay, so I'm getting indications that, Adam, you're ready to go, so please go ahead, and you will have five minutes. Hello, thank you. My question and already there um, was a, um, a press release that came out um, from the city of Toronto saying that some of the parks were going to open their accessible washroom this winter. My my question and I know I know that it's already there are a few balls in the air. Um, but my question is regarding um, uh, 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 finding out more on and supporting the, the plowing and snow clearing of trails and parks this winter. I know, and I um, am asking this committee to support that because I do believe that there is going to be more use of the parks. And I know, I know that you can't probably do every trail after every snowstorm, but I do encourage that you at least try your best to do snow clearing for the weekend. The saddest thing for me is, on that first warm day of spring, 
finding that even other people are able to get through the little skinny warm trail in a park that they've made by their own traffic. But I am unable to get in the park because so much snow is piled up that the accessible trails are not actually able to get by. And even then, I have to stay away from those trails for a few extra weeks because because of um um dog excrement because most people of the trails were clear when not will will clean up after their dog but if their dog poops in the snow they just seem to leave it even when they definitely know that their dog pooped in the middle of a trail so um that is my that is my main question the second of all is um finding out i i do hear that there is a part for the accessibility steering committee but find out where where do i call if there are accessibility issues i i find in my parks that i have concerned with luckily i live at Corktown common park so I can usually find an actual um city of Toronto staff there so I can point out some of my issues. But is there um a certain accessibility office or an accessibility manager um that I could communicate with? And that's the end of my um deputation. Adam, thank you very much for your for your remarks, and I want to just uh, to point out that uh, uh, speakers of the public uh, do not get to ask questions of the committee members or of staff. Uh, but I suspect that your your question is of of importance, and it will most likely be answered uh, by staff by way of one of the members carrying your mission, uh, your question forward. Uh, so, but I do want to uh, acknowledge that your your remarks and observations are very important, and I want to thank you for being with us on this item. Uh, I'm going to turn the uh, the the floor over to the committee. Uh, are there members of, of the committee who have questions of the staff presentation at this point in time? Uh, Liv, go ahead, please. A quick one. I think um, Adam Cahoon's question is is well taken, and I do hope it will be addressed in some form. Um, I want to. Um, let you uh, know that uh, we heard great things um, from families we support about the Parks uh, Play TO program and its accessibility. So I want to commend you and, and your teams um, on on that project. Uh, what where we had um, uh, feedback that um, was around challenges and difficulties was around just navigating what's open, what's available, and what's accessible. And I'm wondering if you can speak to what efforts um, you have made or, or can make um, to make that information more available and more clear uh, during COVID. Thank you for the question. Uh, I'd be happy to take it, and, and I think that's work. Uh, you know, we're going to continue to do. We we have we have um, some landing spots on PFNR's website with respect to uh, accessible programs and options for families who have children in particular with special needs, and how they can access those services. But but I think the points taken that part of our challenge uh, over the first few months of uh, the pandemic was in terms of providing um, you know, updated information related to what was open, what was closed, um, as it relates specifically to persons with special needs. So I think that's great feedback. I've heard it in a few areas that we'll continue to work to refine. Um, and we also, when we reopened our community centers, made sure that we provided staff um, in our facilities uh, with information about services that were available. So we'll continue to refine those messages and make it as clear as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for the question and for the for the reply. Uh, any other members with questions to staff? Okay. 
uh, seeing none. Uh, Howard, uh, sorry, Howie uh, and Sharon. Uh, just with respect to, I think, a very critical question that was raised by Adam, it's also something that I have cited with staff in previous uh, conversations through uh, various committees. Um, coming back to the point about making sure that the facilities, um, whether it's recreational trails or perhaps pathways in park, uh, walkways in, in green open public spaces that they are accessible uh, at all times, including during the winter around maintenance. Um, and I know that this is happening in real time because uh, we just saw a press release come out from the City of Toronto about uh, expanding the opening of bathrooms uh, in parks, uh, literally doubling them. Uh, can you just speak publicly about ensuring that the pathways and walkways will also be accessible so there's no point in opening washrooms if people can't physically get to them? Uh, and uh, can you give us some assurances that that will happen? I'd be happy to respond to it, Councillor, and uh, report to go to IME or, or motion was brought forward to last IME, so I believe it is going to Council on additional pathway maintenance this winter. Um, and I know that part of the winter activation plan um, that we are moving forward uh, is expanding uh, pathway clearing uh, in parks over the course of the winter. Um, I can't speak to that, that all of them will be done. You know, it's an expanded number of them and certainly can take back to our park uh, group in terms of the uh, priority around uh, those pathways that are accessible with spring maintenance. Um, and I think Corktown Common was a park specifically referenced, so we can take a look at that one uh, for uh, Mr. Cahoon. Um, but, um, you know, I know this is going to be a report back and expanded service level that we are trying to achieve, in particular noting that people will be wanting to access the uh, parks in greater numbers over the, over the course of the winter. Uh, thank you. And is there a standard uh, to the, the the clearing of the pathways? I know that there's a standard to when uh, the snow clearing, um, snow removal vehicles are sent out to clear the roads. Uh, is there that same standard or an, a comparable standard that's applied to pathways? So therefore, it's not just cleared once, um, but an ongoing maintenance. Uh, even as uh, the, the snow will melt and sometimes it will refreeze and there are patches along pathways that are uneven and, and the pooling of ice will then uh, form. Uh, can we get some indication of whether or not there's a standard? Councillor, I'll, I'll, I'll have to get back to you on that, 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 that the parks operation stance, so I don't feel comfortable speaking to it because I'm not sure what, what it is offhand. So if, if it will be okay for me to share some information back with the presenter, that can be then shared with the committee. Yes, thank you. Uh, next member to question is Liv. I just have one more question slash comment. Um, uh, the um, inclusive and adaptive rec at the City of Toronto uh, position held by Lorraine uh, Bodium, who I believe retired, has been vacant for, for some time now. And I'm just wondering what the plans are. I'm not sure if there's a restructuring or what the plans are to, to fill that. But I think that lens is really important, um, especially during this time of, of so much change and, and having to pivot so much. Yeah, I'll, I'll respond to that. Uh, yeah, it has been uh, vacant for some time. We did um, have the positions filled through our, uh, temporarily, the portfolio is being managed through the supervisor of Adapted and Inclusive Program. Um, so we have had somebody that has um, had leadership for um, working with our uh, advisory committee, as well as um, providing the, this, as you say, very important lens that we've needed to in our program development. That said, we've just started to move through the um, hiring process uh, to replace that position on a permanent basis. So we would expect to be able to post that position and uh, hopefully have it filled in the coming uh, couple of months. Thank you, that's terrific news. Thank you to you both. Are there any other members with questions? Seeing none, then we'll just move into the portion uh, where we provide some remarks. 
Um, I'd like to start by placing a motion before you. Uh, this motion would have been circulated in advance, and thank you to the committee members for your contributions in the forming of the motion. I'm just going to read it quickly. I realize there's about six minutes before 1230. Uh, City Council requests the Medical Officer of Health to review Toronto Public Health guidelines regarding access to public washrooms and to review with the GM of Parks, Forestry, Recreation, and Corporate Real Estate Management to support safely reopening washrooms in all communities community centers and parks. City Council direct the General Manager of PFR in collaboration with the Chief Communications Officer to update the City of Toronto website to include all city recreation programs operating through COVID-19, the pandemic, indicating which the programs are accessible and communicate changes through all appropriate city channels and report back to the TAC in the first quarter of 2021. Um, and uh, I'll just add that the issue around access to washrooms and ensuring that recreation facilities and all public facilities uh, are are open and accessible is more important than ever before. Uh, we've seen that the um, the ad hoc network of bathroom facilities that are oftentimes uh, created through the network of co coffee shops and, and cafes, as informal as it is, uh, it has provided some uh, human relief areas for, pe for people who need to have a body break. Um, and of course, that's important for parents who are who are changing the diapers of young children and and, and even for for elderly individuals and whoever else needs to, to go um, the challenge for us this during the pandemic and we've seen this magnify throughout the city uh, is that uh, if we're asking people to to um, to make some sacrifices uh, and if they do have to leave their house and and uh, and this is something that is not an option for them whether it's because they're providing essential care or they're doing essential work we need to sort through and 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 open those bathroom facilities in public buildings as widely as possible. I recognize that it's not just a matter for PFR, but it's something that PFR has um, a great number of facilities uh, that are washroom facilities, shower facilities that need to be open. And I, I can't stress this more than, than before, um, but I do recognize that there is some tension between the public health protocols and the recommendations from and the guidelines from public health and the available access and 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 open door um, uh, access to these facilities and I know that there has been some challenges on on how to reconcile the two, um, but uh, I'm hopeful that uh, that PFR uh, perhaps you can take the lead in making sure that uh, that the community at large has access. And I, and I just want to thank you for, for all the work that you and your staff have been doing. Uh, every time there's an announcement from the, from the mayor or perhaps the premier or the prime minister, we know that you and your staff have got to, once again, change your program. And there is a massive operational ripple effect that we don't necessarily see, but I know that you're managing it uh, and trying to deliver it in seamless ways. So please do not take anything from what I'm saying that that is not, um, not it, that is not um, uh, a glowing remark on 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 your support and work. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, I just want to open the uh, the floor to members. Uh, we probably have enough time for one uh, one speaker before we go into a break for lunch, and then we'll come back to conclude the item. Um, Michael, go ahead. Uh, we'll, we'll have go ahead, please. Hi, um, just speaking as a deafblind individual, I'm just wondering if you can make a concerted effort to hire um, interveners who are specialized in helping those who are deafblind navigate the parks and access the camps. That's just my remark. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, that brings us to almost the top of 12.30. Uh, we could try to vote on this quickly if there's no other speakers. I'll just call query quickly. Are there any other speakers on this item? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion before you, if you can just indicate your support. Uh, any opposed? Uh, that carries. Oh, we got that done. Good job, everyone. I am very impressed with all of you. Uh, we want to say thank you uh, to the staff who, prevent, who have prevented who have presented so far, but also to those who've been waiting for their presentations. Uh, we are going to break for half an hour and come back at one o'clock uh, at the end of lunch, and we'll be hearing from you very shortly, starting with item number five, equity response of budgeting at the City of Toronto. Thank you very much, everyone.
Wonderful, thank you. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Uh, we are heading back into the agenda. Item number five, um, equity responsive budgeting at the City of Toronto. Uh, this item was held for both speakers as well as staff presentation. Today we'll be receiving a presentation from Sarah Blackstock, uh, Manager of Social Policy, Social Development, Finance and Administration, uh, and uh, be and after we hear from Sarah, we're also going to then hear from our registered speaker, uh, Robert Stambula from the Harbour Village Residents Association. Uh, I want to hand the floor over to Sarah at this point. When you're ready, go ahead. Thank you, Councilor Wong Tam. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, okay. I can. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarah Blackstock. I work in the Social Development Finance and Administration Division at the City, and we have the pleasure of leading the work on equity responsive budgeting. Um, to the clerk, um, I'm trying to share my screen, but the slide is not moving. Are you able to take over? Yes, we will take over. Oh, oh no, yeah, now it's moving. I Is think it I got okay? It. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Sorry about that, folks. So, um, Today, what I'm going to try and do is provide a brief overview of equity responsive budgeting, the city's approach to it, and answer any questions that you may have. And so to do that, I'm going to quickly run through the origins of equity responsive budgeting at the city and provide a bit of an overview of the City of Toronto's budget process because that's the context that you need to understand equity responsive budgeting. And then I will get into the meat of how the city approaches equity responsive budgeting. And I'll wrap up by giving you a sense of what's on the horizon and take any questions you may have. So let's start with the most obvious question. Why is the city enhancing its budget process with equity responsive budgeting? Well, we're engaged in equity responsive budgeting because protecting and advancing equity is a priority for Toronto residents and therefore city council. Because we're a diverse city in which the needs and lived experiences of residents are different and we need to make sure those diverse needs are equitably considered and met. And equity is a priority because we are a city with inequities and injustices that we seek to address. Part of the way we seek to advance equity are with specific strategies, such as the Toronto Action Plan to confront anti-Black racism. And another way we seek to advance equity is to build the city's equity infrastructure. And that is where equity responsive budgeting fits in as part of that equity infrastructure. So the bottom line is that the foundation of equity responsive budgeting at the city is a commitment to equity. And that commitment to equity is reflected in council's direction and decision to implement equity responsive budgeting. So I mentioned that I was going to get into the budget process just for a minute because I think this is important context for you. Um, there are six steps I want to identify. And this is just really to give you um, a sense of the context in which we are engaging in equity responsive budgeting. So the first step that happens in the city's budget process is that the financial planning division provides guidelines and instructions to the heads of the city's divisions, agencies, and corporations regarding how they are to prepare their annual budgets. This year, given the uncertainty of the financial and service impacts of COVID-19, instructions were given to programs and agencies to build both their operating and capital budgets with two guiding principles. One, addressing the financial challenges, and two, prioritizing initiatives that will support the restart and recovery efforts. That takes us to step number two. So based on that direction provided by the Financial Planning Division, city staff draft budget submissions, budget proposals. One of the key components of developing the budget 
is the identification of potential reductions, cuts, as well as investments. Depending on what the budget direction is, there may be reductions identified or there may not be. Usually, there are small reductions in the form of efficiencies that are identified, and there are also always investments that are identified that are required to maintain a service level and or fulfill council direction. So, for example, if council has directed that additional youth lounges or youth hubs be established, the necessary budget proposal needs to be developed. As part of the development of the budget proposal for these reductions and investments, staff are required to analyze the equity impacts. Then those budget proposals go through an extensive review and approval process that results in a staff recommended budget. And that's actually where things get exciting. That gets us to step number three, which is the launch of the, um, the launch of the budget. The budget's made public and the fund begins. Uh, in November, the rate supported programs, the budget for the rate supported programs was launched. And the rate supported programs are water, solid waste, and the Toronto Parking Authority. And in January of 21, the budget budgets for the tax supported programs will be launched. I should just remind folks that the city has a separate operating and capital budget. And at this time, equity responsive budgeting only applies to the operating side of the budget. Step number four, uh, the budget committee meets and starts its work, including hearing deputations. And this is also the time that many councillors and community organizations organize budget forums for residents to weigh in on their thoughts and priorities for the city's budget. That takes us to step number five. So with the benefit of all of that engagement and debate, the budget committee recommends a budget to executive committee, and then a executive committee recommends a budget to city council, and that takes us to step number six, where council debates, amends, and passes a final budget. So that's the budget process in a nutshell. Let's talk about equity now. The city has been engaging in equity responsive budgeting for the last five years. At its simplest, equity responsive budgeting is a tool that embeds an equity analysis into the budget process, both the development stage of the budget and the decision making stage. Currently, our equity responsive budgeting work is focused on analyzing the impacts of the changes in the operating budget. And when I say changes, what I'm referring to are those reductions and investments that I mentioned a few minutes ago. At this time, we do not um, focus the equity ana analysis on the budget as a whole. We think that this focus on budget changes, that's the reductions and investments, is an appropriate approach at this time because it's the changes in a budget that are most indicative of a government's priorities, priorities and the direction in which it's moving. That said, there is other analysis of the city budget that illustrates the percentage of the budget that goes to key service areas. For example, there is an analysis that's made available through the, pu the public budget documents that illustrates the percentage that of the budget that goes to community and social services, police transit, et cetera. And that high level analysis is also very important because it provides information that's relevant to the equity considerations of the budget because we know some programs and services are more relevant to black, indigenous and equity seeking groups than others. There are essentially two components to the city's equity responsive budgeting work analysis and reporting. So the first component is an analysis of how proposed changes, that's the cuts and the investments, decrease, maintain, or increase inequities. And the second piece is reporting the outcomes of that analysis throughout the budget process, including the development stage, the public deliberations, 
and the decision-making stages. To do the equity impact analysis, city staff apply the city's online equity lens tool to the budget proposals that I mentioned a few minutes ago. That analysis is then incorporated into the budget documents. The equity lens tool is guided by three questions. One, does the proposal impact Indigenous, Black, and or equity-seeking groups? How does the proposal impact the barriers faced by these groups? And thirdly, what is the impact? What is the level of, uh, sorry, what is, what is the level of impact on equity, if any? I'm not gonna go into the detail of the equity lens here, uh, just for the sake of time, but there is more detail in the deck that's been provided to you. I'll just quickly note that the tool that we use does identify the Black, Indigenous, and equity-seeking groups that are the city's focus. And this does include persons with disabilities. It also identifies key barriers to equity, and it measures the level of equity impact. The equity impact analysis that is presented in the budget documents is not, however, solely generated by staff. The city also relies on the expertise of an external review panel. The role of the panel has evolved over the course of um, our work, but essentially it does two things. It validates the staff analysis and it highlights the equity considerations it deems most significant. For the review panel, we bring together a small, diverse group of subject matter experts, including people with lived experience of inequity and discrimination. We present the key budget changes to the panel, and then we summarize the panel's findings in a publicly available budget briefing note that is used to inform residents and council council's budget deliberations. So as I noted earlier, equity responsive budgeting is about supporting informed decision-making. It's about supporting senior staff's decisions, sorry, it's, it's about supporting senior staff's decision-making while the budget is being developed. It provides them with an opportunity to identify mitigation strategies and or alternatives to budget proposals with negative equity impacts. And it also provides an opportunity to identify proposals that have the greatest impact on the city's equity priorities and have that inform their decisions. And it's about supporting councils, sorry, about supporting council and residents by making the equity impact analysis part of the public budget documents. In conclusion, the city is com very committed to equity responsive budgeting as a key component of the city's equity infrastructure. As equity responsive budgeting moves forward and the city modernizes its budget processes, we will be further embedding equity responsive budgeting into the budget process and also exploring how equity, equity responsive budgeting can be embedded into the analysis and development of the capital budget capital budget. So as you can see, we are still at the beginning of this journey. It's an exciting and evolving one. And we are grateful for the opportunity to present to you and to benefit from the questions and insights that the committee may offer us. Thank you. And Sarah, thank you for your presentation. I will just ask the clerk and put the the screen back up for me so I can see the, the images of our committee members. Uh, are there any, oh actually no, before we go to questions, I apologize. We do have a, a speaker who has been registered and please forgive me, Robert Stambula, Harbor Village Residents Association. Uh, are you uh, ready to proceed? Yes, uh, go ahead, sir, you have five minutes. Yes, yes I am. Good afternoon, committee. Um, bless you for championing the issues that you do. Um, I'm here from Harvard Village Residents Association. We've made common cause with you and your work and, and, and to the chair not so long ago on the pedestrian clearway. 
we were hand in hand with you working on that. And I, I'm here on, on a related issue, both touching on the budget, but also giving a real life example that for lack of want or attention or political will, and I think it's the last one, uh, an important equity issue from our neighborhood has been left aside and almost whatever reason can be manufactured not to move on it is not is 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 sought and that's to deal with uh, a next step of, of pedestrian clearway is snow clearing in residential streets in the downtown about a thousand of seven thousand kilometers of s sidewalks are still not clear in the downtown uh, in toronto that's the downtown neighborhoods and we are a no-go zone you can't come in and you can't come out after a material snowfall either a visitor with a, a disability or an elderly person coming or going you can't go to shop you can't go to work you can't connect to the public transit um and i won't give all the all the issues around that but i i'm using it as also as a model to connect uh with the equity response of budgeting and I, and I, and I thank the the presenter for um, filling in some, some material uh, for me because I only got connected with with this as a process not very long ago um, this this year in fact and one uh, and if I can one of the things that seems to be missing in the process is uh, in analysis and in moving budgets forward is how do you deal with omissions the analysis and the study are on changes on pluses and minuses. But what if something's just missing? What if something is not 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 made that threshold um, yet is yet has merit? Um, in in the in the example that we've pursued and we've been writing to committees, deputing to committees, writing to the mayor. The height of all of this occurred last year when there was a public outcry following a snowstorm, and the mayor uh, actually wrote to transportation services asking we need a cost benefit analysis of harmonizing sidewalks uh, a clearing and he's yet to get that there was a temporary report that came out last year they said we'll do a pilot in the downtown the pilot wasn't even as large as the the consultants recommended um and now the pilot's being extended to this year because they didn't have enough experience last year it, it forgive me but it could be part of the problem that this is in the hands of, of of transportation services good public servants all of them i'm a retired public servant um so i i value i value their work um but um delay it comes at a cost this is not a new issue this issue is well known the issue uh and and you can bring life to it because there are parts of the downtown in east york that are no different than the rest of the downtown neighborhoods that does get service quirk of history i'm not sure what the origin of that is but um uh the, the litany of one of the reasons of not doing this one of them is we can't afford it i think we can't afford not but we are here in a neighborhood and you're going to hear about bike lanes later on we support bike lanes in college on harvard on bloor and every new bike lane needs to be cleared that's fair and it's right but people in the downtown neighborhoods at large and and people who are vulnerable people uh, elderly people with disabilities people with children in wheelchairs these are people calling out from our neighborhoods saying what do we do we've been waited we, we've waited and waited and uh, I, I'm, I, I'm 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 trying to use every tool we have available to bring uh, uh find partnerships and try to bring the attention to council it would be wonderful if if, if this committee would consider bringing some highlight within the equity budgeting that you have before you or for sarah to connect with her and her people to say how do we get this on the dance floor because the 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 discourse on this is um to manufacture excuses and i'm probably running out of time i didn't have my 30 clock seconds going, <laughs> um and uh, I, i'll uh, there's so much i'll say that i'm happy to answer your questions I probably could use more than your time than uh, than you can afford to give. Uh, so I'll I'll pause at that point. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much for your remarks, uh, and uh, I appreciate you taking some time to appear and share with us your thoughts. Um, are there any questions of the speaker or questions of the staff? 
um, Wendy. And, and, who, and who is your question directed to, if I may ask? Oh, sorry, question is for the staff. Okay, um, question to staff, go ahead. Uh, I wanted to say thank you. Thank you to both of the speakers, in fact. Uh, very interesting points that were raised. Um, Sarah, my question is about the equity tool that's used by staff to measure the impact, the equity impact, which then goes on, as we've seen through your presentation, to impact the budget and decisions that are made. It looked to me like there was a screenshot at the side of your um, one of your slides uh, of the tool and some questions that people are asked to answer. And uh, what I'm really interested in understanding is are what are the questions that are related to people with disabilities in the context of that tool? Is is the tool itself pre-populated? So is is there a series of kind of drop down menus where people are selecting what has been predetermined as being equity issues or not? Um, and how does that tool get, how do those things get developed? So, and it, and it speaks a little bit to Robert's question, I think, in terms of uh, what are, how does the framework of what is possibly a barrier get built and how much influence do people with disabilities themselves have on what shows up there in terms of measuring that, that um, equity impact? Please let me know if my question is not clear though. Through the chair, thank you for the question. Uh, your question is clear. It's a really important question. Um, the tool is online and it does take the uh, user through a series of questions. It does focus on barriers that are most relevant to um, city services. The tool does include basic information about some of the key barriers that the different equity seeking groups face. So there's a bit of a background on some of the key issues and some of the you know, sort of population level data. It encourages, staff are encouraged to use that equity lens tool when at all stages in the development of a program or policy, right from the consultation stage. It is a relatively, it's an evolving tool. Um, it might be a tool that um, the committee might be interested in learning more about in a separate presentation. Um, as the city develops its equity infrastructure, that tool is also being further developed and refined. And one of the key priorities, in fact, in 21 is actually making the, um, some of the supporting materials more robust to better re reflect the realities of the lived experiences of Black, Indigenous, and equity-seeking people, and um, better reflect um, the result of consultations with those groups. Thank you. Uh, that I do think that we would benefit from having more information about that tool, and I'll speak to that in my comment. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Wendy. Uh, next up to for questions, I recognize, I see um, Liv, then Michael McNeely, and, and is there anyone else? Please just let me know, indicate. I think that brings us to the end. Okay, so Liv, you go next, and then following Liv, Michael. Thank you. I have two sets of questions, one related to um, what Robert Stambula has uh, brought to us, and one um, for I guess, Sarah Blackstock, our staff. Yeah. Um, in light of uh, both what Robert has shared and what Adam Cahoon has deputated uh, already about um, the lack of snow clearing and barriers, I'm wondering if the, either the earlier um, amendment or a new amendment to the city clerk, if we can um, uh, make an amendment um, around our support for um, extending uh, snow clearing. Um, so I, I put that out there. Um, while we mull that over and, and perhaps craft a motion, um, I want to thank uh, Sarah uh, for uh, her presentation. Um, it's uh, exciting and ambitious, and I'm, I'm really pleased to see um, the direction it's going. I want to ask about two things. Um, one, uh, when we had a presentation from the folks who were running the Data for Equity program, and um, uh, they discussed with us how um, a disability lens was uh, going to be 
uh, and data collection was going to be used and piloted in two pilots over, I think, three years. It was a very long and drawn out process. Um, and my concern is around um, the budget process, which is coming up much sooner um, and not having um, the data that you need. Um, I'm wondering um, what the planning is to um, get the information that you need um, to bring a disability lens to um, the project that you're working on. Through the chair, thanks for the question, Liv. Um, we have lots of information about the barriers that people with disabilities face. Um, and there is data that's collected across the corporation that can help us now. The data for equity strategy that you heard about is um, about collecting a full and more robust set of data and making it you, you, um, supporting its more systemic use of it. So it's another sort of key component of that data or that equity infrastructure that I was referring to. It's a sorry. Sorry, Sarah. That was that okay. was that was Chris on um, the hot mic. I'm going to turn it off. Pa apologize for that. Um, so we actually do have a lot of information uh, that is available to us that we can be using now uh, based on consultation, based on the population level data that we get from Census Canada, and because programs across the corporation are collecting some data and doing evaluation. So there are tools that are available, but we know we need more, we know we need better, and we know we need consistency across the corporation and that's what the data for equity strategy that you're referring to is going to equip the city to do thank you i would encourage you to work with those colleagues to see if it's possible to expedite um, some of those those pilots or extend them or broaden them in some way because the presentation we heard um had you know i get also was um exciting um but was very um, sort of far into the future by the time those data sets would be available for use in decision making and planning. Um, so uh, I'm glad to see it happening. I think we really enjoyed that presentation and your presentation. It's a great direction for the city, um, but we'd, we'd love to see some of that data available to you and your team sooner. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Liv. Uh, just moving along, uh, Michael McNeely. Hi, Sarah. Um, thank you for your presentation. I just wonder if you could respond in more detail to Robert's um, deputation today. Could you advise him and us what we can do for next steps regarding the snow removal of his neighborhood? Thank you. Through the chair, uh, thank you, Michael, for the question. As um, Robert alluded to, the equity response budgeting process at this point does not address omissions. The budget process um, that the city uses is one in which the budget is, is developed based on existing uh, priorities set by council. He, he referred to, he sort of asked the question, how do you get something on the dance floor? And the budgeting process that we're using uh, is only focused on what's on the dance floor. The way to get something on the dance floor is to engage in um, the deputation process, meeting with counselors, and getting the council direction that's required to get something on the dance floor and into the budget. I will add, however, um, sort of to Liv's point that city staff are encouraged to use an equity lens tool. So when there are decisions being made about whether it's new washrooms and parks or uh, housing, as you heard about today, or snow clearing, we are encouraged to use an equity lens tool that does ask us to think about the impacts on people with disabilities. So there is that analysis that staff are encouraged to do as well and provide to decision makers, both on the staff side and on the political side.
Michael, do you have a follow-up question? Seeing Madam, none. Madam, Chair, as a, Madam Chair, as a point of information that touches on the last two questions. Uh, unfortunately, there, there uh, Robert, it, it, it doesn't quite work that way, but I also recognize that the, the questions weren't the, the question didn't directly come to you, but it was it, it did touch upon your presentation. So I'm just going to deviate from the order and, and allow you to speak to it. So please go ahead, Robert. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just be a, I'll just be a moment because it's right on point. Um, uh, there is a, a motion uh, being addressed at council next week, which was from Mr. Mr. Matlow, uh, seconded by Mr. Layton, that went to the um, Infrastructure and Environment Committee. It was a three part motion to deal with clearing the downtown sidewalks, uh, clearing pathways and parks, and improving the clearing of bike lanes. So those are three, well, two of the three elements have been talked about uh, uh, today, and uh, 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 the council is hearing them on a failed vote, a tied vote. It was failed because it tied at the, the, at the committee. So if there's an opportunity for the committee to review those, the, that, that motion, which is really to plan to do it, it's not even to do it, uh, clear side, uh, clear the sidewalks and bike lanes and, and park paths. Uh, I think that might be a direction the committee seems to be supportive of, and there is an opportunity next week to have their views shared. So, and thank you, Madam Chair, for the extra time. Uh, thank you very much, right. Robert. Uh, I just want to speak to this item very quickly, just because it's not directly before us. And this is the item that uh, that both Liv has mentioned in her remarks, as well as now Robert spoken to directly. Uh, it's coming from the Infrastructure and the Environment Committee, clearing the path towards a safe and accessible winter. Uh, Robert, um, I recognize that you also spoke at the committee, uh, so I, I recognize that you're on the record there publicly. Um, just for the members, uh, because that item did not come to our committee, and obviously we have have great interests on that matter. Um, I, as the chair of this committee, can also provide communication, a formal uh, letter of support on your behalf. I will do that. Uh, so therefore, it travels with that item to City Council. Uh, and if there's a chance for me to bring that item to you uh, before it actually gets fully funded and implemented, I'd like to do that as well. Uh, so that will hopefully allow us to make sure our voices are hit, heard, um, even though it didn't come before our committee at that point in time. Um, coming back to the equity responsive budgeting item, and I know that they are entirely related, um, is there any other member who has a question? Are there any other members? Seeing none, then I will just... I just, I just want to make a comment that oh I hope Robert is on the dance floor now. So I hope he enjoys the dance. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. Uh, then moving into remarks, uh, members, uh, I do have a motion that I'm prepared to place on the screen. Uh, this motion was largely crafted with uh, much of your support, but also I want to thank the staff uh, who actually further refined it. If the clerk can please put that onto the screen, and I'll just start to read it. City Council direct the Executive Director, Social Development Finance and Administration, in collaboration with Chief People with the Chief People Officer to provide a report identifying how the city's equity responsive budgeting initiative will align with the city's data for equity strategy and support the use of social demographic data in the development of the operating budget in the fourth quarter of 2021. Um, recognizing that the that the full body of work has not been completed. And by even Sarah's um, remarks and presentation, very fine presentation, uh, she cited that this is just the beginning of, of her work. Um, and, uh, and the work is actually very broad and it's very comprehensive. And what I'm very proud of is that this work is, is really getting to the, to the structural inequalities of how we align budgetary allocations and our city's values. Um, and, uh, and oftentimes we have been brought in at the very end of the process, uh, especially for those um, who, for this particular committee and the populations that you represent, uh, that it's oftentimes an afterthought. The, the brilliance of the equity responsive budgeting strategy and the city's uh, to be developed um, uh, equity uh, data equity strategy is that it, it, it helps change the, the foundation of how this work is done. Um, and I do recognize that uh, that the work that Sarah and her team are doing at SDFA is pretty historic because uh, 
by standard, this really hasn't been done in any, um, any, any comprehensive way uh, by any North American government. Uh, there has been a lot of work at the, the United Nations level of how to ensure there's a there's a gender response uh, to to budget, and oftentimes uh, there has been conversations and even a budget put forward at at the federal level, gender responsive budgeting plus. Um, but it doesn't come with any legislative uh, component, meaning that if we're receiving national dollars as a subnational government, we have to be bound to the same uh, values. Uh, that has not been the the case so governments such as cities and on and provincial governments have been left to our own devices on whether or not we follow the rules or the intention of of the originating dollars um, so this is actually pretty monumental I want to thank Sarah for the work that you've done so far uh, I know it's actually critically important for us to advance our, our aspirations as a city to be much more equitable far fairer a just place um, and without the work that you're doing uh, everything else at the city of Toronto can and not proceed. So this is the strong foundation that it has to, to, to be built upon, and I want to thank you for taking on that, that very brilliant, but also very difficult work. Um, and also now to invite members to speak to this item uh, and the motion, should you like. Thank you. Wendy, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I, I wanted to, and I'm not sure whether this should get worked into the motion or not, so I'm just putting it out there, but for me, the, the, it is fantastic work. And I, the one piece that I wonder about is when you're using a tool as like the one that we've seen described today, that the, in, in many ways, the outcomes can be determined by what the options are that are present in the tool. So if it's a pre-populated kind of list and people are selecting you know, what the barriers might be in terms of the impact on people with disabilities, the options are limited to the ones that are there. And in some ways, you know, I know that there are documents that people read in advance to get an understanding of what the barriers are that equity-seeking communities will face, but it is still an interpretive process. So it's still an individual, you know, reading or not a document and then making some decisions about what the impact is of that project on, on our community and on other communities. And so I would really be very interested from the perspective of people with disabilities as an equity-seeking group in being able to see uh, what, the, what the information is that relates to our community in the tool. And I, I wonder if I can ask for a presentation um, from the folks who are responsible for putting that tool together to come back to our committee and to show us clearly what the background information is and what the options are to be selected uh, in terms of the impact on the community. And I, I think it would have a number of benefits. I think it would be more transparent. I currently don't know what it says about our community in that tool. And considering the amount of power uh, that comes from making budget decisions and the impact on, on people with disabilities and as an equity-seeking community, I think it would be good in terms of transparency. I also think it would be great in terms of uh, leveraging the experience of people on this committee around what is actually contained in the tool. I'm sure, you know, there's so many people here who work with people with disabilities from such a broad range of contexts that we would be able to offer some insight and some and, and enhance that tool in some ways so that it is, uh, it is representative of the broad range of experiences of people with disabilities. So uh, um, to you, um, uh, Chair, can I, can I amend the the motion to include a request for a presentation on the tool itself. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Wendy, for your for your uh, your question. Uh, I'm just going to consult with the clerk to see if we can amend this or if we need a separate motion. If you want to just hold on for a minute, please. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your patience.
Yeah. Okay. Uh, Sarah, we have a question for you. Uh, it will inform how we craft this motion. Uh, and the question for you, Sarah, is will you be ready to, to share uh, perhaps even the inner workings of, uh, of, of the programming of that tool with this committee? And I think in particular, Wendy's point is trying to get to um, ensuring that subpopulations um, are going to be considered uh, through the drop-down menu and whether or not your your the contents of those drop-down menus are going to be pre-populated or is there a, a, a section where they can type in uh, free text. Uh, will th the third quarter of 2021 be enough time for you to to bring that back and is that is that a, is that a viable option for us? Uh, thank you, uh, Councilor Wong Tam. Um, the equity lens tool is actually uh, lives with the equity, diversity, and human rights unit. I don't know if they're available on this call. Um, I do think they're not. I feel relatively confident in saying that a presentation of the tool um, could be done relatively soon. Um, and just to reassure, there is actually ample opportunity in the tool for free text and staff are really encouraged to use the resources attached to the tool to think more deeply about their specific proposal. So it's not restricted by the drop-down menu. The drop-down menu is meant to prompt a deeper analysis. I don't know if, if uh, EDHR is on the call to speak specifically to the tool. If not, I'll put up my hand. <laughs> Yes, Sarah, thank you very much. That is very helpful. I, I wonder if this is uh, perhaps something I can do, and I'm just consulting with a clerk. Perhaps I can make the request uh, offline, but to have you come back uh, with uh, the equity staff uh, to specifically show us a, a walkthrough demonstration of the tool, I think that's what we're really getting after. Uh, Wendy, I see your hand going back up. Can I, I just want to clarify something. I think it, it's not so much... Um, whether or not there's free text space available for people to be able to put in their own uh, interpretation of the issues. But this is very much a framework that we're providing people with, right? So it includes the background information. It includes uh, the individual's own understanding of the issue. I, I think sometimes, you know, there are assumptions made about the kinds of barriers that people with disabilities encounter. And certainly if you aren't part of the community, it can be hard to understand those in any kind of degree of um, uh, you know, sort of certainty, right, or any sort of nuanced understanding of that. And because of the importance of this tool, those are the kinds of questions that I'm trying to get at. I just felt it was important to clarify it's not just about the free tax piece, it's about the broader informational uh, context and the options. And what do you do to support people outside of the tool who are making those decisions too? Okay. What, uh, Wendy, thank you. That's very helpful, uh, your comments to clarify. Um, so perhaps what I will, uh, what I'm going to suggest is that I work with Sarah and uh, and the equity staff on on how that presentation can be brought back to the committee. Um, maybe we won't move it as a motion at this point in time, but just I will take undertake that as my work as uh, as the chair and uh, and let you know at our next committee meeting when you can anticipate that that come back and I could report back through the chair's report on the development of uh, of the timeline on on when that will happen. Okay. Um, okay. Great. Thank you. Anyone else to to speak to that matter? We're still in the section of providing comments. Uh, Glenn, please go ahead. Uh, Glenn, sorry, we're we're running to a little bit of the similar problem. It pr Keep your video off if you can, and hopefully your yeah, I was just trying to get my camera off. Great, thank you. <laughs> yeah, my mouse was, was uh, being crumpy. <laughs> I just wanted to add, I, if, Sarah, if I heard you correctly, um, people who are working through a particular element of the budget are encouraged to look through an equity lens. Um, I don't know if the city has such power to do so. I imagine they do. But I believe that each department should be required to look through an equity lens, not hoped that they would or encouraged that they would. Um, I think it perhaps could be stronger language that, you know, maybe there needs to be an equity analysis for each department's 
contribution to the city budget or it doesn't pass muster. Just my take as somebody looking through that equity lens, equity lenses shouldn't be optional. Uh, Glenn, thank you. Mr. Uh, Chair, if I may. Uh, Sarah, we're, I think uh, the, the, the committee members are, are providing uh, comment and feedback and in, in, instruction. Um, and I, I know that your intention is to ensure that it becomes a, a mandatory uh, requirement. Is that correct? Just give us a thumbs up if it is. I just want to, it is mandatory for the budget. Great, thank you very much. Um, just your, your audio cut out just a little bit, so I think Sarah's comments is that it's mandatory for the budget. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, any other members to, to speak? And I apologize if there's a little bit of clumsiness on my part, my screen keeps jumping around, so I'm doing the best I can to follow all the bobbleheads. Um, but you still look wonderful, everyone. Anyone else to, to speak? No? Okay. Um, then perhaps we can take this, uh, take a vote on this item and we'll proceed. All those in favor of the motion? Uh, anyone oppose? That carries. Thank you, folks. For, that was a very constructive conversation. Uh, moving on to item number six, um, CAFE TO and CURB TO uh, accessibility. Uh, the next two items are, are, are very much related. Um, we're going to be hearing a presentation uh, from Jody Callan, Project Manager, Policy and Innovation Unit. Transportation Services will also give a presentation on CAFE TO and CURB TO. Uh, we also have a speaker registered on this item. I would like to invite and ask Jody to speak and provide her presentations and afterwards we will hear from our speaker. Then we'll, we will go back to questions of staff. Okay. Uh, the floor is yours. Hi everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, my name is Jody Callan. I'm a project manager with the Policy and Innovation Unit at Transportation Services. And I've been uh, leading the two programs in front of you now, the CAF ATO and the CURB TO program. So the purpose of my presentation today is to give you all some perspective on the development and implementation of both CURB TO and CAF ATO, which were rapidly deployed this year to support businesses impacted by COVID-19 restrictions. I'll advise you of some upcoming reports, share some of the things we've heard about the program so far, as well as consult with you for feedback now, and also share our thoughts on consultation in the future. To begin, I'll provide a brief outline on the CURB TO program, which created additional space in the right of way to assist with physical distancing requirements inside and outside businesses for queuing customers and facilitating the quick pickups of goods. Um, we uh, created more than 200 uh, such zones and supported those businesses through curb lane pedestrian zones, specifically uh, installed for customer queuing and temporary parking pickup zones, which were designed for quick food and medicine pickups. We also uh, did widen some additional sidewalks through the program where physical distancing was identified as an issue. Uh, there were a total of 107 curb lane pedestrian zones located throughout the city. Um, we heard about the need for these zones from a few different locations, including uh, complaints to 311 as well as uh, from counselor's offices. And uh, we did actually open up an application system for businesses to advise us when they needed that support to create uh, additional space to uh, queue their customers. We specifically designed the zones to support queuing in the curb lane so that members of the public using the sidewalk would not have to deviate from their intended path of travel. Uh, there were certain on-street contacts that prevented the zones from being placed, including proximity to intersections and uh, no stopping zones and things like that. So there, it wasn't a, a done deal that you could request one and receive one. There were definitely a, a specific traffic plan that was required in order for the location to be safely installed. We did install 155 asphalt ramps through the program. Uh, some zones had two ramps to ensure accessibility at the start and end of customer lines when they were longer zones. The CURB TO program has not accepted new applications since August. 
And all uh, curb lane pedestrian installations under this program have now been removed from the curb lane in order to accommodate our upcoming winter maintenance activities. The remaining uh, uh, temporary parking pickup zone signs will be removed by December 15th, and we don't anticipate the in installation of additional zones at this time. The CAFE TO program, which is where the majority of my presentation focuses, provided some restaurants and bars in Toronto with increased outdoor dining areas in the public right-of-way on both the curb lane and on the sidewalks. The city worked closely with business improvement areas and operators to help them understand safety, public health and accessibility requirements and other key elements for the successful operation of the program. We closed 9,683 meters of curb lane space throughout the city um, that supported a total of 621 restaurants in the curb lane itself. A total of 801 restaurants were supported citywide through the Cafe Teal program. The curb lanes were closed. Um, it took about six weeks to get them all closed and they've all been removed now, again, to support our winter maintenance activities. We did have 395 restaurants uh, participating in the CAFE TO program with in CAFE installations on the sidewalk and we created 44 public parklets uh, through the program as well which added additional seating for, for restaurants in BIA areas that could accommodate them. Uh, given the various constraints on Toronto's streets, the rapid implementation of the CAFE TO program was quite a complex operation. We attempted to instill a balanced approach to manage the demand for sidewalk and curb lane space for restaurants while ensuring that the sidewalk uh, remained accessible. We reviewed every single application to ensure that safety and accessibility requirements, in particular the 2.1 meter pedestrian clearway could be maintained. And after review, there were many restaurants that were not approved to participate in the program as they did not have sufficient space on the sidewalk for a cafe, or in some instances, they didn't meet the key safety criteria to have a cafe in the curb lane. There was extensive consultation that was part of the development of Chapter 742, which was the Sidewalk Cafes, Parklets and Marketing Displays Bylaw that was approved by Council in 2019. Uh, perhaps some of you have some memory of that process. And, and all of those guidelines were incorporated into the development of Cafe TO. We created a, a guidebook specifically for the CAFE TO program with design requirements and detailed information about the pedestrian clearway, cane detectable CAFE boundaries for people with low to no vision, accessible entrances, and other key accessibility criteria. Uh, one thing to note for everyone was that we, we did not allow for streetcar stop relocation requests given the impact to the relatively new ramps for boarding and alighting streetcars. So one piece of information there for you with respect to uh, some of the restaurants that may not have been able to participate in the curb lane portion of the CAFE TO program based on their location in the streetscape. Asphalt ramps were a key component of the CAFE TO program. We installed 379 ramps in CAFE TO areas. There were some closures that had existing curb cuts in their area, so uh, there isn't a one-to-one -one ratio as far as the deployment of ramps. And this was the first time a widespread deployment of asphalt ramps on this scale was accomplished. It did take a little longer than expected to execute, uh, particularly in terms of the appropriate placement of the ramps and stormwater drainage consideration. We, we installed most of the ramps in August, after we had done some testing with respect to the ramp creation and, and drainage specifically related to those concerns that we had about stormwater management. The intent going forward is to ensure that asphalt ramps are installed at the time that the curb lane is closed for a restaurant. A few words about enforcement. We took a two-pronged approach to enforcement for CAFE TO, and that was a combination of reactive or complaint-based enforcement activity and proactive or a patrol-based enforcement activity. So the patrols, we had our officers out in the streets in the areas where there, we knew that there were cafes, and they proactively patrolled those 
locations to ensure that the restaurant and bar operators had a very good understanding of what their requirements were. So it was an education first approach and, and followed up with enforcement if required. Between June 23rd and August or October 26, 2020, our transportation standards officers who were responsible for the proactive control aspect of the program completed 8,900 visits and inspections. We created a custom information card to give to operators. 291 of those were passed out. There were 65 notices of violations issued for specific uh, violations in the right-of-way, including structures, uh, built structures that are not permitted or impeded the clearway, illegal occupation of the curb lane, and any other pedestrian clearway issues that um, may have been found. There were 249 sites revisited and compliance was achieved across the board. A public survey was conducted on the CAF ATO program, and we did ask several questions about the user experience related to accessibility. I wanted to note that a portion of the respondents indicated that their CAF ATO experience could have been enhanced with accessibility ramps. And while a significant amount of respondents indicated that generally expanded patios on the sidewalk should be able to remain after the pandemic, there was a portion of respondents that indicated that the accessibility concerns on the, on the sidewalk was a reason to um, identify that the program should not re remain long term. Overall, however, survey respondents responded quite positively to the program, its overall goals, and its continuation into the future. A few words about Winter CAF ATO. That's the program that we're in right now. There is a guidebook with winter-specific information available online at toronto.ca slash CAF ATO with uh, particular design guidelines for some of the uh, cafe requirements if an operator chooses to open a cafe. It is on the sidewalk only. As I mentioned previously, all curb lane closures have now been removed to accommodate winter maintenance activities. We are continuing with a proactive and reactive enforcement and education activities with a particular focus on the pedestrian clearway. Uh, those inspections are ongoing every day. Um, we have advised restaurant and bar operators that they're required required to remove all of their cafe equipment from the right-of-way in advance of a snowfall event that triggers a snow plowing. So that's at two centimeters of accumulation. So the rule is that uh, restaurants and bars will have to remove all of their furniture and other items from the sidewalk prior to a snowfall. We're continuing to ensure that no tent structures and enclosures are permitted as part of the Winter CAF ATO program to ensure accessibility, as well as pedestrian vehicle sight lines, and of course that there's nothing impeding, impeding the clearway. And similar to our existing bylaws, within 12 hours of snowfall, CAFE operators are required to clear the snow and ice from their CAFE area and from the pedestrian clearway adjacent to their CAFE, and we'll be ensure, ensuring to uh, uh, have those proactive uh, patrols with our enforcement officers ongoing throughout the winter. And finally, uh, just a, a window of what's to come for CAFE TO in 2021. We are uh, putting forward a report about the CAFE TO program at the upcoming executive committee in January 2021. We do anticipate that a new guidebook will be released in spring 2021. Uh, we're looking to make a lot of improvements to the program. As you might expect, the rapid quick start elements of the CAFE TO made it difficult for us to uh, do the type of consultation that we'd like to with your group. Uh, for the future. Obviously, there are a number of constraints in our streets, and um, we'd like to, to host some uh, events with you to ensure that the CAF ATO guidelines incorporate all the relevant accessibility guidelines in the new year as we, just, as we move forward and make those enhancements to the program to make sure that it's uh, suiting everybody. And that is my presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jody, for your presentation. Uh, we appreciate your time today. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, oh, actually, sorry. I apologize. Um, going back to the agenda, we do have a registered speaker. I want to ask the clerk to confirm that our speaker is ready to proceed. Ready? Uh, and I'm going to be calling for Adam 
uh, Ray Cahoon. Adam, go ahead. You have five minutes. The only thing that I can keep it sooner, sooner than that is um, when you're doing the asphalt ramp, the big problem with those asphalt ramps, which I do need and I do use them, is if um, some, something could be put around them, like i.e. spray paint or whatever, to actually give you the guidance, of of where those ramps are, especially if you're traveling later at night on a summer's evening, they can sometimes be hard to actually um see. And um, the last thing is is I want to um ensure that there is going to be proper enforcement on um places where they are interfering with a clear way and I ain't getting lip from them saying oh COVID rules have changed the clear way rules. So those are my two things. Thank you and that's the end of my deputation on this topic. Okay. Adam, thank you for your remarks. Um we do not have another speaker, so bringing it back into the committee, are there any members of the committee who have questions of uh, Jody uh, and her presentation? Okay, uh, Wendy, please go ahead, followed by Liv. Hi there. Uh, thank you for the presentation, Jody. Um, as I'm sure you know, this was a very difficult, these were both very difficult. Uh, um, projects in terms of the impact on, on our community of people with disabilities. And so I just wanted to ask uh, a few questions. So in particular, the, the asphalt ramps themselves, uh, there's a couple of things I wanted to ask about. How is the determination made where there's only one versus two? Uh, and also, what was the technical guidance that was consulted on the construction of the asphalt ramps? Because as you know, for people with disabilities who use uh, motorized wheelchairs or manual wheelchairs, in fact, um, the the actual uh, physical structure of the ramp itself is important, right? So how deep is it? How wide is the ramp? Uh, can you fall off the side of the ramp, et cetera, et cetera? So there are detailed technical documents that talk about the construction of ramps. And I just want to know which one it was that you were referring to uh, or the program was referring to when it constructed the asphalt ramps that have been used in the city's program. I also wanted to ask about how people who have visual disabilities were considered in the rollout of the ramps and of uh, the two programs because it you know Adam's talking Adam was saying quite clearly uh, from his perspective it's hard to see those at night uh, for somebody who can't see them how have you factored into the rollout of the of the program people with visual disabilities encountering those ramps and finally I want to ask like you, you've mentioned a little bit about, you know, there being some complaints around accessibility. Is there more information that you could give us around that? And, and what have, what has happened in terms of those complaints to respond to the complaint? Has there been an overarching kind of review of the program from an accessibility perspective since it's been rolled out that you could share with us? So uh, a number of questions. If you want me to go back to them, let me know, okay? Okay, thank you very much. And through the chair, um, uh, I'll try to catch all of them. And if not, please uh, let me know if I've missed something. So the first question was about the curb teal locations that had two ramps installed. And that decision was made primarily based on the length that was determined would be required for the 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 the. the uh, queues that were forming for that particular business. So for some businesses, uh, the curb lane pedestrian zone was relatively short. They only anticipated they might have three or four people waiting in line to get into their store at any given time. Whereas there were other locations, um, particularly uh, grocery stores, larger grocery stores or shoppers drug marts or other businesses like that where they anticipated a longer lineup of people. So two asphalt ramps would have been deployed in those locations. One one to get down in and then one to get back out when you're waiting 
you know, if there's 10 people in line, for example, you wouldn't have to double back and use the, the ramp at the end of the line. So that's how that decision was made. Um, I understood your comments on the deployment of the ramps themselves. My understanding is that our operations and maintenance crews who were the ones that were responsible for actually putting the asphalt down were using um, the specifications in the AODA guidelines, and I'm sorry that I don't have them here offhand, but I will say that the the actual deployment was a, a tricky operation when we did it, and uh, we, you know, we admit that those are uh, improvements that we're definitely going to make in 2021 and we can do that in, in consultation with you and with your guidance as well. When we went to put the ramps in, in some instances the furniture choices made by the cafe operators themselves limited the locations that those ramps could have gone. And so we hope to fix that problem next year by putting the ramps in exactly when the when the curb lanes are closed so that the cafe operators have a better understanding. But there are were some furniture choices, for example, picnic tables that were chosen by operators that made it hard to actually get the ramp in a in a location where someone would be able to access it. So that could have something to do with it. Um, but generally speaking, yes, given the, the widespread initial deployment of this, we, we our crews may not have gotten the specifications uh, perfect. And and I take Adam's comment uh, earlier in his deputation about ensuring that there is a different delineation, if it's a colored spray paint or something else that outline the ramps, um, we'll certainly do that in 2021. That's a great suggestion and, and hopefully that would assist with, uh, you know, the concerns raised by people um, with low to no vision about the about the visibility on the ramps. I, and I'm sorry, I think there was one other question and I might be missing it. Uh, well, two, really. So one about um, maybe a little bit more information around how you did consider people with visual disabilities in the original document. And then secondly, if you could provide a little bit more information around uh, the complaints that you received and what you've done to respond to them. Right. So uh, through the chair, the, uh, the Cafe TO, where we can really consider the needs of people in the low to no vision community was on the installations themselves as far as having uh, the information out there for cafe operators to understand what their responsibility were responsibilities for, for cane detectability in their cafe locations themselves. I have to admit that we didn't uh, make a consideration specific with respect to the deployment of the ramp. So that is certainly something that we can uh, look at for 2021 uh, with your support and education for us. Um, for the complaints, um, we we don't have a metric, unfortunately, um, for the number of complaints that were specific to accessibility concerns. We did lump everything together uh, as far as the complaints generally speaking for the CAF ATO program and we expect to have some uh, metrics reported out in our report in January. Great, thank you very much. Um, are there any other members with questions? Uh, Liv, go ahead. I think, uh, as often happens on this committee, uh, Wendy addressed a lot of, uh, raised a lot of the questions uh, that uh, I, I was um, thinking of and that are so important. Um, I do know um, anecdotally of a number of people who um, have been injured. I know you were tracking complaints. Um, were you able to track injuries um, as a result of accessibility uh, barriers, um, falls, uh, et cetera? No, we we didn't track any numbers specifically related to that. Thank you. Uh, any other members with questions? Okay, uh, seeing none. Uh, I do have a motion that I can I can ask the clerk to put on the screen. Uh, we're just now heading into the portion of the meeting where we provide some remarks.
And I'm just going to read it out loud as well. Uh, City Council direct the General Manager of Transportation Services in consultation with accessibility stakeholders to develop accessibility guidelines and workshops on curb TO and cafe TO programs and to report back on these initiatives to the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee prior to implementation. Uh, recommendation number two, City Council direct the General Manager of Transportation Services in consultation with the General Manager of Municipal Licensing and Standards and accessibility stakeholders to develop accessibility guidelines and workshops on curb and cafe TO programs and report back on these initiatives to the TAC Committee by the end of the second quarter of 2021 or prior to implementation. Such guidelines to include uniform standards on the use of asphalt ramps, inspection enforcement schedules, and the standard of design of curb lane patios. Um, this, uh, this motion was, uh, was largely um, uh, crafted uh, in consultation with the uh, committee members that advance. Uh, the topic uh, and the subject around curb TO as well as cafe TO uh, has been one that's uh, dominated the, 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 the summer discourse. I feel like we've, we've all spoken about the, the benefits as well as the un unintended consequences of having objects uh, placed in the public uh, realm, oftentimes where you would anticipate pedestrian uh, traffic. And, um, and, and this is not without any sympathy and, and quite a bit of sympathy uh, to the struggling business owners, uh, cafe operators and restaurant operators on main streets and corridors. Um, however, it, it has to be said, and, and we're going to need to find a way to resolve the conflict uh, that, uh, that those uh, random uh, drop-in patios uh, oftentimes on the sidewalk created real difficult walking hazards and impediments for people living with disabilities um, and those who don't, um, those who are pushing strollers, uh, people having uh, carrying large parcels, uh, it it became a bit of a, an obstacle course. Uh, and of course, we recognize that you know the city, of course, was doing everything they can, and city council rightfully so, to support the the operators that were struggling on our main streets. Uh, but we also recognize that it, it, it created much more difficult challenges uh, and, and oftentimes it rendered people unable to move through their neighborhood or neighborhoods or even unable to leave their homes because they couldn't travel from A to B. Uh, and that meant that their essential trips to the grocery stores, to the pharmacy, to the medical facilities that they needed to go to, they could not go to. Um, so we're hoping that uh, that we can work with staff to 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 tidy that up, uh, and I do think that there's a preference from the committee members that if uh, if the direction of the city is to continue to repurpose uh, public rights of way uh, for commercial activity to expand outdoor dining, then the preference would be to take the curb lane, and not necessarily to take the sidewalk. Uh, sidewalks are for people and for people who need to travel uh, in the modes of transportation, whether pedestrians or, or in a stroller or pushing a walker. Um, and we recognize that if something has to go, uh, then let it be the, the, the parking spaces for vehicles, um, because that uh, would be the higher order of, of who should have right to public space. And that, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the spirit of, uh, of the committee members and, and the feedback we've solicited so far, is, is why the motion is before you. Um, members to, to speak and to add your voice to, to the motion. Uh, go ahead, Michelle, and then followed by Wendy. Thank you, Councillor Wong Tem. Thank you, Jody, for your presentation. Really appreciate you being here today. Uh, I'm really just going to echo what my fellow committee members have said, but I wanted to add and um, my fellow committee members have heard this story probably several times, but I uh, had a experience with FATO early on where uh, I'm not sure how this particular establishment passed um, the rules that were designed, but there are absolutely no boundaries, <clears throat> sorry, around the uh, seating area. And so my partner had a pretty drastic uh, injury because of it. Uh, and if there had been a cane detecting boundary, not only spray paint, but something tactile perhaps, or if enforcement uh, had been put in place where that particular establishment wouldn't have um, been set up that way, we could have avoided it. Uh, and it was actually an incident where two people with disabilities were trying to navigate the same space. And it doesn't seem like that's ever really taken into account. It's like, how can one person with a disability get through? Um, so it does happen that there are many types of people trying to navigate at the same time. 
Uh, and like Councillor Wong Tam said, this was on our way to get groceries uh, down the street. So it was an essential trip that was um, that short and ended up in hospital. Uh, that said, I do really support local businesses wholeheartedly. And the um, Curb TO program has been great. We've enjoyed a great many um, meals out thanks to it. Uh, so I would also say that I strongly prefer that option. And if Cafe TO is to continue, um, understanding that it was a rapid response to the pandemic, if it's going to be continuing on, people with disabilities must have their voice heard. Um, we can forgive the rapid response uh, at this point, but if it's going to be a program that is going to be ongoing, we really do deserve to have input to avoid the kinds of injuries and complaints that came up. And further to Liv's point, I did really want to strongly encourage tracking complaints and injuries specific to people with disabilities so that they can be addressed as we continue forth. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Michelle. Uh, go ahead, Wendy. Um, I want to say thank you to Jody and, and also like Michelle, I, I completely support what we're trying to do to support small businesses. In, in our communities. And uh, I think that that is really something very important that we're all in support of. Um, but I just wanted to say that, um, you know, for me, this is this encapsulates one of the things that happens with our community, which is that we are an afterthought. And I think that it's really unfortunate that, you know, where we've heard about as Liv and Michelle have both spoken to injuries, actual physical injuries for people with disabilities as a result of this being rolled out. And I certainly do understand, you know, the the intensity we've all lived through it uh, of trying to get things happening and moving in a, in a COVID context. But we're still being considered as important people in the population later, or just as people in the population later than everybody else is. And I don't quite understand why in terms of the winter implementation, uh, which, you know, we've had a little bit of time to plan for now. It still doesn't look like we didn't hear about the winter implementation today. So we're not in a position today to provide input into what the winter guidelines are going to look like, even though we're, we're now looking at having a little bit of time before those are implemented. We're still playing catch up. And just, and Jody, I know that this is not your decision, um, but in terms of just how these kinds of things are rolled out from the city, as much as possible, we have to factor in people with disabilities, not as an additional special population, but as a fundamental part of the population, 22% at least of us who exist and need to be considered at the time of implementation of these of these. So, uh, that's all I wanted to say, but thank you very much, Jody, for being here. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Wendy, for your remarks. Uh, any other members to speak to this matter? Okay, uh, recognizing no one has indicated their, their desire to speak. Uh, the motion is before us. All those in favor, please indicate your support. Any opposed, that carries. And thank you very much. Item number six uh, is Cafe Tio and, oh no, we just did that, sorry. <laughs> My apologies. Uh, item number seven. Uh, Active TO and accessibility. Uh, members, this is another uh, item with a staff presentation. We are going to be hearing from Becky Katz, who's the manager of cycling and pedestrian projects. She's going to be providing us with a presentation on active TO. Uh, once again, it's a rapid response to the COVID 19 pandemic. We do have two re uh, speakers registered on this item who will be speaking after Becky's presentation. Uh, Becky, please uh, proceed when you're ready. Thank you so much. Um, I'm I'm thrilled to be here, um, and uh, I'm actually um, my name is Becky Katz. I'm the manager of the Cycling and Pedestrian Projects Group in Transportation Services. Um, my director, Jacqueline Hayward, who is the director of the Project Design and Management Team, so the teams that oversee many of the capital improvements, is also joining me. Um, I'm really excited to be here with you all today because I'm actually new to the City of Toronto um, and just started in this position about 14 months ago. So I'm really excited to, to talk about active TO and um, generally cycling infrastructure. So um, 
So I'm here really to speak on the topic of active TO. Uh, there were three main components of the active TO program, which was a uh, rapid response uh, program to the COVID pandemic. Um, that included the major road closures, which were reoccurring uh, weekend closures of Lakeshore West, of Lakeshore East, and Bayview Avenue, uh, Lower Bayview Avenue, um, and the Quiet Streets program, which was a um, uh, to slow down traffic on local residential streets, which use temporary barricades such as barrels and concrete blocks. And it included the Cycling Network Acceleration Plan. I'm really going to focus today on the Cycling Network Acceleration Plan and its implementation um, because it had the biggest impact, a linear impact on to how our streets are functioned. But if there are any questions on the other two programs, I'm, I'm happy to take some questions. And if I can't answer them, um, get them answered later by other colleagues. So the active TO of um, Cycling Network Acceleration Plan um, included eight different streets that uh, was for about 24 kilometers um, to take the actual curb lanes of those streets and convert them into space for people cycling. Um, on this slide is a map of the eight corridors, which include Bloor Street East, Dundas Street East, University Avenue, Huntingwood Drive, Brimley Road, uh, Danforth Avenue, Bayview Avenue and Wilmington, Ave Wilmington Avenue um, is quite a geographic spread. These projects were selected um, by looking at um, routes that connected to green space um, that mirrored um, transit lines. Uh, Becky, sorry, and it's uh, it's Kristen. Oh. Just to to quickly interject, um, your presentation oh. is not on our screen, and I know. Oh that, no! Uh, sorry. That's okay. Here we go. That's Great. better. Huh? Thank you. Oh, I, I apologize. Um, I didn't realize that I was not sharing my screen. Everyone has to make at least one mistake on WebEx um, per per committee meeting. So glad to have been it. Um, <laughs> so uh, at least I wasn't muted. <laughs> So here again on, on this slide is um, all of the active TO cycling routes. Um, these routes were selected um, through the cycling network plan, which was adopted in 2019. Um, they mirror transit lines, they connect communities to green space, and we were careful to pick projects that all had some sort of near-term work so that if there were major issues that we already were planning for the staff capacity um, to make um, additional adjustments. So I should say that um, my team has worked um, with the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee on um, draft on-street bikeway design guidelines um, to obtain, and we've, we've met to obtain some feedback. Um, those are still in draft form, and, and we are really committed to completing them. But all the feedback that we have received is still is currently being put into practice. So even though these were rapid acceleration of the cycling network plan and the guidelines are not adopted, uh, we take the feedback that we've gotten very seriously um, and did try and incorporate much of the feedback or some of the feedback into our, our um our active TO cycling plan. That feedback included recommendations around more outreach um, on education for people cycling and driving and how to utilize um, the, the new bikeways. Um, a lot about pick up and drop off and, and we've had those comments be echoed through the active TO program, um, uh, not inhibiting pedestrians, especially those with low or no vision, especially near transit stops, and really to focus on the reducing of conflicts at crossing. So I'm just going to summarize a couple elements and then all the rest of my slides are pictures of some of those elements of how we've incorporated um, various accessibility elements in our cycling network um, designs. And um, this is all to say that the rapid pace of uh, these projects absolutely had limitations and that we want to and will continue to make improvements. Um, we believe that, you know, the implementation of cycling infrastructure should not just consider people cycling, but need to consider all users of the road um, and that cycling can be a great 
motivator of change in how streets function. Um, and that should be done, again, in consultation with the accessibility community, with people walking on our streets, people using transit. Um, as you know, the, the, there's many trade-offs in design and um, accessibility should not be a trade-off in cycling, cycling infrastructure. So a couple couple of just high level elements that we um, you know incorporated into the active TO cycling program. Um, we actually uh, installed a multi use trail on Bayview Avenue, which actually had no sidewalk or any pedestrian access before. Um, the arrangement is not ideal, um, and we would make further improvements in a larger capital project. Um, but at least that new access is provided. Um, all cycle tracks were separated from the sidewalk, um, and we did receive um, some positive feedback about the reduction in sidewalk biking, which of course creates um, some challenges and conflicts on the sidewalk. Um, we incorporated a corner access for informal loading, um, along with accessible loading zones, um, including various different types of asphalt ramps. We also, for the first time ever, installed rapidly installed raised accessible platforms, which I'll walk through, uh, which we absolutely think we need to iterate on the design and continue to improve in consultation with all of y'all. Um, we also looked at the removal of barriers near transit stops, and we are developing and about to launch a multilingual education and outreach campaign, which um, was, again, feedback that we received from this committee. So I'm just going to walk through a couple of slides on these, um, on, on some of the projects and the accessibility elements. Um, here's Bayview Avenue. This is um, a, a painted um, multi-use trail. Um, this picture is not current. We did install also concrete curbs along the edge uh, of the bikeway between the um, travel lane and the walking and cycling space. Um, this road has no sidewalks. Um, in a larger, longer term plan, we of course would not want to have a combined facility like this. We'd like to have a separate pedestrian space and a, um, you know, a, a separate bikeway space. But for now, we did consider um, that given that there was no access before. Um, on the other side of the road, there is also, so the bikeway is unidirectional um, and pedestrian are, uh, can walk on one side of the street. One of the projects um, of the cycling network um, expansion was on Dundas Street, which has a streetcar um, uh, street tracks. Um, when we installed the bikeway, which took over the whole curb lane, we did install um, ramps at streetcar stops um, if they were impacted. For the most part, we tried to not impact um, the streetcar stops at all. Um, we were also able to relocate one stop that is just further in the distance, which was in a construction hoarding, um, and there was no room for people to wait. So we were able to move it, and you can kind of see it in uh, the far off distance of this on on the um, west side uh, or the north side of the street. And so we were able to relocate it to an area that had much better visibility and was only um, it was quite close, um, just half a block away, which of course. Of course, um, uh, you know, when we consider stop changes, we need to consider where are people coming from. But in this case, the current, the location of the stop was quite uncomfortable because it was in construction, construction hoarding and a very tight uh, pedestrian clear way. Um, the Danforth Avenue project was unique in the um, in, within our whole program, um, it was definitely the most extensive changes of the active TO cycling projects. Um, and we have received a ton of um, feedback and have continued to make many changes, um, you know, pick up and drop off, um, both from wheels, trans vehicles, and then just people who um, are using the corridor in their own personal vehicles or in friends and family's vehicles. Um, we received a ton of feedback about the concrete curbs. We removed um, many of the concrete curbs or in the first place did not install them um, so that people who were loading and unloading would not have the barrier of the concrete curbs to deal with while navigating to the curb. And so this is just a photo of an example of where some of the parking spots along Danforth Avenue do not have any curbs between the uh, parking lane and the cycle track. So this is um, a brand new um, 
solution that we're testing out. So we've always had these limitations with accessible loading um, adjacent to cycle tracks where the bikeway creates a new barrier to get to the sidewalk uh, because you're no longer um, loading and unloading at level with, with the sidewalk and there's a curb. Um, in certain situations, we've tr when we've had major reconstruction, we try and raise the bikeway like along Bloor Street, um, but it's obviously in a rapid situation, we're not. So we were able to pour some asphalt um, accessible loading areas. This is not a complete picture. Right now in this picture, um, the uh, yellow surface, um, while has some tactile nature, needs to actually have the tactile warning mats installed, which is um, we're hoping to see in the next if it hasn't been done already, should be. Um, we are also looking at ways to improve signage. If you, uh, there are two cars parked here, um, and we have had reports um, from from people that um, people are parking there all day, and that the signage is not clear. That this is for accessible loading. Um, we targeted um, Danforth, Bloor, and University for these interventions because uh, university's access to hospitals and then Bloor and Danforth's accessibility to transit as locations to, to test these. Um, but I'm, I'm really um, interested to hear on more feedback. Um, on Danforth Avenue, we did do some public intercept surveys and did look at um, uh, connecting with people on the corridor who have accessibility challenges to hear their feedback. So we've gotten a bit, but I'm, I'm very interested to hear more um, and continue our work with all of you to get feedback on these. We also installed them for transit um, uh, platforms. So the, this is a, a photo on University Avenue just north of Harvard. Um, and this is the same kind of installation, but not for um, accessible parking, but instead for accessible bus loading and unloading. Again, a quicker solution, um, you know, on some of the more permanent facilities where we're able to raise the bikeway and um, create different types of arrangements, but this was done as a rapid installation. I also uh, just uh, uh, want to point out that, you know, uh, wheel trans vehicles by the City of Toronto's bylaws are allowed to load and unload in the bikeway. Um, and so where we do try and leave gaps and work with our wheels trans um, colleagues to identify where those gaps are so that, um, that, that people can uh, load and unload directly onto the sidewalk. So just, just a bit about our, the program. So the cycling infrastructure that was installed through the Active TO program is temporary and was designed in a way to respond to feedback and to make changes in the field um, as needed. Um, and in fall 2021, uh, we will be reporting back to city council on recommendations of these corridors and what the future of these temporary bikeways should be. Um, and we continue to make changes on all the corridors. And um, we are also, um, uh, you know, working on the on-street bike design guidelines. Um, we're hoping to adopt them by the end of next year, um, but I'm very excited to continue to consult with you all on, on those guidelines and the accessibility elements within them to ensure that our both our rapid programs and our longer term capital projects um, meet the needs of this community. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, thank you very much, Becky, for your presentation. I'm just going to move us over to hear from speakers who have been registered uh, to appear before us today. Our first speaker is Adam Cahoon, and if uh, you're ready to proceed, please go ahead. Oh, uh, thank you. Um, uh, thank you. Okay. Um, uh, the the two comments I want to make on um this issue is mainly in regards to the um in regards to when you close when you closed off Bayview at um. At times where River and Norman's Harris Square meet, and I've seen it at other locations, sometimes when they close off and they put the barrier 
public street. They don't leave out for for people getting off and on to block cars from going onto the street. They block off the hallway to leave it cyclists and pedestrians. I had to go up on the sidewalk, and that was a barrier. The second thing I want to say on the um is the, the wording on how Bayview was called from Gerard to River Street, uh, um, uh, or from it was um the the wording was so confusing. I realized there was just a uh, um um r River Street ram, but the way the way the original wording was um made it seem like in some ways because in a weird in a weird way <laughs> Bayview and River actually meet almost in two spots, the f one of the first weekend, I accidentally thought River Street was closed and actually found myself driving in live traffic. So I think the wording could be a bit more clear, especially for people with um, cognitive disability. Thank you. Adam, thank you for your uh, for your comments. Are there any questions of the speaker? Okay, uh, seeing none. Thank you. I'm going to call Robert Stambula. Uh, Robert, when you have uh, your microphone on, you may proceed, and you have five minutes. Hi. Good afternoon again. Thank you for a little more time today. Um, I'm here again for Harvard Village. We're right next. We're on the west side of the University of Toronto, bordered uh, by. Bloor, Bathurst, College, and Spadina. And we have uh, championed and, and supported bike lanes uh, through our neighborhood on College Street, on Harvard, uh, and on Bloor Street. Um, and we've recently this year had uh, a contraflow lanes right through our residential streets in the neighborhood. We, are, uh, we have a maze uh, in the neighborhood of one-way streets uh, from 30, 40 years ago to to help deter through traffic and calm traffic, and uh, it causes a little bit of confusion for so for cyclists. But I'm here on a, on a, on a couple comments: one on, on cycling, one on uh, on quiet streets that uh, relate to active TO. Um, I'd, I'd like to challenge a little bit the uh, the orthodoxy on the contraflow lanes. Uh, we're a neighborhood that uh, uh, moves in the way that the city incents people to move. We walk. We bike, we use transit. And my experience uh, through our downtown neighborhoods, at least, is a cyclist will take the shortest route from point A to point B. If that is in the correct direction in a one way street or the opposite direction in a one way street, that is the reality of how people move in the city and in the downtown. And I'm guilty, I've done it too. Um, uh, when when the the design of the contraflow lanes were brought to the neighborhood, one of the fair questions that was asked of of the city officials was, did they have any metrics that scaled uh, and 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 gave evidence that contraflow lanes actually flowed the, tr the cycling traffic into that contraflow lane and reduced the 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 uh, riding the wrong direction on one way streets in the neighboring. Uh, roads, and they had no evidence of it. They said they hadn't studied it. Uh, we I, we actually think that was important. Um, and part of one of the challenges to the cycling uh, uh, staffers uh, was the idea of why not regularize and make legal. I guess is another way of saying it. What people do, and that would be to have a neighborhood where cyclists would be authorized to ride in both directions uh, throughout residential streets. And what that does is re affect reality, reflects reality, but also there are costs with contraflow lanes. And there were some, uh, not many, but there were some very hurt people who have families with 
uh, disabilities, some with severe disabilities, that lost the easy access to parking or pick up and drop off right in front of their homes, where the contra, contra flow lane is, that does not permit parking, does not permit pick up or drop off. Um, and as, 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 as much as, uh, uh, as they cried for alternatives, there was a single mode of approach on that unvarying. So that's something I would like to, to see uh, looked at. Um, I'd add, though, that the controversial lanes at, at their exchange points at major, major intersections, the staff did a great job of, re, of engineering how, how uh, cyclists can safely get from one corner and crossing college particularly um, in a safe manner. And um, I think that still could be kept if you looked at a different way of moving cyclists through the neighborhood. Um, quickly, the other thing on quiet streets is uh, I recall we actually uh, submitted something to our councillor uh, Layton before quiet streets were even uh, announced by the city uh, arguing for a like program. Uh, it turns out that we didn't make the cut for those select uh, streets selected to get quiet streets. But I would, uh, I would encourage, we would encourage not temporary measures, permanent measures. Streets are too much of the public domain left solely to vehicles. And if it was understood that in quiet streets or safe streets or shared streets, however you brand them, that they're there for uh, vehicles, they're there for uh, cyclists, and they're for pedestrians. Um, the reality is, and I don't, I'm not trying to hook in my other deposition, is in the wintertime, if you're going to move through you're walking down the middle of the street. As much as that is silly, it's less risky than going on an uncleared sidewalk. Um, and thank you for your time. Um, and I'm happy also to ask and answer any questions. Thank you very much, Robert. Uh, any questions of the speaker? Okay, seeing none, then we'll bring it back into the committee for questions of staff. Any questions to Becky on her presentation? Nope. Okay. It's been a long day. You folks are wonderful. Um, I'm just going to, uh, we do have a motion that's been advanced circulated. So if you can just bear with me, I will try to ask the, first I'll ask the clerk, cl clerks to please put it up and I'll also pull it up on my screen. And here we go. Um, uh, the motion reads, City Council direct the General Manager's Transportation Services in consultation with accessibility stakeholders to develop accessibility guidelines, workshops, and harmonized standards in the delivery of an expanded cycling network and report back to the uh, attack committee by the third quarter of 2021. Um, and I recognize that staff need some time to do this work, and that's uh, largely uh, in making sure that they have the time to, to do the work that's requested of them. Um, I want to thank staff for their presentation, and actually, this the the the, the, the gratitude really is extended to everyone in transportation. Uh, you folks have been working incredibly hard throughout the summer uh, and throughout the beginning of the pandemic to today. Um, the the demands that have been placed upon you by members of city council as well as city council as a whole to constantly respond to the COVID pandemic uh, has been uh, relentless. Um, but I also recognize that you have risen to the task every single time. Uh, I recall this uh, the summer, it, it felt like every other announcement uh, was related to another body of work that was asked of, of, the, of the good folks that work in transportation services. And I know that you didn't do this work alone. I know that you, you, uh, you worked with your divisional partners, but I also recognize that there were sacrifices made in order for you to roll out the programs that you did in such rapid time. Um, in such rapid time frames. And I, I want to just acknowledge that I, I am fully aware that holidays were missed, family times were missed, uh, you worked into the evenings, you worked into the to the uh, uh, into the weekends to, to bring the city to life in a way that allow for more usability. Um, and of course, um, you know, at, at this particular committee, and, and, and it has to be said, is that we, we thank you for all the work that you did. Um, but we hope and we, we continue to compel you to come to us as early as possible. Um, and there are many members of our committee uh, and mem many members of, of those who are living with disabilities who felt that the city's rapid response to COVID-19 um, COVID as, 
as it relates to the disruptions in the public right of way in the public realm uh, created some some very um, difficult situations for for other people. Um, and, and those other people are oftentimes not heard. So in order for us to avert that from happening again, we want to make sure that we can help you uh, develop what these new guidelines can be and to ensure that there's critical success for every new program, especially since we know that much of the, the, the success of the programs that we want to replicate and scale up and export in 2021, uh, we want to avoid the same uh, traps and perhaps uh, uh, failings that didn't work. So so this is where we get together to refine and retool uh, what can be made better. Uh, and we know that you, we know that you capture that spirit. I mean, we know that you support this com com uh, committee. Uh, I know that in our private conversations, as myself, uh, you know, one chair of one committee, uh, we've oftentimes talked about, you know, how do we enhance the process so therefore we don't make mistakes. Um, and I know that 2021 is going to come back stronger. I really hope so. It's uh, it. it can't be worse. This has been a really difficult year, um, but I also know that there'll be even more demands. The more you do and the, and the better you do, uh, the more you shine, uh, but that means that there's more expectation of you, uh, and, uh, and transportation services, you've all done incredibly well, but we're, we're ready to commit ourselves to working with you, and this committee, I know, is very interested in the work that you do. Um, and, uh, and so with that, I just want to submit the motion for, um, uh, for the committee. Uh, anyone else to speak? And recognizing that my motion is moved on your behalf, it's done in consultation with the committee members. All those in favor, indicate your support. Any opposed, that carries. And thank you very much, staff. We are just checking the time, uh, 10, 12 minutes to 3 p.m. Uh, just as a reminder, we do have a hard stop time at 3.30. It will be pretty remarkable if we can finish this agenda. Uh, so let's uh, proceed as, as we can. Item number eight, uh, Wheel Trans update on public consultation and the COVID-19 response. Uh, members, there's a staff presentation here. Um, joining us today is Dwayne Geddes. Uh, he is, of course, you, known to you as the head of Wheeltrans. Uh, we also, oh, we don't have a speaker on this. So after the presentation from staff, we're going straight into questions and then to remarks. Uh, Duane, when you're ready, please proceed. Thank you, Councillor, and good afternoon, everyone. A pleasure to be before you uh, this afternoon. On behalf of the TTC, hopefully I will have uh, some help with the uh, slides. That's fantastic. Um, so I'm here before you to just give an update, a general update on our COVID-19 plan and recovery and an update on um, our Wheeltrans public consultations that we, we were directed um, to do from uh, this committee uh, just over, just about a year ago and we did them in early January of 2020. So I'll give an update on these two items. Uh, if we can go to the next slide and probably on to the third slide as well. Um, so in, in speaking about the COVID impacts and the path forward for the TTC and Wheeltrans specifically. Just going to talk a bit about some of the numbers. Pre-COVID at Wheeltrans, we had 43,000 active customers, and now uh, our current state is about 40,000. We used to have uh, pre-COVID about 1,000 monthly customer applications. Now we're down to 350. So you can see the impact there. And again, when it comes to uh, rides on peak days, we were up to about 15,000, and now we're around the 5,000 mark. So you can clearly see the impact that COVID is having on our Wheeltrans ridership. Uh, when it comes to recovery plans and actions, we have mandatory uh, face coverings as an additional safety measure. This is recommended by Toronto Public Health. Exemptions, of course, for health reasons are permitted. We did a complimentary face mask uh, distribution of about a million face masks that was initiated on June 29th, and that actually still is ongoing. Um, and for Wheeltrans, we are providing solo trips as, as long as possible uh, with limited ride sharing returning uh, as ridership increases. And, and along with that increase in ridership and an increase in ride sharing, what we've done, uh, and I, I don't have a picture of it here, but we're piloting a larger vehicle. It's our seven meter pro master. We're very proud of this. It's out right now currently being uh, tested by joint health and safety teams, our ACAT team, which is our advisory committee on accessible transit. So they're testing this new vehicle, and this will help us to facilitate facilitate physical distancing on our wheel trans vehicle. So we're very excited about that, and that pilot is still currently uh, underway. Um, we have outbound regular trip book screenings. Um, uh, those those calls have been eliminated, and customers are to advise of any health changes that are appropriate. Uh, advanced bookings can now be made seven days in advance on, on wheel trans, and customer trip confirmations have moved to 7 p.m. to help 
uh, our customers plan their trips better. Next slide, please. On the conventional side, uh, what, we, what, you, what we've done here uh, in consultation again with our uh, ACAD committee, our advisory committee on accessible transit, mandatory face mask, which started in July, distribution of those 100 free medical, uh, non-medical masks, and demand responsive service plan. So that's a plan that allows us to use our run as directed vehicles into key areas whenever we see, uh, whenever we notice overcrowding to help to uh, to uh, alleviate some of the overcrowding. And then the monthly pass presto credits that occurred in March and April due to the, again, the reduction in ridership that occurred. On to the next slide. We have a wonderful picture of our mayor, our CEO, our ACAT chair, um, and and just uh, and and I believe that's our deputy CEO. I'm not sure who that the other picture is. It's a smaller picture, but we have a picture of a, outside of Chester Station that became recently accessible. And um, what we've done here is uh, at a lot of our stations, we have distance markings in stations. We have comprehensive safety communication campaign. We have securement on buses and streetcars. Ramp assistance continues to be remain available. And we've accelerated construction where possible. And, you know, so overall, as much as I'm the, the face here today for the TTC, um, and I have the privilege of being before you, you know, a lot of great work has been done by all of our TTC employees. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention uh, at least a special shout out to all of our frontline employees. That's our, our bus operators, our subway operators, streetcar, subway, station staff, all going to work every single day. Um, they recognize and we know that the work they perform is absolutely vital to the city. And uh, you, you, we just can't say thank you enough. So a big thank you to all of our frontline employees. On to the next slide, please. Uh, and this one now, we're just getting into the um, public consultations. This is something that uh, we did back in January uh, of 2020. We did two public consultations on, on two specific items. Uh, and those two items were related to traveling on wheel trends with infants and strollers and using Skype uh, for appeal for our appeals process. So I'm just going to get into some of the, uh, the details of that if we go on to the next slide. Um, so just to give you some of the details of how how and when we could uh, we perform these consultation dates. Uh, the first one was on Wednesday, January the fifteenth, twenty twenty, in City Hall at City Hall in Committee Room Three, and then the next one was a week later on a Wednesday um, in at City Hall in the same room. And we kept the times, you know, we wanted to make it flexible, so we had one uh, from eleven thirty to one thirty, and then five thirty to seven thirty for anybody who can make it in the day and vice versa and the same times on the other day. And we want to, I just want to make a quick note on those days. I notice you'll notice that they're in January uh, and last winter wasn't the greatest, but on those specific days, the weather was actually quite well and we got a, we got a decent turnout. So we were very pleased with the turnout. Uh, and we, we, we really, uh, focused on getting the getting this information out to our customers, those who these these two uh, particular consultation uh, events would really affect our Wheeltrans customers. So we did a couple of things to promote it for them. Uh, we promoted this on our Wheeltrans 10-year strategy webpage. We held uh, we had on our hold messages to our reservations line where customers may call in to book their trips. We we made sure we promoted there. Uh, we had a promotional message on our Wheeltrans self-booking site. So whether you called into our reservation to book a trip or you used our website to book a trip, you would you would be made aware of this so that we made sure that every single Wheeltrans customer who this would affect is aware of this. And if they wanted to give us their feedback, they'd be able to do to, do so. Um, and the event was promoted in our December nineteenth, December twenty nineteen access newsletter to help prepare people for it. Invites were also circulated to ACAT, TAC, and uh, SPIN. So this committee well and 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 SPIN. Um, so we were very excited about the turnout. We got we got a great turnout. And we'll just move on to the next slide. And we'll, I'll just talk a bit. We'll talk it in in parts. The first part we'll talk about feedback on wheel trans customers traveling with infants and strollers. And on to the next slide. Here's just some of the feedback that we were able to gather, and it was some really good feedback, some really great um, suggestions and discussion. Um, and I'll just read over some of them. The first one talks about uh, wheel, wheel trans customers who uh, have to book a stroller as a mobility device in order to ensure the vehicle can accommodate both. Both the mobility device and stroller but some operators turn this down because it's not a mobility device how can we avoid this so our response to that was uh, we'll be adding an option on the self-booking website for a mobility device that is titled stroller with child and and stroller without child that uh, the customer has an option of selecting and once ready we'll communicate this new change to our customers so that was some great feedback uh, that we can definitely uh, use to improve our service and we definitely will be implementing that another point was um communicate to uh, customers that there is a limit on how many dependents or companions can be brought on wheel trends um and and we we were able to clarify that there is no limit 
uh, to register dependents under 12, provided that they are registered prior to booking. So um, they will come up in the customer's profile automatically once registered, and a communication will, again, was sent out to our customers clarifying this. So just some clarity. There's a lot of things about uh, some of our, our um, policies and procedures and just some clarification that was needed. So it really helped us to be able to adjust. Um, and we'll go on to the next slide. But one of the other points is, um, you know, why was the, the age 12 chosen for traveling with infants and strollers policy? Well, this was just to be inconsistent uh, with our corporate standard for age of a child uh, for all of our all of our uh, fleets of vehicles. Um, and another um, key point here, and I won't go over all of them, but another key point here was that um, one of our customers said that it's really important that parents and guardians should be reminded that they are responsible, responsible for the behavior of their children, potentially through a section of an upcoming access and we said, you know, that's a great idea. We should be reminding our customers that they are responsible um, and they should be watching over their children while they're on the vehicle. So that was something else that we, uh, we thought was good feedback and we would be passing on to all of our customers. So a lot of great feedback uh, similar to that that we got uh, related to this topic and we're going to be able to implement and we think that uh, it was very a very successful uh, public consultation on to the next slide uh, and this uh, this last few slides is just about the second part of our public consultation this was about using uh, Skype uh, for our, our appeals uh, process panel process on to the next slide please um, so overall, generally what we found was the feedback regarding using Skype for the appeals process was uh, they were generally against this uh, integration of Skype. Uh, and just the following is a summary of some of the feedback we received from our customers, the ones that would be affected by this, and uh, they had some really great insights. So I'm just going to read uh, a number of these just so we get a great idea of what, what, we, what happened at the, as a result of these consultations. Um, one, of the, one of the comments were, some customers do not use a computer or have cognitive disabilities, which becomes an equity issue when enforcing the use of Skype or any other uh, form of remote electronic sort of appeal process. If you're appealing to have the access to transportation and you should be able to use it to attend the hearing, there is an irony to not being able to attend in person. Um, another comment was, if we make it clear that appeals can be rescheduled, there may be less of a need to have alternate formats for the appeal process, which is, which is very true. And that's something that we worked on as well uh, with our team. In terms of communicating to our customers, when it comes to appeals, we can always reschedule into a time that's more uh, convenient for the, for the customer who is appealing. Another comment was, uh, this would be an injustice to the appeal panel if it is set up to use Skype. Having the appeal process in person and face-to-face -face increases transparency. And on the last slide here, just a few more comments. Um, human contact can be useful to increase the anxiety of the customer appealing the process. It can calm them down and allow them to be more open. On Skype, there may be many external distractions, including pets, children, neighbors, and sounds that will impact the appeal process. And the Skype appeal process can lead to unintentional uh, biases based on the individual's living situation. This is not conductive to meeting and interview. So to summarize um, and conclude, there were no comments in favor of using Skype or any other form of technology to conduct these um, appeals. And in general, it was a preference of our customers and ACAT, uh, the stakeholders uh, that this greatly affects. It was a preference to continue with our in-person appeals as, the, as, a, as a move forward for this particular item. And I wanna thank you. That concludes my uh, presentation. Uh, Dwayne, thank you very much for uh, for attending today and sharing with us uh, the update that you have. Um, I'm going to open it right up to the committee for questions. Any members with questions for on the staff presentation? I'm going to start with Wendy and then go to Michael McNeely. Go ahead, Wendy. Hi there. Um, I, thank you for your presentation, Dwayne. I have a couple of questions, and one is uh, it actually relates to the context of COVID. And, you know, sort of as a broader context for some of the things you've been talking about in your presentation. And, you know, I just wondered, so I have two questions, one of which is, um, is there a context in which solo rides are guaranteed for people on Wheeltrans? So knowing, knowing what we know about uh, physical distancing and how COVID is transmitted, does Wheeltrans have guidance and do you have categories under which rides must be considered to be solo rides? So that's my first question. My second question has to do with um, what you've been presenting around Skype and the, the consultations related to whether or not people would want to appeal using Skype. And I find it really hard to, 
find it really hard to believe, frankly, that in our current context, when we're all working remotely because of the pandemic in particular, that people are saying that they would prefer to have face-to-face -face appeals uh, for wheel trans. So all of us, I mean, typically have been working remotely for months since March, in my case, for example. And so, you know, maybe that was something that I would consider uh, pre-COVID, but certainly post-COVID, I'm having a really hard time understanding how there was nobody. So could you speak a little bit more to who you consulted specifically? What numbers of people did you consult when you were talking about side? And a little bit more background and context for how those conclusions were drawn. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for those questions. And through the chair, uh, so I'll deal with the solo ride guarantee question first. Um, so that is the case currently with Wheeltrans. Uh, customers are guaranteed a solo ride. That's the way our scheduling system is set up currently. So everybody does receive a solo ride. Now, there are exceptions if there are people traveling um, with a, a caregiver, um, if there's somebody with them uh, who's going to be a part of their family. So if they're traveling together and they live in the same home, we will. You, you, there are times where there are more than one person, but the solo ride is guaranteed. Uh, for all of our wheel trans customers. And when it comes to face-to-face -face appeals, so I, I'll tell you, we had um, through those sessions over the over the two weeks that we were there, and the, I think we had four different sessions, we had about two dozen uh, customers, and it was directly, and they were uh, wheel trans customers, our ACAT members uh, that, that attended. Uh, so it was, it was directly people who would be affected by this use. Um, so we, we, we consider them experts. We consider them the ones who will be, be affected by this. And we greatly, greatly value their feedback and their opinions on this. And, um, you know, uh, we, we, um, we I, I wouldn't say we were surprised, but uh, that was the general consensus. We didn't have one comment that said we should... Um, we should, we should move to Skype. In fact, especially when we spoke with um, the companies that we have uh, that conduct this, because this is a third party that does this for us uh, through Medicis and Sunnybrook, who do the appeals as well for us. Um, when it comes to the appeal panel, um, they, they recommend as well that it be done in person. It also helps to, to make a proper assessment. So in terms of how we move forward in terms of assessing and appeals, this is the best way to move forward after, especially after moving, uh, after hearing the consultation and the feedback from uh, the experts in the field um, and uh, not having any concerns about uh, it being done in person. Now, I will note that you're right. The, when, we, when we talk about the context of COVID, uh, currently right at this time, there are no appeals. So we, we've held off on appeals and um, anybody who applies for wheel trends, um, if, they're, if they have an issue with the, with the assessment that we've made, we, we defer to um, the, the unconditional uh, uh, eligibility. So, so that doesn't become an issue at this time. Uh, that is something though that we will look at when we start to bring back in um, in-person appeals. Uh, we will make sure that we have all the appropriate um, uh, standards in place in, in consultation with Toronto Public Health to make sure that we are doing the appropriate physical distancing and, and limiting the spread uh, of COVID-19. Okay. Uh, thank you. Liv, two question. My apologies. My, uh, my throat is suddenly a little raw. Um, thank you for your presentation, um, and um, I'm just wondering, we, we are hearing um, from people um, around access uh, to testing sites um, and taking wheel-trans to testing sites, that they are um, in rides with more than one um, passenger. So I'm just a little um, confused about that because there's been a lot of apprehension about from, from folks taking wheel trans uh, to those sites. That's question one. And question two is um, just around um, the, the drop off and pick up windows. Um, we have uh, folks uh, coming to our community center who are um, not able to wait in the lobby. That those are the policies that the lobby remain clear to prevent transmission, um, but they can't get a guaranteed or a, a, they, they can't get a pickup time that is working for them and similar uh with access to medical appointments or flu shots where the timing um is unknown at the time of booking how long will it take to get the flu shot shot if you're waiting in line how long will it take to see the doctor so during the time of covid when there's less ability for people to wait safely uh for a pickup what are your um contingencies or suggestions uh around that
thank you for those questions. And through the chair, I'll, I'll answer the first one. Um, in terms of access to, uh, um, you know, Texas uh, testing sites, I think you're saying that, that there are times where there's more than one person in the vehicle. Um, so, so that shouldn't be the case, and I, I you know, I, I'm not aware of many of those, and I, and I have, you know, there's a number of, of staff from 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 uh, my team that's here, and and I, I'll tell you, we haven't heard a lot of that. We haven't heard many complaints, and, and in fact, our scheduling system does it in a way that uh, we actually pick up one person, drop them off, and then go to another person. That's the way it's done, unless unless they live in the same home, uh, or they they um they are traveling together, and and they've been, you know together already um that those are the only instances where that should be the case uh so i would encourage anybody who uh may have um accidentally been assigned with another person to, to let our let our team know our customer service team so we can look into that because that would definitely be an error in, in our system that shouldn't be the case um and when it comes to pick up pick up and drop off windows that's something else that we really work hard on trying to um to really get it down to the to, to the the closest number possible. We understand that you know in these times when people are going for tests, uh, sometimes it, they may be there for a long time or a very short period of time. Um, so we do try to make it as close as possible to the pickup time that we can. Um, there is a 20 minute window. I will tell you that when it comes to uh, a paratransit. Uh, there is a 20-minute window uh, in terms of being on time, and this helps us to be able to to, to schedule uh, as many rides as possible for as many customers as possible. Um, so we we do try to get there within the 20 minutes. There are times when, um, due to traffic or other, other other issues, there are times when we pick up a customer and they take uh, we may have to take a little bit more time with them. So the the, the pickup itself can end up being a, a little bit uh, longer than we anticipated, and then that that will kind of uh carry over um to us picking up the next person and there might be a little bit of delay so we try to we try to adjust that um uh, as we go along through our dispatch team um but we do try to make it as, as close as possible to your pickup times thank you okay thank you very much uh anyone else with questions uh howard go ahead i just want to uh, again note the time it's uh, 10 minutes after three uh we have a hard stop at 3 30 um uh, and we will then proceed to try to reschedule a special meeting to complete the agenda if we can't get it done today. Uh, but uh, Howard, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Dwayne, uh, I appreciate everything that Wheeltrans does. Uh, I might indicate as a, a former founder of the uh, appeals process, uh, we found that the majority of the people that were doing the appeals were seniors. And most of them do not have the computer access, uh, relied upon the telephone ride line, or car talking directly to a receptionist. So I understand why Skype is not the most suitable uh, area for appeals. The second thing is, is that you know we have a 45-minute um, uh, program set up in the computer that if if i were to book a trip to a shopper's drug bar um, the earliest i can get a return is 45 minutes later um, and and that may be if a trip is available at that time uh, is there any way of being able to abbreviate that or do away with it in order to allow people to get their flu shots and in the future their uh, uh, pandemic shot for this COVID. Those are my questions. So, so yes, thank you for. Oh, sorry. Um, and Howard, I'm going to have to apologize. I, I, you were chipping in and out there. I got one of them. I know there was about the 45 minute wait time. Can, was there a second question there that I can just kind of note before I respond? No, that was the question. Oh, just the one. Okay, just the one. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, so the 45 minute wait time. Yeah, that's something that we've been working on a lot with our ACAT. So we have, you know, the ACAT committee, our accessible uh, committee on accessible transit, and we meet with them uh, monthly. And we have a, we have a subcommittee that's just specifically related to wheel trends. And this is this item has come up before. Um, that and it's one of those things that we worked on with them to develop. Uh, and that's typically because when a customer is being picked up and dropped off, uh, they are going somewhere, um, and um, and then they're they're there for at least. 20 or 30 minutes, 45 minutes. So that, that way we, and it also allows us to, instead of waiting there, be able to be more efficient 
in 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 our in our scheduling instead of an a, an operator waiting there and not traveling anywhere and just and just sitting there wait, wasting gas he can go somewhere else and pick somebody else up and then maybe come back so that's uh, that's one of the main reasons why however there have been instances where um uh, there's been uh, it, it made sense for us to 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 simply get to one location and, and then wait a few minutes because they were just going to be doing something like um dropping off a child um in, in a daycare um and we would wait and then we would we would take them and that's something that we work out through customer service i mean there's there's a number of different scenarios that happen and and listen we're always willing to hear our customers um and some of the scenarios that they're going through in the different incidents and we're always willing to try and adjust and and and, and look at our policy so that's something that we have have done and will continue to do thank you okay uh thank you very much to you both uh, anyone else with questions of staff okay uh seeing none then we will move it right into the remarks uh once again i have a motion that i'll be placing on behalf of the committee members uh, and if the clerk can please put that on the screen i'll just begin to read it city council requests the ttc uh, board to request uh, the chief executive officer of the TTC to deploy and schedule larger uh, fleet, larger schedule larger fleet vehicles when providing wheel trans ride share to facilitate physical distancing and other public health guidelines where needed and to incorporate verbal and visual announcements requesting passenger practice physical distancing while riding the TTC and report back to the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee in the first quarter of 2021. Uh, second motion is City Council requests the TTC uh, board to request the CEO of the TTC to consult with accessibility stakeholders on options for remote participation in the wheel trans appeals process as well as establish public guidelines in compliance with the current Toronto public health recommendations to promote in-person appeals and report back to TAC in the third quarter of 2021. Uh, Dwayne, just very quickly, I want to acknowledge that you uh, you did mention that you are piloting those large vehicles, so thank you for that leadership. Um, I think what we're hoping to do is that we can uh, see the results of the pilot project, even if, in, if it's an interim um, uh, result that you can share with us. Uh, we'd like to learn as quickly as possible uh, what those outcomes are and whether or not those service enhancements have made a difference. Uh, the rest of the uh, the motion is relatively uh, self-explanatory. Are there any members who would like to speak to the motion? Uh, seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, any opposed, that carries. Thank you very no, much. No, 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 I'm saying, I, sorry, I, um, I, I would like to ask something. I would like to make a statement. Uh, sure, M Michael, go ahead. Sorry about that. Go ahead, Michael. Hi, um, the captioning's a bit slow for me sometimes, so by the time I made a suggestion, it was already time for voting. But I, I do believe that, um, a, um, teleconferencing for a appeal is still necessary. Um, I'm not sure what the phrase is. I know you said in person, but what's the opposite of in person? It would be I just don't have the phrase on top of my head. Can I see the can I see the agenda again? Remote? Remote, yes, okay. So I believe that remote um remote appeals should still be an option. And it should be up to the person to choose which which one they would prefer. And I believe that the appellant should have um, an ability to request support or accommodations for either. So, for example, like Howard said, maybe older people don't know how to do the remote technology, but, for example, we could go to the, the Miles Nadal Community Center and we could ask for help to use a computer and to do the appeal that way. Just an example. Uh, Michael, thank you. I, I recognize that your your question is a recommendation to change the motion. Uh, if you can just give me a minute, I'm going to try to work with staff to incorporate your your comments. Uh, thank you.
Uh, thank you. So I, I'm just working with the clerk to incorporate your uh, suggestions. Uh, just for everybody's interest, the motions were advanced circulated. Uh, they are uh, attached to the Timis uh, uh, agenda. So if you uh, have a chance to go to the item uh, at the end of the, the general staff presentation, uh, there is a, a motion that, that speaks to what I move before I place it onto the screen. Um, just so everyone is aware, that's where it's sitting. So hang on tight. The clerks are going to just type up a few words, and we're going to then place the revised motion back onto the screen. Okay, thank you for your patience. Uh, thank you. The motion with the revision uh, friendly amendment is back on the screen if uh, people can take a look. It's on the second item, it's underlined, and I'll just read the additional words. Uh, so therefore, we'd be asking uh, the TTC uh, to work with Toronto Public Health to promote in-person and remote appeals and to assure accommodations are available as requested, and then to report back to this committee in the third quarter of 2021. Uh, Michael, does that capture the spirit of your comments? Perfect. I couldn't ask. So I to, thank you very much to the staff and to your question. No problems. Thank you very much. Um, if there are no more questions of the mover, and I'll try to slow down a little bit. I, I, I recognize I'd probably move too fast. Um, I've got three screens in front of me, and two of them move at different paces. So <laughs> you folks have been wonderful. Uh, no more questions of the mover than all those in favor of the revised motion. Please indicate your support. Any opposed? That carries. Thank you very much. We've got 10 more minutes, and we really have at least two more items. Uh, one of them is related to COVID-19. I just hope that we can press through it. Uh, so, uh, Brad, I know you're here to answer questions. Are you still on the line? You've been so patient today. Brad Ross? Councillor uh, Brad. Councilor Brad had to leave. It's Beth Waldman on the phone for strategic communications. He sends his apologies. He's preparing for the press conference. No problems. We know exactly what he's doing now. Um, so Beth, I recognize that you're here to uh, replace Brad to answer questions uh, if the committee has any. Uh, we have one speaker, so maybe what I'd like to do is, uh, what I would want to do is invite Adam to speak. Adam, if I'm going to, if, if I may just ask you to be as succinct as possible, we'll get your comments in here and then we're going to try to move this item. And the reason I want to move this particular item is that because it is very specific to COVID-19. Uh, so Adam, are you okay. ready? Yes, the, the one quick thing I wanted to say, and I was disappointed that Eileen de Villa did not mention it in her speech. And, and the problem is with the communication, um, Everybody is omitting the mask policy, the fact that um, people with disabilities are actually, uh, or certain people that can't physically uh, don and take off a mask or um, don't have to wear one. And on those wonderful signs that they have around, nowhere even in small print does it say that? And I got able as a verbal attack because of that. And the communication has very much been lost on people with physical disability. And people are getting mixed messages because of transportation rulings do say, I, I need a doctor's note, which is fine. In those situations, I'm usually traveling with somebody, so I could don a mask. But uh, so it's the messaging is sort of muddied, and I've been open 
to ableist attack because of that. Thank you. And the thought. Okay. Thank you, Adam, for your, your remarks. Uh, are there any members with questions to staff on the staff report? We're not receiving a presentation on this item. Seeing none, uh, can I please have someone who will move to receive the report then? Okay, uh, moved by Glenn. All those in favor? Any opposed? Uh, thank you very much, and thank you to the communication staff. We know that you're working hard. I see endless press releases and press conferences being organized by you. Uh, so with that, we just want to say thank you, and, and do not forget about this particular community, uh, which I know you are thinking about. Uh, no, thank on. you for the committee for inviting the report. We appreciated it. Thank you. Uh, item number 10, remote participation uh, in t at the TAC meetings. Uh, we do have uh, Kathleen Bartha, who has been very patiently waiting. She's with Legislative Information Standards from the city's clerk office. She is available to answer questions if you have any, but we also have a registered speaker. Welcome back, uh, Adam. Uh, you will have the floor now. Go ahead. I just want to quickly say on, on this item, I'm going to be really brief, but I still believe, even after COVID is over, that remote, having remote access to meeting will bring a wider disability population to come to these programs. And one of the reasons why I have never joined the committee was because of the 9.30 in the morning start time. I physically don't know if I could reliably make an in-person meeting. So I definitely do believe that if there is any committee that pilots doing um, virtual remote meeting, even after COVID is over, I say it'd be this committee to do maybe if if we do even have the meetings online and maybe one or two a meeting a year in person for those that can make it and want to do an in person meeting that's what I think should happen. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Adam, for your comments. Uh, any questions of staff on the staff report? Uh, Michael? McNeely, go ahead, please, Michael. Hi, Adam. Um, thank you for your, your work with us today. It's been a long day, but um, I'd just like to ask you, Adam, would it be okay if it was all online? For all of the, uh, I don't think meetings. Do you need any in-person meetings? I really think that if it was all online, yes. And there might be people that are digitally disadvantaged. And then in the on-COVID time, there might be people that do actually want to um, go to City Hall because maybe the internet isn't good. Maybe there are other issues, but I, I do think with the setup of proper mics at each individual desk, you can even do hybrid meeting. So if you have an individual, maybe they are in a hospital or long-term, their facility and for medical reach to not leave, but their voice should be heard. You know, so I think I I would be okay with all virtual meeting, uh, but there might be people that want to have the opportunity to meet in person. So I I think flexibility could also be used. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, anyone else with questions to staff? 
Uh, seeing none, I'll just place some motion on behalf of the committee uh, and the committee members. Uh, will, I would like to thank you for your support on the motion. Uh, we worked on this uh, in consultation with you in advance. City Council amend the simplified procedures for uh, for advisory bodies permit remote part electronic participation in perpetuity. Uh, number two, the City Council requests the Chief Technology Officer in consultation with the City Clerk to explore options for improving accessibility for all participants in remote meetings of city and committees of city of council and committees such as captioning and to report back to TAC by the second quarter of 2021 um, I think the the motion is fairly self-explanatory in the interest of time I'll end my remarks there any questions of the mover seeing none all those in favor indicate your support if you can thank you any opposed that carries um, last item. The, this is uh, item number 11, request for an update on the suspension of the Fair Pass, trans, uh, uh, Fair Pass uh, Transit Discount Program. This is a letter from Michael Maselli, uh, a member of TAC, of course. Uh, we do have a speaker on this item. The report, uh, the letter of, uh, from Michael is simply to ask for a report. Uh, Adam, are you still there? Uh, Adam, go I'm ahead. Here and because um, Mike, um, Michael is not here because it is Michael Machelli. Uh, I just need you guys, and I'll, I'm very quick. Even though the, this um, this issue is going all over the place, I still think it is very symbolic that you actually put uh, put something out there to show that this committee is actually watching the issue. I think the city was hoping none of us would find out and that Ben Spur would not have picked up on this issue. And this this pilot this pilot would have just quietly died. And it was only because we caught it and that made an uproar that they have that they have actually turned around and changed their mind. So I believe that this this committee does have to support a motion to show that we are at least watching this issue. Uh, Adam, thank you. Uh, I see that Michael McNally has a question of the speaker. Go ahead, Michael. Hi, because we're so close to the hard stop, I say that we pass this motion, but we also um, put it on the agenda that we have a long conversation about it the next time we meet, and that we invite Adam to come back so that he's not rushed anymore. Because I feel like this is an important topic, but we can pass the motion right now, and let's talk about it next time. Uh, thank you. That's not quite a question, but I take your advice. Um, are there any other members uh, with questions of the speaker? Seeing none, then we have uh, simply the, the recommendation before us. And the recommendation from Michael Maselli is to have staff come back in the first quarter of 2021, which is our next available TAC meeting. Um, if, uh, if we're able to complete the agenda, uh, we will probably get a, a further report from staff at that point in time. It's also important to note that this is a dynamic dialogue in process right now. The mayor has, has made a commitment to, to fund this particular uh, uh, service and enhancement in 2021. So lots Lots of uh, development will happen in the weeks preceding. Uh, I suspect we'll get the uh, the latest update uh, when the staff come back. Um, if I can ask, actually, actually, the only thing we need is to move the uh, the recommendations in Michael's letter. All the all those in favor, indicate your support, please. Any oppose? That carries. Well done, everyone. Oh, actually, we have one more motion, and this is a this is a motion to uh, for the for the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee to excuse it, uh, the absence of Michael Maselli from November twentieth, twenty twenty two, the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee meeting. Um, 
Michael put a lot of items on our agenda, which we thank him for, but he wasn't here to speak to them himself. So we want to thank him and also to excuse him uh, for not being here with us. All those in favor? Any opposed? That carries. Anything else? Nope. Okay. So clerks are giving me the thumbs up that we can con conclude. You've all done incredibly well. Thank you so much. I know this is a very long meeting for you. Uh, thank you for the participation in advance. You made everything run much smoother. And thank you to the clerk for all their support and to all the staff who stayed with us, um, especially when your items were at the very end. We really appreciate your patience uh, and uh, to our speakers as well. Thank you, team. Uh, be safe and we'll see you on the other side.